Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the What If Guy, back with another fanfiction. This is the first part of, What If Issei Became Demigod Dragon Emperor. Now before starting, please give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Prologue Awakening and Return of the Heavenly Dragon. Ni, nee, who are you? Those were the first words that left the mouth of six-year-old Hayato Issei when he walked up to the strange girl he spotted squatting by the side of the pond in the park near his house. Staring at the fishes swimming inside, even in his childish mind, he recognized that this girl was very beautiful. Silky black hair almost touching the ground, pearly, almost pale, white skin, dark gray eyes almost indistinguishable from black, and pointed elfish ears. The gut, hick Lolita clothes she was wearing only served to further enhance that image. A huge contrast to his ordinary slightly spiky brown hair, his ordinary lightly tanned skin, his ordinary brown eyes, his ordinary round ears and his ordinary white t-shirt and red shorts. It was only when he was about to compare their footwear that he noticed that she was barefooted. He came to the park to play. He used to come here with his friend Arena, but he moved away to another country two days ago, so he came to make new friends to play with. It was when he was about to join the other kids in the park in a game of tag that he spotted the strange girl on her own. He, as well as the other kids in the park all had their parents with them, but she was all alone. There weren't any adults near her or even in the whole park that looked like they could be her parents. Did they go off somewhere and left her to play by herself or did they not accompany her to the park? She must be lonely, was what he thought when he saw her, which was why he chose to walk up and talk to her, and also why she was staring at him with her beautiful eyes, something that perturbed him. Not because he was creeped out or anything, but because of how empty they seemed even to his six-year-old mind. Off ice, was her reply after a long, awkward and uncomfortable silence. Off ice even with his very limited knowledge of languages, he could tell it wasn't Japanese. Hell, she didn't even look Japanese. Offician, how am I out of say hey, where are your parents? He decided to ask her the most burning question that had popped into his head when he first saw her. Don't have any. A was his only response to the unexpected answer. I don't have any parents. I've always been alone, since I was born. Issei frowned. She was abandoned at birth anger overtook his normally cheerful disposition. How could anyone be so cruel as to abandon their own flesh and at birth at that moment, he made up his mind. I'm gonna make Offician smile. He grabbed her hand and started pulling her to where the other kids had started their game of tag. Me, Offician, let's go play tag. Play. Yeah, I won't take no for an answer. To say that Hayato Dago and Hayato Kasumi were shocked would be a very, very big understatement. Of all the supernatural beings in existence that their son could have first encountered, they didn't expect it to be her. Of course they knew who she really was. How could they not? They were both demigods, children of two of the strongest gods in Shinto mythology. Both had stood in the presence of their divine parents, as well as other gods, and this little girl's power vastly surpassed theirs, even if she was good at hiding that fact. She couldn't be another god. Granted, there were a handful of gods stronger than their divine parents, but even Shiva, the strongest god currently in existence wouldn't have that much more power than their divine parents. That left only four possibilities, none of which were particularly appealing to heavenly dragons, Deedrage and Albion, or the divine dragons, Afis and Great Red. Deedrage and Albion were out both were sealed into sacred gears. Hell, one of them was in their sun, though they didn't know which one. Great Red never leaves the dimensional gap, so that just leaves. Off ice, the Auroboros dragon, the dragon god of infinity, the strongest being in existence. Of all beings in existence, she was the one that their divine parents feared above all. She was after all, a being much higher than even gods and possessed enough power to wipe them out with a wave of her hand. That's why they feared, feared that their son might come to harm. If Off ice turned hostile, they wouldn't be able to save him. Even though they had received extensive training in their powers, even though they possessed two powerful divine weapons, even though both of them were more than willing to die to save their son, they knew they were nothing more than fleas before her. If she chose to, she could erase the entire prefecture and all of the inhabitants with a flick of her finger. That's why they prayed, prayed to their divine parents, to all Shinto gods, hell, even to all the gods in existence, that off eyes would not attack. That their precious son's life would not be cut short at the tender age of six, at the hands of someone he only wished to befriend. Issei was impressed. Hell, all of the kids were. Off eyes was some kind of genius at tag. At least, that was the best way six-year-old kids could put it. She hadn't understood the rules at first, but once she got the hang of a damn when it was her turn to be it, she was blindingly fast and caught all of them in an instant. When she wasn't it, it was nearly impossible to catch her, not so much that she was fast as much as they couldn't find her, even though she was the one who stood out most among them, with her non-Japanese features and odd clothes. She hid in absurd places like the top of a tree, on the opposite side of the park which she shouldn't have been able to reach in just a few seconds, she even once tried to dive into the pond, though thankfully Issei stopped her. Even though it had been a one-sided victory on her part, the kids were having fun. Issei even saw her smile for an instant and it was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen in his short life. Though, her expression was quickly schooled back into one of neutrality and indifference. But, all good things must come to an end. The sun was already beginning to set and the parents were coming over to take their kids home. 
before he left. One boy, the one who had suggested tag in the first place, turned back called. Issei Afishin, it was really fun today, let's play again tomorrow. Yeah, it's a promise Issei called back. He didn't know it then, but that was a promise he wasn't going to be able to keep. Me, Afishin, I have to go home now. What are you going to do now? I don't know. I don't have a home anymore. Office head drooped slightly and a small hint of sadness entered her eyes. HM then, why don't you come home with me? I'm sure my parents want mine. We can figure out what to do later. Really? Yeah, there they are now. Let's go ask them. Mom, dad, that decision was about to change his life forever. He waved to his parents as they approached. But, he could've sworn he saw them falter a bit when they saw Afishin next to him. There was a strange look in their eyes. It was fear. Are they afraid of Afishin? What is there to fear? She's just a strange, lonely and pitiful girl that needs a home. He must have imagined it. Yeah, that was it. He was just a six-year-old kid after all, what did he know? Issei, did you have fun today? His mom leaned down and asked. Yeah, it was really fun. I want to come again tomorrow. Aha, uh -huh. is that so by the way? Issei, who is your friend? Her eyes shifted to Afis and her body tensed slightly as though preparing for a fight, though Issei didn't notice. This is offish and his parents flinched slightly when they heard that name, but Issei didn't notice as he continued. She doesn't have any parents or a home, so I invited her over. That's okay, right? His parents looked at each other and his mother was about to say something, hesitated, then opened her mouth again, but she was cut off by his father. Sure why not any friend of yours is welcome in our house his mother's head snapped towards her husband and her mouth hung open. Really yada offishin, let's go our house is this way he grabbed her hand and started running in the direction of their house, Afis keeping up behind him. If he wasn't in such a hurry, he would have seen his parents arguing. Dear, what are you doing Kasumi whispered furiously to her husband. What are you talking about Dago feigned ignorance? Don't give me that didn't we swear that we wouldn't let Issei get involved in our world when we left Kyoto? Yeah, we did indeed. We swore that we would give him a normal childhood, grow up into a normal man, get a normal job, marry a normal woman, have normal kids and die without ever learning of his lineage or powers. But we were too naive. With the of two powerful gods and a longinus in him, there's no way he would ever have a normal life. Even at just the age of six, he's already encountered the strongest being in existence. The only thing we can do now is prepare him for his entry into our world. Tears welled up in Kasuma's eyes. Dago, that's our only child. I don't want to see him in pain. Dago wrapped his arms around his wife. I know. We won't let that happen. Well, I'll train him until he can overcome any enemy. It was an awkward dinner they had that night in Issei's opinion. His mom went all out and cooked the whitest spread of dishes he had ever seen. Pickled vegetables, steamed fish, grilled wagyu beef, her signature miso soup, you name the dish, it was there. Maybe she was trying to make a good impression on Afis, who she treated politely, but subtly kept her distance from her, as though she was afraid of getting too close to her. His dad was a bit more open, but a lot more subdued than he usually was. Weird. Dinner was a quiet affair, a far cry from the usual chatter, like his dad griping about his job, his mom sharing the latest gossip in the neighborhood, or himself talking about his day at kindergarten. He tried to make idle conversation with Afis, but she kept responding with vague one-word answers that didn't answer his questions at all. It was frustrating, which was why he needed some ice cream, his comfort food. Unfortunately, he ate the last of it last night, which meant a trip to the convenience store. Offician, I'm going to buy ice cream, do you want to come? Ice cream? Yeah, it's really delicious, but mom said not to eat too much or he'll get fat. She didn't reply, but gave a small nod. Okay, let's go mom, dad Offician and I are going to buy ice cream. Sure, don't take too long, and come straight home afterwards his dad called back. Okay, he put on his sandals and loaned off eyes a pair of slippers and they left the house. Back in the house. Dago, is it really okay to let them go? The FFT, the convenience store is only five minutes away. How much trouble could they get into then? He paused. I just jinxed it, didn't I? We're going after them. Yes, honey. An awkward silence settled between Issei and Afis as they walked to the convenience store, using a shortcut through a construction site that Issei had recently discovered. Issei really wanted to talk to her, but he didn't know what to say. Hey, Afishin, you never really answered my question. Where did you come from? From somewhere far away. Moo, that's the same answer you keep giving me. Can't you be more specific? The dimensional gap. The what that sure didn't sound like any country he knew. Somewhere far away. This time, there was a very small hint of amusement at Issei's expense. Mentally, Issei screamed in frustration. Moo, well, if you don't want to talk about it, I won't ask. What are your hobbies? Hobbies? You know, things you like to do. Why do you want to know? HM were friends, Aaron we friends would want to know more about each other. Friends off eyes whispered that word and smiled for an instant, apparently liking the sound of that. So, what are your hobbies? She tilted her head and remained silent for a while. Couldn't she think of anything? Then what do you want to do what's your life's goal? Kill Great Red. Hey Kill did he hear that right? Great Red took my home from me. As long as he's there, I can never return. So I must kill him first. Office voice, normally dull and monotone, was now filled with resentment and anticipation. Oh, Afishin K. Killing is. Then, do you want us to help you? A new voice echoed in the night. Three people stepped out from the shadows, two young, noble-looking men and a noble-looking woman. Araboros Dragon Afis, we are the descendants of three of the original Yandai Mao. 
I am Shalba Beelzebub. These two are Catalia Leviathan and Curusarius Modius. The man in the middle spoke to Aphis. What is it you three want? We want you. We are planning to destroy the new Maus, but we need your help to do it. In return, we will help you kill Great Red. Now, please come with us. The man who called himself Shalba Beelzebub extended his hand towards Aphis, but Issei stepped in front of her. W, wait a minute. I don't really get it. But you three are to kidnap Aphishin. Aaron, you, I won't let you. Shalba Beelzebub's face contorted into an expression of disgust. Worthless human, who do you think you are ordering a descendant of a Mao around Shalba backhanded Issei and knocked him aside? Issei Aphis' voice was tinted with concern for her new friend. Aphis, don't waste your time on that human. You wish to kill Great Red, don't you then? Come with us. We'll help you fulfill your wish. Issei Issei Shalba started pulling Aphis, who was crying out her friend's name. No, I can't let them take her away. She had led a horrible life up till now, and now, she was going to be kidnapped. He had to save her. Issei tried to get up, but he was still dazed from the backhand Shalba gave him and couldn't balance himself. But, if I don't do something now, Hafishin will get kidnapped. If only I was stronger. Stronger, 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 T-R-O-N-G-E-R. -E a deep voice resonated in his head. Who? I do I want to save her soul and me your power. A red light engulfed his left forearm, attracting the attention of the three descendants of the original Mao, as well as Afis. What is this? A red light. It can't be sacred gear. Issei. Energy rushed through his body, clearing his vision and he regained his balance. The light around his left forearm faded and a red gauntlet with a green jewel embedded in it appeared. Deedrage's voice announced. That's boosted gear shit. A longinus at a time like this Curusery. Kill him Shalba ordered Curusery who stepped up. Sorry kid. If you want to blame someone, blame your own bad luck that led you to meet off eyes today. A black aura appeared around him. Instead of fear, Issei just looked at him with resolution. All right. Issei reacted and ducked, just in time to avoid a blast coming from the left. This time, he moved to the side and avoided an energy blade aimed for his head. Not really knowing why, Issei just blindly punched forward and was surprised when his fist connected with something solid. Oh, for a kid who just awakened his sacred gear, you're doing pretty well, aren't you? But you overestimate yourself, human. A mere child like you wouldn't be able to injure a low-class devil, much less a descendant of a Mao like Mikuru's laughed as Issei's punch didn't even faze him. Issei ducked just in time to avoid an arrow of dark energy aimed at his head. Knowing that physical attacks were next to useless against this opponent, Issei began to focus on dodging. The same command from before resounded again. The pattern of dodging and boosting every 10 seconds continued for almost a full two minutes. All of the power he had been gathering for the past two minutes rushed into his body. Summon a storm, summon a storm at the back of his mind. Waves crashed, thunder crackled, and rain poured down. Boom. A loud sound reverberated throughout the town. Out of nowhere, thunderclouds had filled the previously clear sky and white lightning crackled within them. The three descendants looked up in shock. A storm. Is this the boys doing what kind of crazy magic is this? Curusery, run Catalia's warning came too late. Gigantic bolts of white lightning crashed down, striking Curusery and filling all of their visions with white light. R R R R R R R R R G G G H H H. Unable to see anything, Issei heard Curusery's terrible, painful scream. His vision cleared and smoke was rising from the ground where the lightning had struck. Is it over? Deedrage's warning came just a split second too late and a black spear of energy ran through Issei's shoulder, launching him back. Gaisei cried out in pain as pain he had never imagined possible course through his body. The power that had previously filled his body disappeared and unable to move, he lay pinned to the ground by the spear, bleeding profusely from his wound. From the smoke, a figure slowly stepped out. It was Curusery, covered in burns and his body blackened and smoking in several places. The arrogance on his face had completely faded, replaced by a small hint of grudging respect. Not bad, kid. If I hadn't put up that barrier at the last instant, that storm would have killed me. But, it's over. You put up a good fight, but you've lost. Curusery slowly made his way to Issei, an energy blade forming in his right hand. Deedrage's apologetic voice rang in his head. Ugh, I can't move offish and his eyes tiredly turned to off eyes, who was trying to get out of Shalba's grip. Issei Issei leave him alone off his normally monotone voice was now almost hysterical. A pitch black aura began to form around her, one much stronger and more ominous than Curusery's. It's no use. Even if you kill me, you can't reach the boy in time before Curusery pierces a vital. But if you come quietly, I may consider sparing him. I understand. He'll come with you, so leave him alone. The aura building up around off ice faded away and she slumped in defeat. Good girl. Curusery called the boy, he's too dangerous. Shalba coldly ordered Curusery, who raised his blade. Off his head shot back up. No stop I already said I would come with you. Sorry boy. You would have made a fine devil. Curusery's blade fell and Issei closed his eyes, bracing himself for his imminent death. Stab. The sound of metal piercing flesh was heard. Buff didn't feel any pain. Yuga what is this Curusery's pain voice was heard. Slowly opening his eyes, Issei was greeted by the sight of a glowing katana piercing Curusery's chest from behind. This is a holy sword. Not exactly. This is a mono Mirakimono Tsurugi, the sword Suzanu obtained from Yamatano Orochi's body. A more accurate term would be divine sword. Curusery fell forward, his body slowly disintegrating. 
Behind him, holding a monomura kimono tsurugi in his right hand, was his father, whose face was twisted into an expression of near-apoplectic rage. Next to him was his mother wearing an identical expression of rage and holding a large ornate mirror. Both faced Shalba and Katalya, who were both in shock at Kurizuri's sudden death. Katalya snapped out of her shock first. You how dare you kill Kurizuri? That's our line how dare you lay your hands on our son I am Hayato Dago, son of Susanu Dago snarled. I am Hayato Kasumi, daughter of Amaterasu Kasumi growled. You damn trash, are you prepared to pay the price for touching our son Dago vanished in a flash and reappeared next to Shalba and cut off the arm that had a death grip on off eyes. RGH Shalba screamed and held onto the Y stump. Katalia created multiple balls of energy and fired them at Kasumi, who snorted and held the mirror in her hands in front of her. The energy balls were absorbed into the mirror. What? what is that mirror? This is the Yatano Kagami, it's an absolute defense that can absorb the force of all attacks and then returns them. The mirror glowed and the same balls of energy shot out of them and struck Katalia, who shrieked and fell back, but Kasumi had already moved in front of her, her left hand covered in black flames. Be judged by the divine flames of Amaterasu Kasumi threw the black flames at Katalia. She screamed as the black flames engulfed her. She tried to use an ice spell to extinguish the flames, but the ice vaporized as soon as it appeared. It's no use. The flames of Amaterasu won't be extinguished so easily. Kasumi told Katalia in a cold voice. Katalia couldn't do anything as the flames burned away at her flesh and just continued to scream until at last, the flames destroyed her vocal cords, rendering her silent, and then finally reducing her to a pile of ashes at Kasumi's feet. Katalia's shit Shalba fell on his ass as he tried to avoid the blade aimed for his neck. Dago held his hand towards the sky. My son summoned a powerful storm for someone his age without training, but it cannot compare to this. K-R-A-C-K-A-B-O-O-M a storm, this one much bigger than the one S.A. had previously summoned, appeared in the sky. Damn it, Shalba slammed his foot into the ground and a magic circle appeared beneath him. Trying to escape, coward I won't let you Dago reached into his pocket and pulled out a talisman and threw it down at the magic circle. On Mujutsu Kuken Teidai. The talisman touched the edge of the magic circle and destroyed it. What you're an Anmyoji. There's no way that a son of a Shinto god wouldn't know basic Anmyo techniques. Crash down. Lightning of the storm god the world was engulfed in white light as gargantuan bolts of white lightning smashed into Shalba, who didn't even have time to scream as his body was ripped apart. The sheer force of the blast destroyed most of the surrounding area. The torso, still attached to the head, fell to the ground. Shalba weakly groaned out his last words. Oh, our ambition Shalba was promptly cut off as Dago ran a mono murakimono tsurugi through his brain, killing him instantly. Issei stared in awe at the contemptuous ease with which his parents had slain the three devils whom he had struggled against. Then, a black blur slammed into his chest, aggravating the wound in his shoulder. Arg. Issei Issei was off eyes, who was now sobbing into his shirt. She looked up at him, her face streaked with tear marks and mucus. All of her stoic elegance from before had vanished completely, leaving behind the visage of an ordinary girl who had witnessed her friend almost die. Smiling awkwardly, he patted her head comfortingly. You idiot, you idiot, she beat her tiny fists against his chest, but they didn't have any strength behind them. Sorry, I really made you worry. Why did you have to do that I would have been fine? Why did you have interfere and almost get yourself killed? I couldn't help it. My precious friend was about to be taken away. Of course I would do something, anything to help. He hugged her with his good arm and brought her close. She didn't resist, she hugged him back and continued crying. His parents approached and his father pulled the spear out of his shoulder, causing Issei to hiss in pain. Sorry, but it would have gotten worse if it had been left like that any longer. Are you okay? Well, aside from the gaping hole in my shoulder, I'm just dandy. Issei replied in a sarcastic tone that a six-year-old shouldn't be able to muster. Kasumi lightly struck his head. Well, let's go home and get you patched up. Well, explain everything there. Dago picked him up and carried him on his back, while Kasumi did the same for off ice. As they walked home, Issei realized something. Ah, we forgot the ice cream. And that's about it. Dago finished up his explanation. They had returned home and they sat Issei down and started explaining their circumstances to him. His parents were born in Kyoto to two of the strongest gods in Shinto mythology Suzanu, the god of storms, and Amaterasu, the queen of the Shinto gods. They had both received extensive training and were renowned as the best warriors in Japan. Back in their youth, they had traveled around Japan vanquishing any threats to humanity, but had eventually settled down and had him. They decided to abandon their old lives to give him a normal childhood so that he would never have to get involved in their world. PFFT, yeah, that worked out well. But the most shocking revelation was off eyes being the strongest being in existence, a dragon that gods feared. He never would have guessed just by looking by her, but hey, guess you can't judge a book by its cover. So, Issei, what do you want to do now now that you've encountered the supernatural for the first time, you can be sure that there'll be more to follow. You can try to ignore them and live a normal life, or Dago trailed off. There wasn't a need to finish his statement. It was blatantly obvious to even Issei what the other choice now, what the only true choice was. Looking down at off who had cried herself to sleep in his lap, he made his decision. I want to train. If there are more guys like those three coming after us, I want to be prepared. 
Gago smiled at the resolve in his son's eyes. Then, it's decided. Kasumi, call a mover, he'll go pack up our stuff. We're going back to Kyoto. Afishin is coming with us, right though he had asked. His eyes made it clear that there was no room for refusal. Issei, that's Kasumi trailed off, trying to find the right words. Sure Dago agreed instantly and Kasumi's jaw dropped for the second time that day. Dago, where are you? Kasumi, don't you want to see the looks on my shitty geezers and your mother's faces when we bring the being they fear the most in existence to them? Dago grinned maliciously. And even Kasumi paused as she thought about it, before an equally malicious gleam appeared in her eyes. Kyukyukyukuku. <laughs> Both of them started cackling and their son's sweat dropped as he looked at them. He sighed and tried to get up so that he could start packing his belongings, but Afis had a death grip around his waist and refused to move. Smiling resignedly, he sat back down and started stroking her head. His parents would do the packing for him anyway. The next day, the Hayato residence had been put up for sale, and Issei and his family, now including Afis, were on a bullet train bound for Kyoto. You were hits really bright, Issei said as he stared at Kinkakuji. When people said it was made of gold, they must have meant it literally. There's no other way for it to be shining so much. We're going up to the top, Dago said as he led the group up Kinkakuji. Once at the top, Dago made sure there wasn't anyone around before touching the giant brass bell and chanting something under his breath. The entire room immediately started glowing, and Issei felt his body moving at high speed. When the feeling of vertigo ended, they were in a place that Issei didn't know. It was too beautiful for it to exist anywhere on the urbanized planet. Fields of pure green spread as far as the eye could see. There were many animals, ordinary and mythical, roaming about, a few stopping to stare at them before leaving. And in what seemed to be the center of the field, a massive Japanese palace stood. Welcome to the heavenly plains. Dago led them inside the palace. There were a few people inside, though Issei couldn't tell if they were human or not. All of them bowed when they saw his parents, looked curiously at him, and recoiled as though struck when they saw Afis. They eventually reached a set of massive double doors and they swung open when Dago put his hand on it. Inside was a huge room, with three giants seated at the other end, a beautiful black-haired woman and an elegant-looking young man sitting in Caesar, and a rugged-looking man with a couple scars here and there slouching. Oh, if it isn't my stupid son and my niece. What are you two doing back in Kyoto and that brat behind you is that our grandson the rugged man stared down at them, then his eyes shifted to off eyes, and he froze. Dago, is that? Dago grinned as he saw the giant man's reaction. The Auroboros dragon, off eyes. Not just him, but the other two giants recoiled. What were you thinking, bringing her here the rugged man shouted. Oh, I just wanted to see that stupid look on your face, shitty old man. Why you little? Well, let's get serious. The real reason we returned and brought the dragon god with us is Dago started explaining the situation to the three of them, who listened attentively, their eyes sometimes swerving to stare at Issei and off eyes before turning to Dago. I see. A Sekiryute and office friend, how the rugged man sat back inside. He turned to Issei. Nice to meet you, kid. Him your grandfather, the god of storms, the great Suzanu he pompously introduced himself. The other two looked at each other before following suit. I am your grandmother, the queen of the Shinto gods, Amaterasu. The beautiful woman smiled down at him. Your great uncle, god of the moon, Tsukayomi. The elegant young man introduced himself while looking bored. So, you want to get stronger, right? Suzanu grinned at him. Yeah, I want to get stronger. Great. In that case, Suzanu's grin became maniacal, sending shivers down his spine. Suzanu cracked his knuckles. Welcome to hell. A young man with slightly spiky brown hair and brown eyes yawned as he woke up from his sleep. Then, he looked down at the little girl sleeping next to him. Hey, off eyes, wake up, we're going to be late. He nudged her awake. Off eyes stirred as she was roused from her sleep. Issei, morning she held her out her arms. Geez, I spoil you too much. He sighed, but complied as he planted his lips on hers, giving her gentle. He pulled away and saw the happy expression on off his face. Now get up already, it's time for school. It had been ten years since he moved to Kyoto. And man, that training really sucked. Most of the time, he thought he was going to die. Though, he reaped the benefits of that hellish training in the end. He had obtained Balance Breaker six months into training, mastered Amu techniques and other magic styles, as well as his demigod powers, learned how to control Juggernaut Drive for an hour tops before losing his mind, and even obtained a divine sword from his shitty grandfather. He moved back to his hometown because he had finished his training, and because he wanted to see how much his hometown had changed since he left. Imagine his surprise when he detected the presence of multiple devils in town. He wasn't fond of devils. Not at all, not since the incident with the three descendants. But for the sake of the safety of his beloved hometown, he was willing to crush the dislike and not go on a rampage to kill them like he usually would with stray devils. Now, he was standing at the gates of his new school, Kyo Academy, with off eyes, now his girlfriend, or maid as she puts it, standing next to him. Unlike him, who had grown to a respectable height of 511, off eyes hadn't even grown an inch, which made getting her enrolled in the school hard. But as expected of the History Compilation Committee, they managed it in the end. Issei, what are you doing? Sending a message. There's no need to. If they detect our power, they might attack us for coming into their territory uninvited, so we should announce our presence first. Issei flared his power and the ground around him started to tremble. 
In the dilapidated-looking building next to the main building, a red-haired girl's eyes shot open as she felt the gigantic surge of power coming from the gates, dwarfing even hers. T this power. In the student council room, a black-haired girl had a similar reaction. Such power. As the aura receded and they regained their normal breathing, they shared a common thought. I want whoever that was in my peerage. Issei reined in his aura and smiled down at off ice. That should do it. Looks like it's gonna be an interesting three years. Though there wasn't a cloud in the sky, thunder rumbled and lightning flashed, as though announcing the return of Hayato Issei, grandson of Suzanu and Amaterasu, the current Sekiryute, the mate of the Dragon God, the Dragon Emperor of the Heavenly Storm. Issei sighed as he leaned back in his chair. It had been a year since he moved back to his hometown. He was now in his second year in the high school division in Q Academy. It had been one unusually quiet year. No one trying to kill him, no one trying to kidnap off ice, and most importantly, no shitty grandfather trying to pass off sadistic torture as training. Plus, he had joined the cooking club to help hone his skills, though everyone else always said that his cooking could rival the chefs of top restaurants. He didn't think he was particularly good. off Eyes liked his cooking, but she liked pretty much any kind of food. Yes, if it weren't for occasional meetings with the devils in the school, the year would have been completely peaceful. Issei grimaced. Though he was on slightly better terms with the devils, his first meeting with both was disastrous, especially the one with Ria's grimery. They had reacted faster than he thought. The school day was over. Unfortunately, Afai's got herself landed in detention for ignoring the teacher in class and staring at him. Issei silently prayed she didn't kill the teacher in annoyance. As he waited for Afai's to come out, he was approached by a group of Piplino devils. Issei held back his distaste as he flashed back to that night ten years ago. The scar on his shoulder ached. No killing. Issei the errant stray devils? It's a high-class devil with her peerage. Killing them would probably spark the next great war he kept repeating to himself to stop himself from attacking. Good evening, Hayato Isekun. We were wondering if you could come with us for a moment, if you don't mind the redhead requested with a bright smile that Issei didn't buy for even an instant. I do mind, actually, but in getting the feeling I don't have a choice in the matter. Issei replied coldly. The redhead's smile grew wider. I'm glad you understand. Now, if you would please follow me. She turned and walked in the direction of the old school building, followed by the black-haired one. The blonde and the white-haired midget walked behind him, as though trying to block his route of escape. Issei mentally snorted, as if they could stop him if he wanted to leave. They stopped at the field behind the building, away from the prying eyes of the normal humans. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the black-haired girl put up a barrier around them. Now then, may I ask who you are? What makes you think he'll tell you the redhead giggled? We may get a little aggressive if you refuse. I have faced down worse than two girls, a pretty boy and a midget. Said midget's eye twitched in annoyance. Ignoring her and to further prove his point, Issei released a dose of murderous intent, causing them to flinch. The redhead sighed. Perhaps we got off on the wrong foot. My name is Rias Gremory, the heiress of the Gremory clan. These are the members of my peerage my queen, Hanjima Akino. The black-haired one smiled and waved. Issei raised an eyebrow. Hanjima, that's the name of one of the clans that worshipped the Shinto gods. A relation or just a coincidence? My knight, Kiba Yudo. The blonde pretty boy raised his hand in greeting. Odd, he didn't look Japanese. And my rook, Taujuka Niko. The white-haired girl glared at him, probably still peeved at being called a midget. I would say it's a pleasure to meet you, but that would be a blatant lie. Ria's grimery raised her eyebrow. Did we perhaps offend you in some way? No, I just dislike all devils in general, considering I was almost killed by one ten years ago. Ria's eyebrows shot up. Astray. Sure, let's leave it at that. It will probably be bad if they found out that the descendants of their former Maoists are dead. Look, I don't have any problems with you, but I can't bring myself to trust a devil. It's better if you just stay out of my way. Ria's nodded in understanding, not wanting to anger someone obviously stronger than her. Still, she was still very curious about his power. Then, will you at least agree to a little spar against my cute servants? Yao, yeah, let me go after that. Sure. But, she never promised to never seek him out again after today. Ria silently cackled to herself. All right, which one do you want me to fight? H.M. Iruto, Kaniko, are you too willing to test him? The pretty boy and the midget nodded. Yes, but you. Gladly. The pretty boy held a hand and a black sword in his palm. Issei raised his eyebrow in slight interest. A demonic sword, Issei asked. The pretty boy, Kiba Yuyuto, nodded. That's right. You're quite sharp. h -Met has a good aura, but it's clearly lacking compared to legendary swords. Is it a sacred gear? Yes, my sacred gear, sword birth, it allows me to create any type of demonic sword. But as you said, its power is lacking compared to swords of the legendary class. Issei noticed a slight grimace when he said legendary class. Did he have a grudge against a legendary sword? He turned his attention to the midget, who was getting into a martial arts stance. His eyebrows shot up as he sensed Yaoki coming from her. Was she a yaokai the feel of the yaoki would suggest? Are you a nekamata the midget flinched? Ria's grimery frowned. How could you tell? I've been around yaokai long enough to know how to distinguish between each species. I spent ten years of my life in yaokai capital, after all. You are from Kyoto Ria's grimery suddenly shot forward at amazing speed, grasping his hands and her eyes sparkling. Issei shivered, he had a very bad feeling. 
Yufi Fufu, yeah, I'll have to forgive her. But she was a Japan otaku. Riite, are we going to start as they shook her hands off and backed away? Riaz realized that she was making him uncomfortable and regained her composure, coughing as she returned to her original position. Why yes, please begin. Issei heard Deed Rage speaking into his mind. Nah, I doubt either of them is strong enough to push me that far. Right after that, a loud snoring entered his mind. Issei snorted. This lazy dragon was one of those who even gods feared Issei returned to reality, concentrating on the fight. Yudo shot towards Issei, swinging his sword at his side, probably not wanting to aim for vitals on an unarmed opponent. He got the shock of his life when Issei nonchalantly moved to the side with minimal effort and slapped the arm holding the sword away, causing him to lose balance. He caught sight of a foot coming at him and used his sword to block the blow. He didn't have time to be shocked when the sword shattered and he was sent flying. Got you. Faniko fell downwards fast with her leg outstretched, evidently trying to hit Issei with an axe kick. Her descent was abruptly halted when Issei caught her leg with one hand and threw her at Yudo, who was getting up, sending both to the ground. Issei grimaced. That kick was stronger than he thought. His hand ached in pain as he waited for the two to get up and resume their assault. Yudo shot forward with another sword, this time aiming for his neck. Issei ducked and struck the flat side of the blade with his fist, breaking it. He turned and kicked Yudo in the stomach, sending him flying. Kaniko was suddenly in front of him, her small body being hidden by Yudo's larger one. She punched at him. Not bad. There was obviously some power behind it, and its speed wasn't bad either. But it was way too slow to him. He sidestepped it and caught her arm, flipping her over his shoulder and down to the ground. She wasn't phased and kicked at his face, though he caught it and threw her aside. He turned to see that Yudo had closed in, this time with two swords. He moved back as Yudo unleashed a flurry of slashes at him. Issei smirked. His skill was impressive, but he was still too green. Issei lashed out with a foot, kicking Yudo off his feet. Issei kicked again, catching Yudo in the stomach and kicking him next to where Kaniko had landed. Having realized that they couldn't win by themselves, Yudo and Kaniko began attacking together. As Yudo created a new sword and attacked from the left, Kaniko appeared at his right with her fist drawn back. Issei's eyes narrowed. He leaned back so that both attacks barely missed him and returned to his original position. He started moving backwards to evade their coordinated attacks, making only minimal movements to conserve energy. He paused when Yudo's sword grazed his cheek, leaving a tiny cut that bled slightly. Not bad. You two aren't particularly strong, but your teamwork is quite impeccable. Certainly better than most opponents I've fought. Thanks for the compliment, though I would feel better about it if you were fighting seriously. Your stance is clearly that of a swordsman, so why have you not drawn your sword yet? Yudo asked with a smile, though his eyes made it clear that he felt a bit insulted. It's not that I won't draw it, I'm forbidden from drawing it unless I'm completely cornered. My sword is too destructive and indiscriminately destroys anything in the vicinity. But, you're right, it is a bit of an insult to not get a bit more serious. Prepare yourselves, this is going to be a hard fight for you. Hisei let his arms drop to his sides and took a deep breath. Then, he started releasing his massive power, causing the air to get heavier and Rias and her peerage to fall to their knees, staring up at him in fear and awe. Slowly, black clouds began gathering overhead, flashing with lightning and crackling with thunder. A bolt of white lightning crashed down, striking Issei, but not harming him. Instead, the lightning began to twist itself around Issei's body, covering his chest, shoulders, forearms and legs, forming a crude armor. Is this lightning magic and at a much higher level than Akino's Rias looked shocked at the level of elemental manipulation being used by Issei, far outclassing that of her queen, who was definitely far above most high-class devils when it came to elemental magic. I have affinities with fire, lightning, wind and water. Something of this level is nothing to me. That said, this is one of my stronger spells. Rage and no Yoroi, level 1. If you still feel confident, then try taking this on. Issei mockingly made a come-hither gesture. Yudo and Kaniko shot forward. Yudo swung down his sword that immediately shattered upon contact with the armor and Kaniko's fist bounced back and both were struck by bolts of white lightning from the armor, knocking both of them back. If that's the best you can do, y'all never break through this armor. How about you try a bit harder? Yudo frowned and placed a hand on the ground. Sword birth a dozen swords materialized and shot at him, intent on impaling him, but all of them shattered upon contact with his armor. Kaniko once again descended from above, intending on striking his head, one of the unprotected parts on his body. Naive, Issei snapped his fingers and a bolt of white lightning shot down from the storm clouds, striking Kaniko in the stomach like a whip. The bolt pointed itself downwards again and impaled itself in the ground. Issei grasped the bolt and it slowly molded itself into the form of a katana. I suppose this will do for a substitute. Shall we dance before either of them could reply, Issei disappeared from their sight. Their heads whipping left and right looking for him. They failed to notice that he had appeared behind them until he announced his presence by kneeing Yudo in the back, blasting him to the other side of the field, where he crashed into the barrier that Akino had created. Kaniko immediately turned and swung her arm at him, but he vanished again, this time appearing in front of her and flicking her forehead, the force of the flick sending her sprawling to the ground, creating a crater where she had fallen. Ikazuchi Issei called out and the katana flashed, striking the recovering Yudo with a lightning bolt. 
Issei lowered his sword and sighed. Is this enough you two can't defeat me? No, not yet we can still fight Yudo got up on shaky legs while Karniko failed to get up and fell to her knees. That's enough. Yudo, stand down. Rias ordered, finally acknowledging that she had bitten off more than she could chew. Yudo collapsed to the ground with a look of mortification, upset that all he was able to manage was a small cut on Issei's cheek. Issei's lightning armor and sword dissipated. Most of your wounds are quite superficial, but you should get yourselves healed just in case. Holding back has never been one of my strong suits. All right, as agreed, you are free to leave now. Akino raised her hand and the field started repairing itself. The barrier fell, allowing Issei to leave. Then, a heavy presence, stronger than even Issei's, appeared, sending Rias and her peerage to their knees once more. From the woods surrounding the old school building, a small, black-haired girl dressed in the Q Academy High School Division uniform appeared. Despite her diminutive size, she was releasing an incredible aura, the level of which Rias had only felt from top-class fighters like her brother when he was serious. No, this aura might outclass even him. Issei, that girl, if she could be called that at all, said in a small voice. Off eyes, you're done serving detention already Rias paled. This girl was the Auroboros dragon, the strongest being in existence and Hayato Issei was on friendly terms with her Rias decided it was definitely not a good idea to antagonize someone on good terms with the infinite dragon god and resolved to stay out of his way when possible. She would have to warn Sona about this too. Wait, detention. It was boring. I wanted to kill the teacher. That's why I said you need to pay attention in class instead of staring at me all the time. You didn't kill him, right? No. Good. Let's go home. What do you want for dinner? Issei began walking towards the gates, Afai's walking beside him. Yakisoba. Afai's immediately replied without hesitation. Got it. He'll cook up a feast for you. Afai's hugged Issei's arm and leaned into his side. In that position, they looked almost like lovers. No, 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 no. That can't be right. Who in their right mind would court the strongest being in existence then again, Hayato Issei definitely wasn't an ordinary person. The moment they were out of sight, Rhea slumped to her knees. She hadn't even realized she had stopped breathing. The heavy aura disappeared and Rias took deep breaths to calm herself down. The Auroboros dragon was enrolled in her school and the boy she had taken an interest in was possibly her mate. She was honestly surprised that she hadn't been killed on the spot. That's right, she didn't have time to lay around. She had to warn Sona before she did something stupid to incur the wrath of the dragon god. Shakily getting to her feet, she stumbled in the direction of the new school building. Yeah, that was a terrible meeting. Yudo and Kaneko had to take a full week off to recover from their wounds. He was honestly surprised when Yudo suddenly approached him after school to seek training. Normally, Issei would have refused in an instant, but something in Yudo's eyes caused him to pause. His desire to get stronger wasn't for his own sake, he was doing it for someone else. Issei asked him about it, and Yudo replied, I have a grudge I need to settle no matter what, I cannot rest until I've avenged my fallen comrades. That's why I have to get stronger, no matter the cost. At that time, his eyes were filled with animosity that made even Issei take a step back. He didn't go into detail about his grudge, but Issei wasn't comfortable with prying into it either. Issei didn't like devils. However, he didn't dislike someone who was trying to clear his and his comrades' regrets, which was why he agreed to spar with Yudo every day after school behind the old school building. At first, it had been a very one-sided skicking, but slowly, Yudo began to learn, reacting faster to his attacks and using less effort to dodge them. That was good. Yudo had two critical weaknesses in battle. The first was his stamina. While far above that of a human, his stamina wasn't high enough to last in a drawn-out fight with strong supernatural beings, which is why his switching to less energy wasting evasive maneuvers was a good thing. The second weakness was his lack of defense. Yudo, being a knight that relied on speed and swordsmanship to fight, had almost no means of defending himself. Normally, this wouldn't be a problem as even Issei had to admit that Yudo's speed was impressive. But against faster enemies, he'd be ripped to pieces. Issei had personally demonstrated this when he activated Rage and No Yoroi Level 1 and used its speed to outmaneuver Yudo and continuously strike at his legs. This was the more troublesome problem to address. Yudo couldn't use armor or shields as they would hamper his speed, so he settled for teaching Yudo to enhance his physical structure by using his demonic energy. This was a technique that could only be performed under his supervision as even a small failure could permanently damage his nerves. Yudo was obviously better now. What had begun as one-sided slaughter slowly turned into semi-serious spars where Issei actually had to put an effort to defeat him. In their most recent spar, he was forced to activate Rage and No Yoroi level 1 out of necessity for the first time when Yuudo encased his body in ice using an ice-type demonic sword and then drained the oxygen out of the air to prevent him from using his favored fire magic to break the thick ice. Of course, he beat the crap out of Yuudo after breaking out, but he was surprised he had been forced to use it after only a year. Training usually only meant something when done for several years after all. Yudo had talent, maybe not as high as his own, but it was definitely there. Of course, he had not yet drawn his real sword. There was still no reason to, plus the whole town would probably be incinerated if he did. Futsu no Matama was not a sword to be drawn carelessly. Plus, she would probably laugh at him for needing to draw her in a spar. Stupid Sundir sentient sword. After the whole fiasco that was his first meeting with Ria's Gremory, he met Sona Citri. 
who treaded very lightly around him. Obviously, she had been warned her about his capabilities as well as his relationship with Office. She introduced herself in her peerage, which was more complete than Rias, to him and Office, told him about her role of keeping the school's peace at daytime and warned him that he and Office were to behave themselves while in school and not stir up any trouble. Though, the effect was somewhat ruined by her shaking voice. He responded the same way he did to Rias, if they stayed out of his way, they wouldn't have a problem. Of course some meetings were inevitable, like whenever stray devils wandered into town. Sometimes he let them take care of it while he watched, sometimes he would finish it off before they could get there. The times he watched, he had to admit, they were somewhat talented. The ones that piqued his interest were Ria's Gremory, Hanjima Akino and Tauju Kaniko. While Sona Citri and her peerage were good, their powers weren't especially interesting. On the other hand, Ria's Gremory utilized the Ball Clan's famed power of destruction, despite being a member of the Gremory Clan. Perhaps her mother is a ball though the way she utilized it was, while powerful, not refined at all. She tended to waste a good deal of her energy in the initial shot and if the enemy survived, her next shot would be much weaker. She ought to focus more on technique rather than power. Hanjima Akino was a bit more interesting. She utilized lightning magic among others to fight. It wasn't as strong as his own, then again, he was trained by the Shinto god of storms. Her manipulation of the elements didn't even hold a candle to his. She just used the elements in their raw forms to attack, instead of using them to augment her own body like his rage and no yoroi, or fuse elements together for stronger results. Still, no mere devil could use that level of magic without inborn talent. Plus, she used a Miko outfit when fighting seriously. So, that meant that she probably was a member of the prestigious Heimjima clan before being reincarnated as a devil. But, a member of the extremely proud, haughty and arrogant Heimjim clan became a devil unthinkable, unless she was excommunicated. Tauju Kaniko didn't intrigue him so much as she confused him. She had pretty much admitted that she was a Nekamata, but so far, she had not used Aujutsu or Sinjutsu. Weird, considering that both were her species' speciality. She didn't even use them when a stronger-than-average stray devil had cornered her and her master had to bail her out. Perhaps her reincarnation from a yaokai to a devil was interfering with her ability to use Yaojutsu or Senjutsu Warwas. She refusing to use it she did flinch when he figured out that she was a Nekamata. Perhaps she had a mental trauma that caused to be able to use Yaojutsu and Senjutsu or caused her to dislike the idea of either what a waste. Relying on the rook's strength and defense would only get her so far. She wouldn't last a second against the stronger supernatural beings. Over time, even he wasn't able to remain distant and he found himself growing closer and closer to the members of the occult research club, if only by a bit. That troubled him. Devils are fundamentally untrustworthy beings as they deceive humans into forming contracts with them and devouring their souls. Though, he heard that after their great war against heaven and the fallen angels, devils had slowly grown adverse to the idea of eating human souls. It was laughable to him. An entire species denying one of their base instincts he was waiting for the other shoe to drop when they reached the limit of their restraint and started attacking humans. He did not want to grow any closer to them. It was only inevitable that he would have to cut them down one day. If not him, then someone else. But despite his best efforts, he was definitely friendlier to the devils at school than he was at first. Even Offiz appeared to have taken a liking to Kaniko, who constantly offered sweets and snacks. He himself was close to Yudo. It was hard not to form a friendship with someone you spar with daily. Ding dong. Ah, the school bell rang. School was over for the day. Sighing, he picked his bag up and walked out of the classroom, Offiz walking beside him. Hey hey, it's Hayato-kun. Really where? Kaya, he's as handsome as ever. I know, right? Especially his cool eyes that make you squirm under their gaze. No, 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 it's his muscular body that's best. Issei snorted. That was something he had forgotten fangirls. He was unusually popular among the female students for reasons he couldn't comprehend. He didn't think he was particularly good-looking. Yudo outclassed him in that category. Beside him, Afai's huffed and her cheeks puffed out, making her look like a cute squirrel. She was cute when she was jealous. Issei rubbed the top of her head and Afai's leaned into his side. Kaya, those two are lovey-dovey as always. It must be troubling for both of them to have such a big difference in height. I heard Afishin is trying to make her body grow faster by drinking more milk. Okay, that last one was definitely a lie. Issei had suggested that she change her body size to a more appropriate height for a high school student, but she refused, saying that her current form was special to her and she didn't want to abandon it. Still, it did make certain things difficult, like him being mistaken for a lolican by people who didn't know that he and Afis were in the same ear or ing in public because of height difference. They had just stepped out the gate when he was stopped by an unfamiliar face. UUM. HMSA turned to find a black-haired girl wearing a school uniform different from the ones the girls from Q Academy wore. From a different school then, he sensed a strange energy coming from her. The energy of a fallen angel. Why was a fallen angel approaching him and here, where two high-class devils had set up shop no less? Are you Hayato Isekun? Yes. W. Would you go on a date with me? Beside him, Afai's bristled. He placed a hand on her head to calm her down. So, that was her game. Lure him out on a date so that he would let his guard down against her. It might have worked if he was an ordinary human. Sorry, but him seeing someone right now. There, that should throw her off her game for a bit. 
Without waiting for a reply, Issei continued walking, subtly pulling off Ice who was obviously contemplating erasing the fallen angel girl from existence. He didn't need to turn around to know the girl was glaring daggers at him. He could already tell from the meager murderous intent coming from her. Heh, stupid girl, she's way too transparent. Rubbing off his head to placate her, he asked her the usual question. What do you want for dinner? Yakisoba. All right, the takoyaki, yakitori, ebai tempura, chashu pork, nikujaga, toro sashimi, maguro sashimi, saba sashimi, tonkatsu, judon. Afai's cut him off and listed even more dishes. Oh boy, Afai's only gets like this when she's unhappy. He was proven right when he caught sight of the pout on Afai's face. All right, all right, they'll cook anything you want, so don't be angry anymore. Okay, Afai smiled and leaned into his eye again. Hisse belongs to me. Afai's hugged his arm tightly, suddenly getting possessive. Yeah, yeah, I know. They stopped in front of a set of large wooden doors. The entrance to his sizable estate, the size of twenty of his old house packed together, that the history compilation committee had acquired for him. The property was completely Japanese style, having even koi ponds, a kendo dojo, an archery range and an onsen. The only things moderately modern were the electrical appliances and the swimming pool. Issei smiled. Home sweet home. The next day after school, Issei noticed the fallen angel hanging around Kyu Academy again. Fool, once was bad enough, but wandering into the territory of two high-class devils in a Shinto. Demi got a second time she must not be very bright. Or perhaps her pride had taken a blow when he nonchalantly rejected her yesterday. Not that it mattered either way, she wouldn't have to wait much longer. By the end of the day, she would be permanently retired. He sent off Ice home ahead of him and waited until after most of the students had left before he made his way to the park. He sensed her following him. So predictable, this was going to be a boring fight. He stopped in front of the fountain. The park was deserted. Good, he didn't have to hold back. F-W-O-O-S-H. The sound of something moving through the air at high speed entered his ears. He smirked and summoned a pillar of fire behind him. The spear of light that was aimed for him was consumed by his flames and disintegrated. What he heard the fallen angel yell in disbelief. Fool, she gave away her position, using the fire as his cover. Issei moved behind her and surprised her by cutting off one of her wings with a lightning-coated hand. She screamed in pain as spurted out of the stump. You am going to kill you, brat. Issei snorted. Don't get too cocky, small fry. I can kill you anytime I want, without getting a scratch. Brat, you're going to rue the day you picked a fight with a high-class fallen angel like me, Rainer Sama. You, a high-class fallen angel. Your kind must be on the verge of extinction if they are desperate enough to confer the title high class onto a weakling like you. She was almost foaming at her mouth in rage. She created another spear of light and thrust it at him. Die, brat, she got the shock of her life when he caught the spear in his hand and crushed it. What's wrong is that the best the high class fallen angel, Rainer Sama, can do he asked in a mocking tone. This time, fear was clearly mixed with rage in her expression. How the hell are you doing this? Are you using your sacred gear? Foo fu ha ha ha. Issei burst out laughing. Don't flatter yourself. I don't need my sacred gear to take out small fry like you. Issei stopped laughing and said in a cold voice. He took slow steps towards her, his hand raised and a giant fireball forming in his palm. Rainer began backing away in fear. No 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 no, stay away Rainer frantically formed spears in her hand and flung them at him, but they disintegrated from the sheer heat of the fireball in his hand. Issei sighed. How disappointing. I actually hoped to have a fun fight before I killed you. Oh well, there's always the next idiot. Farewell, fallen angel. Before she could scream, the fireball shot forward and engulfed her, turning her body to ash. You can come out now. Issei called out. From behind a nearby tree, Ria's Grimory stepped out. When did you notice I was here? From the beginning. You should look into spells that can hide your presence. Getting caught like that by an enemy can get you killed. Awa, are you worried about me that's so sweet? Ria smirked at him. Issei snorted in response. Like hell, I don't really care if something happens to you. I already said it, didn't I? I hate devils. In fact, I'd be happier if you'd hurry up and die. Oh ho, is this what they call Tsundi Rias teased him? Oh, as expected of an otaku, you're quite familiar with those terms. Issei retorted. So, what are you going to do about the other three crows that took up residence in the old church? Issei switched the subject to the other three fallen angels he sensed in town. Nothing for now. They haven't given me a reason to fight them. What about you? It's the same for me. I only killed the one just now because she went after me first. The other three aren't my problem. I see. Well then, we'll be parting ways here. He'll see you in school tomorrow, Hayaudokun. With that, Ria's disappeared through a magic circle. Now then, I better get back and cook dinner. Issei turned and left the park. As expected, the remaining three fallen angels didn't make a move against him at all since three days ago when he killed their comrade. He did sense them poking around, observing him, but they were probably too afraid to directly approach him. The one he killed must have been the leader. But still, they hadn't cleared out of town, which meant they were still planning something. He would have to keep a close eye on them, just in case. Or maybe he should just march up to the church and destroy them. No, no, doing that might bring down the wrath of the biblical god on him for attacking one of his churches, even an abandoned one. A stupid move to make, considering that there were devils in town. Doing so might spark. Another great war between the three factions, and the Shinto faction would probably get caught up in it too. 
He was fairly certain that if such a thing did happen, the Shinto faction would win, but he couldn't be sure since. Grigori had his rival, the Hakuryuku on their side and there were rumors that Heaven had a Longinus possessor too. Not to mention the two monsters, Serzech Lucifer and Ajika Beelzebub. Even the reclusive Shinto faction had heard of their absurd strength through the intelligence gathered by the History Compilation Committee. Not even he was willing to pick a fight with either of them. He was a battle nut, but he wasn't batshit crazy. For now, he just resumed his routine of attending school and waited for the fallen angels to make their move first. off -Eyes was walking beside him, still sleepy after playing video games till after midnight. hi -woo. Thud. He stopped when he heard someone cry out and something hit the ground. He turned to see a nun lying face down on the ground. off -Eyes just looked at her with a disinterested expression. Though, there was a glimmer in her eyes that Issei couldn't read. hi why do I keep falling down? He heard her speak in Japanese, yet her lip movements made it clear that she was actually speaking a different language. Looks like the translation spell written on the talisman in his pocket worked like a charm. It was a good thing the spell also worked both ways. Issei knelt down and offered his hand to her. Are you okay? The nun looked up, allowing him to see her face. Blonde hair and green eyes. He had to admit, she was attractive. Yes, thank you very much. She grasped his hand and he pulled her to her feet. He took notice of the traveling bag she had on her. A nun with a traveling bag the only church in town is now the nest of those crows, which means. He really hoped he was wrong. She looked way too innocent to be involved with the fallen angels. Are you traveling? No, I was assigned to the church in this town. Damn, his hunch was spot on after all. Issei sighed. The church is on the outskirts of town. Do you need me to show you the way? Yes, that would be helpful ah. It must be the blessing of God that I met such a kind person she clasped her hands together in prayer. Her faith in God was strong, so she didn't appear to be working with the fallen angels willingly, so what was her story? What's your name? I am Asia Argento. Pleased to meet you. She bowed deeply. Following the etiquette literally beaten into him by his mother, he bowed back. Behind him, Office pouted, but bowed slightly as well. Likewise, Assassin. Him I out Oise, and this is Office. He didn't know why, but he got the feeling that his somewhat peaceful life was about to be shattered. Issei walked down the streets, heading for the church just outside town. To his left was Office, the strange glimmer in her eyes that Issei didn't know what to make of still present. To his right was the nun he had just met and was escorting to the church, Asia Argento. For some reason, a part of him felt drawn to her. Not his human aspect, or his divine aspect, but his draconic aspect that was a result of Deedrage's influence. Issei wondered if Office was also being affected by the strange allure. Are you here alone? Issei asked the nun. Yes, I was just recently assigned here. Oh, but I heard that there are already other members at the church. Yeah, a bunch of low-level fallen angels is a privately thought to himself. Are you okay here by yourself? You can't speak Japanese, right? Yes, but once I've settled down, I can start learning Asia Argento replied in an upbeat voice. Provided the crows don't do anything to you first, some people had all the luck, and some had none at all. Issei was inclined to believe that this kind nun was one of the latter to be involved with the fallen angels. There was also a strong sorrow in her eyes that spoke of a past trauma. UWAH. Issei was shaken out of thoughts by a loud cry. He looked at the park they were passing, the same park where he met Office and saw a boy sitting on the ground wailing, seeping out of a scraped knee. A woman, who appeared to be his mother, was trying to console him. Yashkun, it's okay, it's only a small wound. Since his mother was with him, Issei figured that the kid would be fine and was about to continue walking when Asia went into the park towards the boy. H. Hey Issei and Office followed her. Asia knelt down beside the boy. Are you okay boy shouldn't be crying because of a small wound like this. Asia patted the boy's padded head gently. The boy looked at her in confusion, not understanding what she had just said. That was natural. She was speaking in Italian, so unless one was fluent in the language, unlikely for a kid, or had a translator, like Issei's own translation charm or the devil's language, even more unlikely, Asia might as well be speaking gibberish. Then, Asia placed her hand over the boy's scraped knee. Issei's eyebrows rose when he saw a faint green light emitting from her hands. The small wound closed instantly. A sacred gear Issei wondered silently. His left arm was aching slightly, confirming his theory. That healing power is the ability of a sacred gear. Beside the boy, the mother looked very shocked at what had just happened before her eyes. Issei wondered why Asia would use a sacred gear in front of ordinary humans. There, your wounds are healed. The pain should be gone now. Asia patted the boy's head. The boy smiled in response. Thank you, Wanachan. He said thank you. Issei translated for Asia. She smiled happily. Recovering from her shock, the mother grabbed the boy's hand and dragged him away as fast as she could, leaving Issei, Afais, and Asia in the park. Asia, that power is at a sacred gear. Asia stiffened before nodding sadly. Evidently, her sacred gear was a contributing factor in her past trauma. Yes, my sacred gear, twilight healing, a wonderful power that the Lord gave me. But, how did you? Don't worry, I won't pry. I also have a sacred gear, so I also somewhat know what it's like. Asia smiled in appreciation and got to her feet, and the three continued walking to the church. You're a kind person, you know not many people would go out of their way to help someone, especially not someone with such a light injury. Issei commented as they continued their walk to the church. Really I think that there are many kind people in the world. I'm happy to be called one of them. 
Issei smiled sardonically. This girl was naive but kind, definitely not someone who would willingly work with fallen angels. Issei briefly considered killing the fallen angels to get her out of their clutches, but dismissed the thought. He didn't want to risk sparking the next great war by barging into a church uninvited. Ah geez, when did I become this sentimental? He looked at the nun and couldn't help but feel a strong attraction to her. Not a romantic one, he loved Afais and only Afais with all of his heart, but something was drawing him to this nun. Afais surely felt the same attraction as well. Issei paused as they made it to the front of the church. Issei looked at the dilapidated building and noted it was even more run down than he imagined. He vaguely remembered that this church was quite prosperous eleven years ago when Irina and her family were still around. Without anyone of devout faith, he supposed that the church would have been abandoned eventually. But, there was a light coming from inside, and three fallen angel auras, all rather weak, weaker than the one he had killed the day before, and several dozen human auras, all slightly stronger than an average human, and one that was above the rest, stronger than even the fallen angels. Stray exorcists, Issei realized and internally grinned. Looks like he would be entertained after all, if they chose to attack him. Yes, this is the place Asia exclaimed in happiness beside him. All right, then, we'll be going. Ah, please wait, at least let me offer you a cup of tea as thanks for your help. It's fine, the two of us really need to get going. We're going to be late for school. Oh, I see Asia's expression turned downcast, and Issei felt just a bit guilty. When we have time, we'll come visit you. Then, we can have that cup of tea. Then, we'll take you on a tour of the town. They, what do you mean they were friends? Right. Friends Asia's eyes widened. That's right, friends. And that's what friends do for each other. Oh okay, I look forward to that Asia smiled in delight as she waved to Issei and off eyes, who waved back as they left. Once they were out of sight, Issei lowered his arm. Afais, did you feel an attraction to her as well? Issei asked Afais. Afais nodded in response. That girl has a strong affinity with dragons. And also she has a very kind heart. Issei looked back in the direction of the church. It didn't feel right, leaving someone so kind in the clutches of the fallen angels. Not to mention, he had sinking feeling in his gut, like he should not have left her alone. Issei shot up in his bed, feeling a huge fluctuation of energy in the direction of the church. It was in the middle of the night, long after he had escorted Asia to the church. Issei, Afais sat up as well. Afais, what's going on? Afais closed her eyes, trying to get a feel of the energy coming from the church. The fallen angels are removing the girl's sacred gear. Afais said after a short while. Shit, I knew I shouldn't have left her there as they got out of bed and got dressed in a hurry. Off eyes. Stay here it will be bad if heaven finds out that the dragon god is in their territory Issei called out to his mate as he dashed out of his manor. Quickly casting a speed spell on himself, Issei moved through the streets like a gust of wind and quickly reached the front of the church. The fluctuations were getting more erratic, meaning the extraction process was almost done. He had to hurry. Sorry about this, god. Issei offered an apology to the biblical god and unceremoniously kicked down the door. The inside of the church was almost pitch black, dimly lit only by moonlight. Yeah, whoa, 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 Issei looked up at the sound of an overly enthusiastic greeting to see a white-haired teenage boy dressed in priest's clothes leap down from the rafters, a crazed look on his face. Who are you? You don't look like a devil. Well, whatever, devils or not, as long as I can cut someone up, imperfectly happy. Get out of my way. Issei cut him off and punched him in the gut with a lightning-coated fist. The stray priest hunched over in pain, coughing up. What he lost consciousness and slumped to the ground, a fist-sized burn on his torso and pouring out of his mouth. Issei felt fluctuations of energy coming from below the church and kicked the altar aside, revealing a staircase leading down. Descending quickly, he reached a set of iron doors. Inside, he could hear a girl screaming in pain. Shit he kicked down the door and was greeted by the sight of dozens of stray priests gathered in front of an altar, with Asia tied to a wooden cross, screaming in pain. In front of her were three fallen angels, a tall man, a tall woman, and a gothic Lolita girl. Who the hell are one of the stray priests began to demand of him, but Issei cut him off by jumping up and landing on his head. Using the heads of the stray priests as stepping stones, Issei made his way to the altar, but just as he reached it, flesh. There was a bright flash of green light and two silver rings with green gems embedded in them floated out of Asia's body, wrapped in green light. Asia's sacred gear had been successfully extracted. Asia slumped, the extraction process having taken a huge toll on her body. The tall woman collected the rings. Cursing, Issei leapt up to the altar and kicked the three fallen angels aside. He sliced off the ropes holding tying Asia to the cross with a bolt of lightning and caught her as she fell forward into his arms. Meanwhile, the three fallen angels recovered from the kick. You little. Issei pulled a talisman from his pocket as the tall man began cursing him. He shut his eyes as the talisman exploded in a bright flash of white light, blinding the fallen angels and the stray priests, disorienting them and causing to fall into a panic. Using the opportunity, Issei escaped the underground chamber with Asia in his arms. Issei ascended the stairs and returned to the nave. He noticed that the stray priest he had defeated was gone. A trail of lead out of the doors. That guy was actually able to get up and walk away in the short time Issei was down there he was briefly impressed before he sat Asia down on one of the benches. Her body was slowly getting colder. Asia Asia Issei attempted to wake Asia up by calling her name. 
Asia's eyes opened slightly, revealing tired green eyes, most of their light having already faded. Isasen. Yeah, it's me. Sorry I'm late. I'm happy you came to save me. Of course I did. That's what friends are for, right? Friends from the corner of her dim eyes, tears slowly leaked out. I'm so happy to have a friend even if it was only for a short while. Asia turned her head to look at the ceiling of the church. Isasen, I don't think I have much time left. Before I leave will you listen to my story? Sure. Essay gritted his teeth and agreed. This was one of the times he really wished he didn't suck at healing techniques so much. Asia told Issy a story of a girl who was once called a holy maiden. In a certain region in Europe, she was abandoned by her parents. A nun took her in and raised her with other orphans in the local church. The girl, having grown up a faithful believer in the biblical God, discovered a wonderful power granted to her by her lord at the age of eight. Using her wondrous healing power, she healed a wounded puppy she found, and her act was witnessed by a member of the Catholic Church. From there, her life changed. She was brought to the Catholic Church and was praised as a holy maiden for her power. She used her powers to heal many believers, who were told that power was a gift from their Lord. Rumors begot more rumors, becoming more outlandish with each one, and she became known as a holy maiden, all without her consent. But, she didn't mind. The members of the Church were always kind to her and she liked healing people to begin with. She was happy that her power could be of use and thanked her lord for granting that power to her. But, she was also lonely. In the Catholic Church, she didn't have any friends that she could open up to. Everyone around her treated her nicely, but also kept her at a distance, not willing to be her friend, and even she could understand the reason. None of them ever saw her as a fellow human being, but as a creature that it could heal them. Then, one day, everything changed again. There happened to be a wounded devil nearby. She couldn't ignore it, because it was in her nature to heal anyone who was injured, even if they were her enemies. And so she healed him. But, that act was witnessed by a member of the church who informed the higher-ups. Needless to say, they were mortified. A power that can heal devils. Something that absurd cannot possibly exist. The power of healing can only heal the followers of God. There were other people who possessed the power of healing as well, but none of them could heal devils. The higher-ups believed it was only logical that the power of healing granted by God could not heal fallen angels or devils. However, there was a similar incident in the past, where there was someone who could heal even the fallen angels and devils who had fallen out of God's grace. But, that power was feared as the power of a witch. And so, the girl was branded as a heretic. You damned witch who heals devils. The girl who had been praised as a holy maiden suddenly fell from grace and was feared as a witch and was thus thrown out of the church. With nowhere left to go, she had no choice but to join the Grigori, where she received the protection of the fallen angels. But even then, she never forgot to pray to her lord, nor did she forget to thank him. But even so, she was abandoned. God did not save her, and no one from the church was willing to defend her, because no one cared enough to do so. It must be because I didn't have enough faith because I'm clumsy and good for nothing else besides healing even now. This must be happening to me because I didn't have enough faith in the Lord. As he listened to her story, Issei's fists tightened to the point where his palms were beginning to bleed. Strange. Gods were not kind beings. Issei was perfectly aware of that, and he was also aware that his divine grandparents, even his sadistic grandfather, were much kinder than most gods. However, according to his grandparents, the biblical god was one of the most benevolent gods in existence. Without fail, he would surely answer his followers' prayers. Even during the Great War, the biblical god had been reluctant to fight until he was left with no other option. So, something had to be wrong for the biblical god to not save this kind soul dying in front of him. And Issei should have been able to tell that something was wrong if his mind wasn't currently clouded by rage. In his current state, he was unable to connect the dots and see that something had to be wrong. Right now, the only thing he could think of was cursing the biblical god. Hey, Issei, and if I were to be born again would you still be my friend? Issei gently pressed his forehead against Asia's cooling one. You don't have to worry about that. Someone as kind as you will surely ascend to heaven. And if you are reborn, that's even less reason to worry. He'll still be your friend. So, rest easy. By the time you wake up again, the world will surely be a kinder place. Asia smiled. Even as she was dying, her smile was still radiant. Thank you, Asia whispered and closed her eyes. Issei felt her life force fade and her pulse stop. She was gone. Bam. The floor behind him exploded as the three fallen angels blasted through, followed by the stray priests. There you are, you damn brat you're gonna pay for that the male fallen angel growled at him. Then, he saw Asia's body lying on the bench. Oh, so the is dead, how good riddance, her sacred gear was the only thing she was good for. Oh, did you come all the way here just to play hero too bad for you, you were a bit too late. Issei's eye twitched when the fallen angels and the stray priests behind him burst into manic laughter. Issei stood up and sighed. Ah, oh, you know, I was actually going to leave you three idiots alone even after the other one's pathetic attempt to kill me. What you're the sacred gear brat that Rainer was sent to kill I see, you're the one who killed her the gothic Lolita fallen angel realized, but Issei ignored her. But now, Issei slowly turned around, and the fallen angels and stray priests froze in place when they saw the coldness in his eyes. You've really gone and pissed me off. At that point, Issei's body was coated in black flames that even the fallen angels, as arrogant as they were, were certain would kill them instantly. 
As they tried to escape, Issei snapped his fingers. Immediately, a barrier surrounded the church. The fallen angels crashed into the barrier as they flew through the shattered windows and fell back down to the ground. It's no use. Even though this barrier is low level by my standards, trash like you have no hope of breaking through it in time before I kill you. Issei took slow steps towards them, black fire trailing behind him, but not burning anything, not even the wooden structure of the church. I guess I'm slightly glad Asia's already passed on. She won't have to see this. A burst of horrific, dreadful black aura sent the fallen angels and the stray priests to their knees, barely to raise their heads enough to see the boino, the monster standing before them. As they looked into his cold eyes, they felt as if they were sinking into a deep abyss, utterly devoid of light. Scream all you want, cry all you want, beg all you want. No one is coming to save you. Not your masters, not your comrades, and most certainly not God. The black flames wrapped themselves into the shape of blazing black claws around Issei's forearms. Prepare yourselves, I won't grant you an easy death like I did the other fallen angel. It'll strip you of every last shred of dignity, pride and hope you have. You will suffer at my hands like Asia did at yours, and then you will die like dogs at my feet. With those final words, Issei leapt at his victims, claws outstretched, looking like a demon of old. Pained, fearful and hopeless screams filled the night, but no one would save them from the wrath of the demon tearing through them. Riz and her peerage arrived at what appeared to be a scene from the ninth circle of hell itself. She was aware that a sacred gear-bearing nun had walked into town this morning. The only church in town was abandoned and occupied by fallen angels, so she figured that the nun was astray. She wasn't expecting said nun to meet Hayato Issei and Afis of all people, but heaved a sigh of relief when they simply escorted her to the church without starting a fight. She didn't fancy her territory becoming ground zero for the next great war. Then, the night of the same day, she sensed a surge of energy coming from the church, and panicked when she felt Hayato Issei moving at incredible speed towards it. For a few moments, all was quiet as the surges of energy ended. Then there was a gigantic burst of malicious energy that sent Rias down to her knees. She recovered and contacted the rest of her peerage and they headed for the church, struggling against the malice that grew stronger the closer they were to the church. They finally got to the top of the hill where the church was built, almost dead on their feet from the effort it took to get there and froze in terror at the scene in front of them. The church was engulfed in ominous black flames. No, engulfed was the wrong word, as the flames were not burning the church itself. The flames were simply spewing out of every opening, wrapping themselves around the building, but not actually burning the building itself. Rias noted that there was a powerful barrier surrounding the church, one that she could not break easily, not even with the power of destruction. But at the same time, the barrier felt sloppy, as though it had been hastily cast without any preparation beforehand. But, what terrified them the most were the screams. Sweet Satan, those screams Rias was no stranger to screams of pain. She had killed several stray devils before, not to mention the few fallen angels here and there unlucky enough to cross her path, but these screams were on a completely different level. Someone, please save me. Why why won't these flames go out? Ah, it hurts it hurts it hurts. The sheer pain, fear and despair she heard in those screams terrified even a high-class devil like her. She wondered just what had happened. The church doors burst open and a male fallen angel, though one had to look really hard to tell, engulfed in the black flames, his skin blistering and melting to reveal his innards, flew out and crashed into a barrier. He clawed desperately at the barrier, trying to get out and caught sight of them. He looked at them with scorched, haunted and desperate eyes and begged them for help. Please please save me don't let that monster. S-Q-U-E-L-T-C-H. He was abruptly cut off when a claw of black flames burst through his chest, gripping his heart. Ah, uh, G-U-H. The fallen angel gurgled incoherently as copious amounts of poured out of his mouth. Then, the claw pulled out and ripped out the fallen angel's heart, and the fallen angel fell to the ground, pooling and vaporizing around his burning body. Rias looked up to get a good look at the owner of the claw, and paled when she saw Hayato Issei, wreathed in black flames, his cold, ruthless eyes surveying the destruction he had wrought without a hint of regret, sorrow or sympathy. Rias paled as she realized just how dangerous Hayato Issei truly was. And worst of all, he didn't appear to be serious yet. Despite the huge amount of flames engulfing the entire building and the length of time he's been maintaining them, he didn't appear the least bit winded. Riaz wondered, just how much of his real power was he still hiding? Hayato Issei turned back to the nave, and then there was one. Any last words? Hayato Issei spoke to a tall fallen angel woman, whose legs were consumed by the black flames that were slowly beginning to spread to the rest of her body. She was holding her hands out towards her burning legs and Riaz could faintly make out a green light coming from her hand snow, from the silver rings on her fingers. Riaz realized that it was the nun's sacred gear. The fact that the fallen angel was using it meant that it had been extracted, meaning the nun had died. Was that the reason Hayato Issei was slaughtering them they had only met once, and Hayato Issei was avenging her death. Then, Riaz noticed something else. It was quiet. Not completely silent, she could hear the leaves of nearby trees rustling in the wind, she could the black flames crackling. But the most prominent sound, the screaming, had stopped, and Riaz knew why. Everyone else was dead, incinerated by the black flames until not even ashes remained. The night was almost serene without all the screaming, though the image was still somewhat spoiled by the black flames and the few splashes of here and there that weren't close enough to the flames to be vaporized. 
Why this sacred gear is supposed to heal any wound, so why want to heal my legs? The fallen angel, her face filled with fear and despair, screamed. Riaz realized that she was right. Even though she was using the healing power of the sacred gear, none of her wounds were healing. Oh no, it's definitely working. If you weren't using that sacred gear's power, my flames would have already consumed your entire body by now. The fact that you are still alive proves that the healing ability is working, just not fast enough to overcome the power of my flames. Hayato Issei slowly started walking towards her with an impassive look on his face. He'll ask you again, any last words? WW wait what is it you want he'll give you anything you want, so please, just spare me the fallen angel, stripped of her pride, begged pathetically for her life. Hayato Issei paused in his steps, and if Rias could see his face, she would be able to see that he had an eyebrow raised. Really then, bring Asia back to life. The fallen angel froze at the impossible request. Two can't do that she admitted in a quiet voice. I see. Hayato Issei raised his hand, and the black flames in the area gathered and formed a giant black fireball. W wait two can't do that, but I can find someone who looks like her to replace her. You're useless to me. Die. Hayato Issei coldly cut her off and threw the fireball at her. Without any time to even scream, the fallen angel was erased from the mortal plane with no trace left behind. The black flames vanished. Having burned only the stray priests and the fallen angels, if it weren't for the few splashes of here and there, it would be impossible to tell that this had just been the scene of a one-sided massacre. The barrier around the church vanished and the oppressive aura around Hayato Issei faded away. Drip. Riaz blinked when a droplet of water gently touched her nose. She looked up to see that black clouds had gathered overhead and rain was beginning to fall. The rain washed away the remaining droplets of, completely erasing any trace of the earlier shed. Riaz looked back at the church to see Hayato Issei walking out with a body in his arms. A girl a bit younger than herself, with blonde hair and beautiful smooth skin. Riaz had to admit, the girl was quite beautiful. Riaz noticed two silver rings on the middle finger of each hand. Hayato Issei must have retrieved her sacred gears. For the first time since they arrived, Hayato Issei caught sight of them and his eyes narrowed. Is there a reason you're here, Riaz Gremory? From his tone, Riaz knew he wasn't in a good mood, and so she treaded lightly. We felt the fallen angels making their move, so we came to investigate. Though, it looks like you beat us here. HMPH, I was still too late to save Asia though. Can't you revive her, Riaz asked. She knew he was capable of many things, so it didn't seem too much of a stretch for him to be able to revive the dead. If I could, I would have already done it. I suck at healing magic. Hayato Issei admitted. He walked past her without another word. What do you intend to do with her body? Give her a proper burial. Don't be so hasty. I still have this. You know Riaz took out her remaining bishop piece and waved it in the air. Hayato Issei's eyes sharpened and Riaz wondered if she had just signed her own death warrant. Then, his eyes softened and he grimaced slightly before setting the nun's body down on the ground and turning around. Hurry up. Riaz blinked at his consent before shaking her head and placing the bishop piece on the nun's chest. He'll need her name for the process. Asia Argento. H.M. In the name of Riaz Gremory, I command you. Asia Argento, I bring you back to this earth as a newly reincarnated devil. You, my bishop, rejoice in your new life. The bishop piece sank into Asia Argento's chest. For a few moments, there was silence. Then, Asia's eyes opened and she sat up, looking around in a daze. Huh. Then, she caught sight of Hayato Issei. Hisaisen. Let's go, Asia. Hayato Issei offered a hand to her. Go go where she asked as she took hold of his hand. Home. Hayato Issei answered simply and pulled her to her feet. Asia Argento stumbled, but Hayato Issei immediately caught her and picked her up in his arms. As he made to leave, he turned his head. He'll let her rest at my house for a few days. Then, once I bring her up to speed, he'll take her to your club room. His tone implied that he was requesting permission. But, Riaz didn't mind. That's fine. Hayato Issei made to leave, but paused in his tracks. Riaz Gremory. H.M. He'll definitely find a way to repay you. Then, without waiting for a response, Hayato Issei disappeared from sight with Raya's new bishop in tow. Riaz stared at the spot that he had just vacated, and giggled. He really is a tsundere. A week peacefully passed after the end of the fallen angel incident. As he had said, Issei brought Asia home and prepared himself for office wrath. Surprisingly, unlike with most other girls who were close to Issei, Afais didn't seem to mind Asia's presence and welcomed her warmly. Warmly for her anyway. Issei informed Asia of her current circumstances. Asia was shocked at first at being reincarnated into a devil, but accepted it without any complaints. If I can be with Issei-san, I don't mind becoming a devil, was what she said. Issei scratched his cheek in embarrassment. Asia settled in nicely as both a member of Ria's Gremory's peerage as well as a student. Ria's Gremory arranged for her to be transferred to Issei's class, where she was warmly welcomed by the entire class, mostly the boys. Most of the girls got jealous when they heard that she was living under the same roof as one of Kiwis princes. Of course, when they saw how naive and innocent she was, they heaved a sigh of relief and treated her kindly. While Asia settled into her new life, Issei was racking his brains as to how he was going to repay Ria's Gremory for reviving Asia. He couldn't think of a single act that could fully repay his debt to her, so he figured he would have to do it in installments. His first act, of course, was to start treating her and her peerage more kindly than before. It came as an unexpected, but not unwelcome surprise to them, but they accepted the change without a word. 
and right now, that was why he was walking to their club room, a cake he had baked in hand, and off eyes walking beside him. Asia, as well as the rest of Rias Peerage, had been called to the club room earlier, something about Gremory clan business. Issei stopped when he neared the old school building. There were two unfamiliar auras in the occult research club room, both that of devils. One was relatively strong, a bit stronger than Rias and aside from the texture of darkness that was common to all devils, also had a texture of fire and wind. Compared to Issei's own power, it was of course heavily lacking and Issei had full confidence that he could easily defeat this aura's owner. It was the other aura that worried him a bit. Its power exceeded his own, though only by a small margin. The aura had an icy feel to it, but more importantly, was old and controlled. Whoever this aura belonged to, he or she was a war veteran. Keeping that in mind, Issei was sure that he would have to use his scale mail in order to defeat them. Shaking off his hesitation, Issei continued his way to the club room, taking a deep breath before knocking on the door. The heated chatter inside abruptly stopped. Ajo-sama, are you expecting visitors? No, come in. Issei heard a regal, yet respectful voice ask Rias, who permitted him to enter. He pushed the door open to see Rias seated on the couch, her peerage standing behind her. Seated on the couch opposite her was a blonde male with blue eyes, wearing a blazer over a white dress shirt that had one button left open, with matching pants and black shoes. He gave off a bad boy vibe that made Issei instantly dislike him. It seemed the feeling was mutual since said bad boy was glaring at him, presumably for interrupting but the one that attracted Issei's attention was the maid standing slightly away from everyone else. She was a tall silver-haired, grayed woman dressed in a French maid outfit. She was attractive, Issei would admit that much, but she was also giving off an impressive oppressive aura that made everyone else in the room nervous. She was staring him with a hint of curiosity and caution. Is this a bad time? Issei asked nonchalantly. Ria's looked glad at the interruption. No, your timing is impeccable. Issei set the cake down on the table. The bad boy rose to his feet. Cake you interrupted our meeting for a measly cake you damn peasant. Turned to ashes he lost his temper and threw what had to be the most pathetic fireball Issei had ever seen. Issei caught the fireball with one hand and shocked everyone present by taking a bite out of it, before promptly spitting sparks of flames out. This has to be worst fire I've ever tasted. Issei nonchalantly crushed the fireball in his hand without receiving so much as a burn. You why you the bad boy looked like he was about to blow a gasket when the maid stepped in. Razor-sama, please sit down. This peasant dared to disrespect Mimi, a scion of the Phoenix clan. I am not telling you in order to protect this man. I am telling you for your sake. You cannot defeat this man. The bad boy, Razor, froze in place. Are you saying that he is superior to me? He hides it well, but his power is almost on par with mine. You cannot hope to defeat him. At that, everyone else in the room, save off eyes in Asia, who was looking between Issei, Rays, and the maid in confusion, turned to stare. At Issei in shock. The maid bowed elegantly to Issei. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Grafia, a servant of the Gremory clan. May I ask who you are, young man? Issei bowed back. I am Hayato Issei, a Shinto demigod. The grandson of Amaterasu, the queen of the Shinto Kamis, and Suzanu, the Shinto god of storms. Hayato Issei released his full power aura to make his point, sending everyone, except Afis and the maid, to their knees. He reined it back in a second later and the oppressive aura vanished. Rias rose to her feet, looking a bit peeved. I've been trying to figure out who you were for the past year, and you tell Grafia when she asks you. You basically cornered me when I was alone and demanded to know who I was, threatening me with violence when I didn't answer. Had you asked politely, I would have told you. Issei countered with a glare of his own. Hayato Issei-sama, may I ask what the Shinto faction stance towards devils as Grafia asked him. Had it been just a few minutes ago, I would have said neutral. However, Issei turned to glare at Razor, who froze at the intensity of the glare. One of your kind just attacked me, a descendant of the queen of the Shinto Kamis as well as her brothers, without any reason. You do realize that wars have been started for less. Razor regained some of his bravado and puffed his chest out, his nose high in the air. H ha how do we know you are not bluffing you could just be a human who happens to have strange powers. Issei held out his hand. A katana materialized, releasing a powerful aura. A holy sword. Holy sword I'd appreciate it if you didn't compare me to those little toothpicks. I am Fatsuno Matama, a divine sword. A voice rang out from the sword, causing everyone to stare at it. Fatsuno Mitame a legendary sword wielded by Takema Kazuchi, but was never seen again after it was taken back from Emperor Jinmu who had borrowed it for his campaign to the east it appears that his claim is valid. Only a member of the Shinto faction could possess that sword. Unless you are trying to say that a human managed to sneak into the heavenly plains and steal it without any of the Shinto Kamis noticing Ria's challenged Razor, who scowled and sat back down with a huff. This is obviously a very delicate matter, so I would like to consult our Mao about this. Grafia requested, a touch of nervousness entering her normally stoic expression at the thought of a war with the Shinto faction. Go ahead. Grafia bowed and left through a magic circle. Issei sat down on an unoccupied chair and crossed his arms while waiting. Ria's, her peerage and Razor stared at him in apprehension. 
After a few moments of silence, Issei spoke. Grimmery, who's the punk? Razor bristled at the insult, but did not make a move. Despite his arrogance, he was well aware that he might have instigated a war against the Shinto faction and that it would likely end in the devil's defeat, and so did not wish to aggravate the situation any further. He's my fiancé, unfortunately. Rhea spat the word fiancé with as much venom as she could muster. I'm guessing you aren't too happy about this arrangement. Of course not. I'd rather die than marry this pig Rhea surprised even Issei with her vehemence. Issei's eyes narrowed, wheels turning in his mind as he filed that information away. Then, the magic circle lit up and Grafia appeared in a flash of light, but this time she was not alone. Appearing behind her in another flash of light was a taller, male version of Rhea's gremory, dressed in armor and ceremonial robes. His eyes turned to regard Issei. You are Hayato Isekun, correct? Pleased to meet you. I am Sir Zetch Lucifer, one of the four malice. Likewise, though, I didn't expect to meet one of the legendary super devils so soon. Oh, so the Shinto faction has heard of me. Of course, Sir Zetch Gremory, Ajika Asteroth, and Ryzenum live in Lucifer, the three super devils whose full power can rival even gods. Though you and Ajika Asteroth are enemies with Ryzenum live in Lucifer, there was a chance that the three of you might unite to defend the underworld if the Shinto faction were to invade. Which is why even after the Great War, the Shinto faction was reluctant to attack the weakened three factions. Ah, so you were just bluffing after all Razor sneered, but Sir Zetch silenced him. No, razor -kun, he said reluctant, not unable, meaning they still had confidence they could win if they attacked us. That's right, the Shinto Kamis dislike unnecessary shed. If we were to clash with the three super devils, the Shinto faction would still win, but there would countless casualties on both sides. However, this does not mean we will not go to war. One of you just attacked a member of the Shinto faction without a good reason. I'm sure that you're aware that if the Shinto faction declared war against you, heaven and the fallen angels wouldn't hesitate to join us. More than half of the 72 pillars are already gone. And what's more, we have this one on our side. Issei patted Offize on the head. Offize released a powerful aura that could rival most gods to emphasize her mate's point. And this is Serzich asked as he looked at the diminutive girl. The Auroboros dragon, Offize. She's allied herself with us, Serzich. Grafia's and Razor's eyes widened in obvious fear at the thought of being invaded by a faction with the backing of the strongest being in existence. I'm sure you understand now, even if the three super devils were to unite against us, you would still lose. Serzich nodded after regaining his composure. You're quite right. The devils cannot afford another war, especially not with a faction with multiple gods and an alliance with the infinite dragon god. And it's unlikely Ryzen would help us. That man is only interested in whatever benefits him, which a war with the Shinto faction is most definitely not. Is there anything we can offer you to prevent a war? Issei crossed his arms and thought about it. A duel with the punk over there. Issei nodded his head towards Razor, who suddenly looked nervous. I see. And the rules. Free for all. He'll even let his peerage join the fight. Very well. Serzich Sama. Razor Kun, while you might be my future brother in law, your actions might have doomed us. If all it takes is your life to prevent a war we cannot hope to win, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. I'm sure your family would understand. Serzich's voice turned very cold as he eyed Razor with a hint of disdain. But, more importantly, Serzich turned back to Issei. This duel would definitely be beneficial for the devils whether or not Razor Kun wins, however, I do not see any merit for the Shinto faction. If you were to invade, your territory would expand and you would be in a good position to attack heaven and the fallen angels as well. I'm guessing there's something you want as a prize if you win. That's right. When I win, I would like you to dissolve the engagement between your little sister and the punk. Excuse me, Serzich raised an eyebrow at the unexpected words. I owe your sister a favor, and it's clear that she does not want to be married to the punk, not that I can blame her. This is my way of repaying her. I see. Very well. If you win, he'll dissolve the engagement between Riaz and Razorkun. Serzich Sama, you can't. Razorkun, I will not tolerate another word of this matter from you. I will protect my citizens, and if your pride must be trampled for that, so be it. Hayato Isekun, is it fine if we conduct the duel in the underworld? Fine with me. Lead the way. Well then, everyone, please step onto the magic circle. It will teleport us straight to the battlegrounds. Everyone hastily rose to their feet and stood within the magic circle which started glowing. You're quite well prepared to have a battleground ready in such a short period of time. Oh no, the battleground was originally meant for a battle between Rias, Razorkun, and their peerages. But since we're having a duel right now, I don't see the harm in using it. With a flash of light, the magic circle activated and Issei felt himself being lifted momentarily before his feet touched the ground. He opened his eyes to see Thave was still in the occult research clubroom. No, the energy in the air has completely changed. I see, so the battleground is a replica of Q Academy. Hayato Issei-sama, everyone else except for you, Razor-sama and his peerage has been transported to the viewing room. Would you like a moment to prepare yourself? Grafia's voice sounded from the speakers in the room. Now that he thought about it, there were 16 energy signatures, including Razor's, coming from the student council room, though the other 15 were all weaker than Razor's. No need, though if the punk needs time to think of a strategy, he'll allow it. He can plan all he wants, he'll be waiting for him on the rooftops. Understood. We wish you two the best of luck. 
The speakers cut off and Issei stood silently in the replica of the occult research club room before walking out of the door, taking his time to get to the roof. Tap, tap, tap. Issei crossed his arms and impatiently tapped his fingers on his arm as he waited for his opponent to show up. It had been about half an hour since the match had started, but Razor had not yet shown up. All of them were still gathered in the replica of the student council room and not even one had left. Don't tell me he's getting cold feet Issei idly wondered to himself. Maybe I should just go attack them myself. Issei straightened when he felt the auras leave their base at once and approach his position with great speed. Issei uncrossed his arms and coated his forearms and lower legs in weak lightning. HM just this should be enough for now. 2. A shadow descended on Issei, who casually lifted a hand to catch the blade aimed for his head. He turned his head to see a brown-haired woman wearing a knight's armor and a headband holding a broadsword that he had stopped. FWOOSH. The sound of something moving at high speed through the air entered Issei's ears. He raised an open palm and caught a fist aimed for the side of his head. This time, he was a tall woman with brown hair with red highlights. She was wearing an odd ornament on her face, a portion of a white mask that covered only the right side of her face. She was dressed in a black jacket and matching jeans. Issei noted that she was also wearing black gloves that looked slightly charred. FWOOSH. Once more, another one attacked, this time from the front. Issei looked to see a young black-haired and green-eyed girl dressed in a Chinese kippao with her foot outstretched and coated in flames as well. He raised his lightning-coated leg to block the kick. I can't defend against any further attacks like this. With that in mind, Issei tightened on the sword and swung the swordswoman into the Chinese kung fu fighter, while simultaneously pulling the tall woman closer and elbowing her in the face. All three were knocked away, just in time for Issei to see twin green-haired and blue-eyed girls in gym clothes, wielding blue chainsaws, also coated in flames. Issei twitched in annoyance and casually caught both. Chainsaws. He was temporarily pushed back when he was caught off guard by their surprising strength, but increased his own strength and tossed them aside. Rooks know, the rooks are most likely the two martial artists just now, which means these two are pawns that used promotion Issei thought to himself before looking up. It was then that Issei realized that he was surrounded by Razor's peerage. The five he had just knocked aside, all recovered and in a battle stance. Two maids, one light brown-haired and the other dark brown-haired, dressed identically, standing in a martial arts stance. Two cat girls who could have been identical twins if it weren't for their different hair colors, one blue and the other red, both wearing fighting gloves the same color as their hair. A scantily clad woman with gray hair and a metal headband with a red jewel. She wasn't in a martial arts stance, so Issei assumed that she was a magic user. A young blue-haired and brownied girl dressed in a white haori with a red obai, under a red happy, wielding a wooden bow. An elegant Japanese girl in a kimono, without a weapon in sight. Like the gray-haired woman, Issei guessed that she was a magic user. A tall black-haired and brown-eyed woman wearing a white Chinese ching sam like top, a red skirt and gauntlets and greaves. A huge sway-hander with a red hilt and a black blade was mounted on her back. And if she had been a human, Issei would not have been able to believe that she could actually use that monstrosity effectively. Finally, floating above him were the last two members of Razor's peerage. The first was a voluptuous, purply-haired and purplied, wearing a skirt and a tunic top that didn't do much to cover up her cleavage. In her hands was a staff, making it obvious that she was also a magic user. Furthermore, among all of the members of Razor's peerage, she had the strongest aura, meaning she was most likely the queen. But, it was the other girl that caught his attention. She was a blue-eyed teenage girl with her blonde hair tied in twin, ponytails with drill-like curls. She was dressed in a light purple dress with a blue bow tie at the front and three phoenix tail-like extensions at the back. Combined with the wings of fire she was using to fly, she seemed very much like the regal fire bird of legend. Issei's eyes narrowed slightly as he felt her aura. It spoke of fire and wind, as well as the darkness common to all devils. It was exactly the same as Razor's, but a bit weaker. A sibling, perhaps Issei thought to himself. He had never seen a high-class devil join the peerage of another high-class devil, her own brother, no less, for her to gain experience before starting her own peerage. That was Issei's best guess, but right now, that didn't matter. He just had to defeat the lot of them, and this silly farce of a fight would be over and his debt to Ria's would be settled. He looked around, but couldn't find the boss monkey anywhere. Reaching out with his senses, Issei found his aura still in the replica of the student council room. Trying to wear me out with his underlings first damn coward Issei muttered to himself in irritation. Still, it was a valid strategy and Issei had to reluctantly applaud him for not approaching carelessly. Issei sighed and got into a battle stance. Allow me to apologize in advance. I do not take pleasure in hitting women, but it looks like there's no other way to draw your boss. His opponents frowned simultaneously at his words that implied that he could easily defeat all 15 of them on his own. But before any of them could say anything in response, Issei vanished from their sight. As they whipped their heads around trying to find him, a crackling sound entered their ears. Boom. An explosion rang out throughout the school grounds and their vision was obscured by smoke. Three pawns, one bishop and one knight of Razor-sama's peerage, retired. The rest of Razor's peerage froze when they heard that five of their numbers had been taken out. A teleportation spell to remove combatants when they've received critical damage that's convenient. I won't have to hold back as much as I thought. 
Razor's peerage tensed when they heard their opponent's casual comment from inside the smoke cloud. The smoke dispersed and Hayato Issei was standing in the spot where the Kimonok-led girl had been standing a few seconds ago. Her, as well as the two maids, the Scantilic-led woman and the Zwayhander wielding knight had vanished from the rooftop. Impossible Marion, Burent, Shuria, Mihi, and Cirrus were all defeated in an instant. The relation of Razor floating in the air muttered in shock and fear that this battle would not go anywhere near as well as they had hoped. Sorry, but I'd rather not waste time fighting you girls. He'll have to crush all of you in an instant. Issei sighed and started walking towards the remaining eleven opponents. You don't get too cocky the one that Issei had correctly assumed to be the queen, Yubaluna, got mad and pointed her staff at him. Issei felt a buildup of magic power in the staff and was slightly surprised. At the speed, his eyes narrowed as he felt the magic leave the staff and travel towards him, though he wasn't able to see it. Yet, he made no move to dodge it and was obscured by smoke when an explosion engulfed him. Ah, it's over no opponent can take my strongest explosion spell head-on without being forced to retire the queen laughed as smoke billowed from the point of impact. Splat. Her laughter was quickly cut off when she felt a jolt of pain in her abdomen. She looked down to find a Y-arm protruding from her stomach. Hey. She let out a sound of astonishment before coughing up copious amounts of. The arm was roughly wrenched out and she fell forward, dropping down to the roof, but disappearing right before she landed. One queen from Razorsama's peerage, retired. The rest of Razor's peerage began to get nervous as the strongest member was defeated in one attack. They looked up to see Hayato Issei Flotino, standing in midair, his left arm, coated in a macabre mix of lightning and. He tilted his head to the left to avoid a fireball aimed for his head, cast by the relation of Razor Phoenix, who had a look of pure fear on her face. Issei pointed a finger behind him and fired a bolt of lightning through her stomach. She shrieked in pain as the bolt carved a hole through her abdomen and a strong electrical current ran through her body, but the hole was covered in flames and closed in an instant. Oh, so that's the famed immortality of the Phoenix clan. HMPH, what a silly trick. All I have to do is utterly destroy every trace of your body. You can't regenerate if there's nothing left of you. Issei snorted and raised his hand. Around him, the kanjis for fire, water, wind, earth and lightning appeared and multiplied, forming a wall. Each kanji was wrapped in the element it represented and grew steadily bigger. His superior HM Issei hesitated in firing and summoned a bolt of lightning behind him to deflect a blade of flames aimed for the back of his neck, forcing him to land. I will not allow you to harm Ravelsama the knight that had been the first to attack him struck again, this time her blade coated in flames. She swung the blade once more, only to be met with a blade of lightning Issei had created in his hand. With a swift movement, Issei brought his blade of lightning down on the knight's sword, shattering it, and proceeded to drive his blade through her stomach. The knight stumbled back, hand over her bleeding abdomen and vanished in the next instant in a flash of light. One knight from Razorsama's peerage, retired. Issei whirled around and caught a flaming fist from the masked rook, who he immediately flipped over his shoulder and attempted to drive his sword into her chest. The rook rolled to the side, barely evading the tip of the blade, and kicked at Issei, who stepped aside and sliced her foot off. Reeling from the loss of her foot, the rook didn't notice the blade aimed for her until it had pierced her sternum. She too vanished in a flash of light. One rook from Razorsama's peerage, retired. Issei raised his arms and caught a bow and a flaming leg overhead. He tossed the remaining rook and the bow-wielding girl away and struck them down in a bolt of white lightning. Both vanished before the bolt even dissipated. One rook and one pawn from Razorsama's peerage, retired. Issei kicked himself off the ground and landed behind the chainsaw-wielding twins, who swung said chainsaws, coated in flames, around in an attempt to strike him. He ducked and the chainsaws struck each other, the cutting chains jamming and locking each other in place. Issei swung his sword horizontally, slashing their abdomens. As spurted out of the wounds, the twins were also removed from the battlefield. Two pawns from Razorsama's peerage, retired. Issei turned and gazed at the remaining two pawns coldly. They shivered in fright as he slowly walked towards them, his lightning-coated limbs crackling with each step. They turned and tried to run, but were stopped by a pillar of fire that appeared in front of them when Issei stomped his foot hard. As Issei continued stomping, more pillars appeared, surrounding the cackerels. With a snap of his fingers, the pillars expanded and combined, forming a ring of fire that close on itself and consumed the cackerels. Two pawns from Razorsama's peerage, retired. With all but one member of Razor's peerage defeated, Issei turned to the remaining bishop, who was called Ravel if he heard the knight correctly. She trembled in fear as his cold gaze turned to her. Do you still want to continue I don't mind, but I won't show any mercy to you. Ravel shivered, but stood her ground. I, and the daughter of the Phoenix clan and Onisama's bishop I will not run like a coward. Issei nodded, idly noting that she was Razor's little sister. H.M., you're a good kid. He'll make this painless. Issei moved behind her in a flash and struck the back of her neck, catching her as she fell unconscious and laying her down gently. Issei rubbed his head. Great, now I feel bad for bullying a kid. Issei stood up as Ravel was removed from the battlefield. One bishop from Razorsama's peerage, retired. Now that just leaves the boss monkey. Issei looked towards the student council room to see that Razor was still making no move to leave. Coward. Issei sneered and raised his hand over his head. 
a giant bolt of lightning formed in his hand, lengthening and sharpening, until it looked like a giant electric javelin. Get your ass out here, Issei flung the javelin in the direction of the student council room. The javelin exploded with great force, generating a pillar of lightning that consumed the replica of the main school building in an instant, vaporizing it and forcing Razor out of his hiding place, most of his body covered in flames as he recovered from the powerful attack. The damn Razor started, but was cut off when Issei appeared in front of him and rammed him in the gut with his elbow. Razor staggered backwards, losing his balance after having the wind knocked out of him. Shut up and fight. Issei raised his arm and brought an elbow down on Razor's open back, sending him down into the ground. Razor quickly recovered and threw a fireball at him, which Issei casually crushed in his hand. It's no use. Flames like yours will never work on me. Don't get cocky. Bastard Razor's temper flared and flames burst into life around him, surrounding him and cloaking him. He smirked smugly, believing that he couldn't be touched while within the flames. The smirk abruptly faded when a hand passed through the flames and grabbed his face. Before he could even think of struggling, he was pushed out of the flames. Is that all you got is he asked as he blasted Razor's head off with a blast of lightning. Razor's body fell to the ground, but was engulfed in flames as Razor's head regenerated. Razor looked up at Issei, this time with a hint of fear and uncertainty on his face, unnerved at how his most powerful defensive ability was pierced so effortlessly. I can keep this up all day. You should just save yourself a lot of suffering and give up. Issei sighed, already bored by the fight. Like hell I cannot give up when my pride is on the line Razor coated his fists in flames. Shooting up at high speed with wings of flames, he punched Issei's face as hard as he could. Razor paused when Issei's body was pushed back, wondering for an instant if he had won. That hope was crushed when his flames were suddenly extinguished, revealing Issei's cold face with nary a scratch on it. I already told you, your flames are incapable of harming me. Issei struck Razor with a lightning-coated fist that exploded upon contact, sending him careening through the air and into the gym. Issei floated down to the wreckage as Razor pulled himself out of the debris. There's no point in dragging on this pointless fight. He'll end this now. Issei held up a hand and immediately, a ball of ominous black fire formed in his palm, bouncing it up and down a few times before tossing it at Razor's legs, where it immediately ignited and started consuming said limbs. Razor raised an eyebrow. It's useless. I can just rage. Razor stopped, his eyes widening as he started screaming in pain. Og, what is this? Why isn't my body regenerating? You are. It's just that the rate at which my flames are destroying your body exceeds the speed of your regeneration. Issei coldly explained as Razor writhed in agony. Damn it, damn it, damn it, why can't I extinguish this flame? Razor's panic increased as he tried and failed to will the flames away. That shouldn't be possible. The Phoenix were masters of fire and wing magic. While not at his older brother's level, Razor was easily stronger than most high-class devils. There wasn't supposed to be any fire magic that he could not suppress. And yet, this black flame was not only resisting his control, it was overcoming his regeneration, the greatest of his abilities. Of course not. The black flame of Amaterasu will not bend to anyone but those who possess the of the Queen of the Shinto Gods. They cannot be extinguished through any means, and once they've taken hold of you, they will burn you for seven full days, 168 hours, without end. Can you endure the pain, no? Can you survive all seven days of this torment? Razor's already pale face paled even further as he registered the full extent of the brutality of this attack. There was no way in hell he could possibly survive this technique for seven days. In just a few short minutes that the flames had started consuming his body, the flames had already destroyed his feet and most of his lower legs. He probably had less than an hour before he was completely destroyed by these bizarre flames. But what could he do? He could not stop the flames. He had just tried and failed, and if his opponent's claims were to be believed, which Razor reluctantly did, he would not be able to extinguish them. The only one capable of extinguishing these flames is his opponent, and he wasn't looking too keen on helping Razor. Surrender. Razor froze, despite the unbelievable pain traveling up his lower extremities. Surrender, and the pain will end. You dare insult my pride again. Again with your pride. Is that pride of yours truly so important? Of course it is I am a scion of one of the 72 pillars, one of the few pure devils left I am a higher being a superior being, who is now writhing on the ground like a worm, completely at my mercy. I wonder which is more important to you your pride or your life. What you wouldn't dare. Don't forget, this fight's purpose is to quell my anger so that the Shinto faction won't declare war against you devils. If I want to, I can claim your life as well. However, I'm offering you a choice. Your pride or your life, choose which you will give up. Cruel. Razor finally understood just how cruel this boyno, this man was to those who roused his ire. It was a decision that Razor could not easily make. He was a selfish man, even he knew that, but he believed it was his privilege to be selfish. He coveted anything and everything and would do anything in his power to obtain it. That's why he could not make a decision. He did not wish to die, but he did not want to swallow his pride. He wanted to live, he wanted to stand tall, he wanted to win. But, it was hopeless. For the first time in his life, Razor understood what hopeless truly meant. He had never met such an overpowering opponent before, and right now, the chances of him winning had plummeted to zero the instant the black flame touched him. 
or perhaps it was even earlier than that. As the flame continued making its way up Razor's body, primal fear slowly took over. He didn't want to die, 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 he wanted to live. I, HMSA, snapped out of his bored days as Razor spoke. A hey, surrender. What was that? I couldn't quite hear you. Could you speak? Issei mockingly cupped his ear and leaned to Razor's prone, burning form on the ground. I surrender, I give up already, I want to live, I want to live, so please. Put the flame out, Razor's pride shattered, leaving behind only a shadow of his former self. His upper body, not yet touched by the flames, shivering and tears marring his face as the full weight of his mortality was driven home. Issei straightened and looked skywards, looking for confirmation. Well, acknowledged, Razor Sama has resigned. Winner Hayato Issei Sama. Issei nodded at the acknowledgement of Razor's defeat. He turned back to the sobbing wreck that was once the proud Razor Phoenix. Geez, you could have saved yourself the pain and humiliation if you had just obediently given up when I told you to. Issei snapped his fingers and the black flame vanished. Razor's devastated body was immediately wrapped in flames as it regenerated, but he did not seem to notice as he continued sobbing. Issei raised any eyebrow as the ground beneath him lit up as a magic circle formed. In a flash of light, he was teleported to what appeared to be the observation room that Grafia had mentioned earlier. In the room, Rias, her peerage, and two men who resembled a middle-aged razor and an older Serzech, were staring at him in shock, probably at how one-sided the fight had been. Only Office, Serzech, and Grafia, who had already expected this result, did not seem in the least bit surprised. Issei made his way to the two middle-aged men, who he assumed were the heads of the Gremory and Fenix clan. They seemed to get just a bit nervous as he approached, but paused when he bowed. Please allow me to apologize. Even though this fight was to prevent the outbreak of a war, I have made a mockery of the union between the Gremory clan and the Fenix clan. Ah, no, I understand that this whole incident was the result of my son's arrogance and recklessness. This was a good lesson for him, and I'm quite satisfied with the result, even if it means that the union between the two clans will not be realized. Lord Gremory, you are also satisfied with this result, aren't you? Yes, I'm fine with this. It's a bit of a pity that the engagement had been called off, but it's a small price to pay to prevent a war. The two lords seem to be okay with the result. Well then, off eyes and I will be taking our leave. Lords Gremory and Fenix, Mao Serzech Lucifer and Grafiasin, it was a pleasure meeting you. Issei bowed once more before turning to leave with a talisman, off eyes next to him. He paused as he walked past Rias. My debt to you has been repaid in full. Don't expect any more favors from me. Without waiting for a reply, Issei used the talisman to teleport off ice and himself back to the human world. As the spell activated, Issei turned to his mate. Off ice, what do you want for dinner? Spaghetti. Without hesitation, off ice repiled. Italian food that's unusual. You usually request Japanese food weight. Don't tell me you were eating during the entire fight. Off ice nodded without a hint of shame. It's nice to know you care. Issei deadpanned. The result was obvious even before the fight started. Off ice defended herself. Ha oh, whatever, I'm not as confident about my skill at cooking Italian, but he'll try. Issei and off eyes were engulfed in a flash of light emanating from the talisman and vanished from the observation room. What are you doing here? Issei rubbed his temples as he took in the sight in front of him. He was standing at the gate to his estate and standing before him was Ria's Gremory, with a lot of luggage behind her. Issei was getting a sinking feeling he did not like. Him moving in with you. Issed it obvious Ria's proclaimed without a care. Like hell why the hell should I let you stay here do I look I have a death wish Issei paled as he thought of what off eyes would do to him if she found out. Why are you yelling? Issei froze as the person he feared most came up behind him. Oh 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 off eyes. This is. He'll be moving in as well. He'll be in your care. Office and Rias cheerily said, not sensing Issei's fear. Office eyes narrowed as she turned to look at Issei. Is that so? No. Wait this is GYH Issei let out a pitiful scream that echoed throughout town. Let it be known that even someone as strong as him was utterly whipped by his mate. That was quite the interesting fight. Don't you think so as well, father? HMI agree, but to think the reclusive Shinto faction would suddenly make a reappearance like this. Agreed, it's as though it's an ill omen that our peace is about to be shattered. I can only hope the underworld will be able to brave the oncoming storm. Issei's eyes shot open and he leapt out of bed when he heard an odd shuffling sound next to him. He got into a battle stance, wondering how the intruder got past the barrier around the estate and got so close without he or off eyes noticing. But paused and forced down a groan when he saw it was just Rhea's Gremory, trying to sneak into his futon without alerting him. The expression on her face was quite similar to a child who had been caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Issei pinched the bridge of his nose. Rhea's Gremory, what are you doing? I was trying to join you in bed. She said with a pout that only served to further irritate Issei. I believe I assigned one of the empty rooms as your own. Go sleep in your own room. I don't feel like it. I can't sleep properly unless I'm naked and cuddling something. Then go buy yourself a giant stuffed animal or something. Don't wanna. You're more than enough. Sleep. In. Your. Own. Room. Issei said while flaring a bit of his own aura to deepen and magnify his voice. Rhea's Gremory's pout grew wider and she reluctantly walked out of the room. Issei sighed, glad that Afais hadn't woken up throughout the whole argument, or at least chose to ignore it. 
Normally, he wouldn't tolerate a devil other than Asia living in his estate, but Sir Zex Lucifer had sent a formal request that she be allowed to live with him for the time being. The official reason being there was a possibility that Razor Fenix would attempt to make a move on her again. But that was bullshit, and all of them knew it. There was no way that Razor had fully recovered from the massive psychological damages they had dealt him during their match, nor did he think that Lord Fenix was underhanded enough to make a move on Riaz even after the contract had been dissolved. Most likely, Serzech was simply entertaining his little sister's whims, since he doesn't have much time to spend with her, being busy with his duties as a Mao. Personally, Issei didn't think a faction leader should be so sentimental, but Issei didn't have the right to judge. It wasn't like he wouldn't go out of his way to entertain Afiz's whims himself. Issei thought himself to be opportunistic, so he didn't waste this chance to build relations with the devils. No matter how much he disliked the species as a whole, he would not let his personal matters interfere with the affairs of the Shinto faction. It would be quite beneficial if Serzech Lucifer and Ajuka Beelzebub became their allies. But, he had regretted his decision since day one. She intruded on his and Afiz's baths, meals and sleep almost every opportunity she got. Afiz probably would have killed her if she wasn't such a good cook. Issei had taken one bite of the Western-style meal she had cooked and admitted when it came to Western food, she was a better cook, though he had to say that he was still better at cooking Asian dishes. Not only that, but she had been pestering him to let her peerage come over for their club meetings while the old school building was being cleaned. That was an even bigger pile of bullshit than her reason for staying here was. The old school building was cleaned by their familiars and could easily be done during lesson time. She just wanted an excuse to invite her peerage over, though he couldn't tell what the reason was. She wasn't the only one acting odd. The other members of her peerage, save Asia who was still the same as before, were acting strangely towards him as well. Akino had become a bit more affectionate towards him, something that, considering her sadistic nature, actually terrified him a bit. Kaniko was a bit more subtle in her change in attitude. She would offer him just a bit more food than usual, stand closer by just a bit, and her gaze would linger on him for just a bit longer. Issei didn't think it was affection or anything, but an interest in his show of power and her own desire to become stronger. Issei rolled his eyes, wondering if he would have to train yet another devil. Yuta was the one who had changed the most. He lost his focus, staring off into space during clubroom meetings, and even during lessons, he was reportedly not paying attention to the teacher and stared outside instead, deep in thought. It was even beginning to affect his training. He made mistakes he usually wouldn't, making too big of a step, putting too much strength into a swing, using too much effort to dodge an attack. Issei had crushed him one-sidedly without needing to resort to spells or techniques, something he hadn't been able to do since the beginning of Yudo's training. He had asked him what was wrong, but Yudo denied there was anything on his mind. But Issei could see the strong animosity in his eyes, not directed at him, but at Futsu no Matama. While Futsu no Matama wasn't one of the legendary holy swords that Yudo despised so much, it was a divine sword that was very close. He had probably been shaken to see such a powerful sword so close to him. Issei sighed once more, this time mixed with a stifled yawn. It was way too late at night for him to be thinking about this. He crawled back into bed, carefully making sure not to disturb Afiz as she slept. Smash! Metal fragments flew and landed on the ground as Issei effortlessly smashed another one of Yudo's demonic swords with his bare hand. Slam. Erg. Yudo grunted as Issei's knee slammed into his stomach and sent him sprawling to the ground, dry heaving as bile went all the way to his throat, leaving a vile aftertaste behind. Issei sighed. This isn't working, Yudo. You're still too distracted to train properly. Look at yourself. Just a week ago, I had to use rage and no yoroi to beat you down. Now I can do it barehanded. Yudo snarled as he got up. Not yet. I'll force you to dry your sword. Issei frowned. Aye, so that was what all this was about. He wanted to fight Futsuno Matama. Don't be a fool. Even if you were in your peak condition, if I used Futsuno Matama against you, I'd kill you by accident. Don't underestimate it just because it isn't as famous as other legendary swords. The destructive power of a divine sword is far beyond that of any holy sword. In other words, if I can defeat your sword, it means I'm strong enough to settle my grudge. Yudo ignored his warning and said with an obsessive light in his eye. Issei sighed. It appeared he had no intention of backing down. Fine then. I'll show you just how conceited you're being. Issei held his hand up. With a white flash, a beautiful katana, still sheathed in its scabbard that looked ornament, crafted from black lacquered wood with metal ornaments at the far end, appeared in his grasp. The tsukedo, the distinctive cloth wrapped around the handle of a katana, was woven in the traditional diamond pattern from black over gold threads. A black seijo, a cord meant to be used to wrap around the wielder's waist, hung loosely from the scabbard. Yudo's knees almost buckled as an absurdly heavy presence, originating from the katana, bore down on him. And it hadn't even been drawn yet. What did you bring me up for I don't sense any strong opponents in the area. I need to teach him a good lesson. You're needed for that. Ha ha just get this over with. I want to go back to sleep. Issei and Futsuno Matama had a short conversation. Yudo straightened himself and created the biggest demonic sword he was able to muster, feeling irritated that his opponent was being dismissive of him. Finally Yudo muttered and charged recklessly at Issei with a battle cry. Fool Issei said with a sigh and easily sidestepped Yudo's reckless vertical cut. 
He then proceeded to slam the still-sheathed katana into Yuuto's gut. Crack. Issei almost winced when he felt one of Yuuto's ribs crack under the force that proceeded to obliterate the ground behind Yuuto as well, the damage as far as several meters. Yuuto's eyes went wide and his mouth opened wide in a soundless scream as he fell to his knees, the burning pain radiating throughout his entire body far worse than anything Issei had even done to him in a spar. Understand now you took that much damage from being hit by a sheathed Futsuno Matama, designed to heavily restrain her powers when not drawn. Imagine what would have happened if I had used the actual blade on you. Yuuto grimaced. There was no doubt that there wouldn't even be anything left of him if the actual blade had been used. In your current state, forget about a divine sword like Futsuno Matama, you can't even win against one of the low-level holy swords. Damn it, I'm still this far away from Excalibur Yuuto growled to himself, but low enough for Issei to not hear it. Excalibur, what does the most famous holy sword have to do with your hatred for all holy swords in general, Issei asked. He usually wouldn't pry, but Yuuto's grudge was getting out of hand and getting in the way of his training. Yuuto froze at the slip of the tongue and seemed to wither before Issei's eyes. Some of the tension left his body and he sighed. He seemed to have calmed down a bit. I guess I should have told you sooner. About my past. Will you listen? Yuuto asked almost timidly. Issei stared at him for a moment before nodding. Yuuto spent the next few minutes explaining what had happened to him in the past. How he had been kidnapped by the church at a young age to be an unwilling participant in the Holy Sword Project, a church project to produce artificial Excalibur wielders, along with dozens of other similar aged children. How it had gone on for years, and his comrades slowly dwindled down to only slightly over a dozen, the rest having lost their lives in the course of the experiment. How they did not lose their faith in God, and continued to pray to him to deliver them from their suffering. How the project was deemed a failure and shut down, ending in the disposable of the surviving test subjects. How they were thrown into a small room and slaughtered like animals with poison gas. How even then, they continued praying to God to save them, but to no avail. How his comrades had sacrificed themselves to give him an opportunity to escape. How, despite their efforts, he sucked to the poison in the forest in the middle of winter. How Rias had found him on the verge of death and reincarnated him as a devil. And finally, how he had vowed to avenge all of his comrades' death, no matter the cost. Issei remained silent even after listening to Yuguro's story. He had heard rumors of the unscrupulous things the church had done, but he didn't think they had gone as far as to sacrifice children for their own purposes. And all of this had been done under the watchful eye of the biblical god, supposedly the most benevolent god of all Issei resisted the urge to sneer. Obviously, the other gods didn't know him as well as they thought they did if he had condoned this holy sword project. Yudo, I'm not a member of the three factions, so I don't have all the information or the full story, so I can't say for sure that you're mistaken. I personally do not think that you're proceeding down the wrong path in wanting to avenge your comrades. I would do the same if I was in your shoes, so I won't say anything. Except for this. Yudo, you grew up with your comrades. You supported each other in the worst of times, and no matter how much you suffered, all of it served to strengthen your bonds. You had a powerful camaraderie with your comrades. So, Yudo, do you honestly believe that they were so shallow that they only helped you escape just so that you would avenge them? Yudo's eyes widened as he stared at Issei, who dismissed Futsuno Matama and turned around. Our training will be put hold until you get over this phase of yours. Take a walk and clear your head. I'll see you in school tomorrow. Issei walked away, leaving Yudo alone in the ruined courtyard, his heart in a state of turmoil. Issei was walking home to his estate, Afais, who had waited at the school gate for him to finish his training session with Yudo, beside him. Issei sighed, wondering if what he said would be enough to snap Yudo out of his emo face. Probably not, he could be stubborn, especially when it came to his grudge. Drip. H.M. Issei looked up when a drop of water splashed down on the tip of his nose. Drip, drip, drip. Issei groaned as he regarded the black clouds that had gathered in the sky above, raindrops beginning to fall, and wondered if he should use his power to disperse the storm. Not too suspicious. Issei sighed. Looks like he would have to use his powers to dry his and Afize's clothes today. Issei and Afize picked up the pace, not wanting to get caught in the heavy rainfall before they got home. Issei sighed in relief as the front gate of the estate finally came into view, glad that the rain hadn't gotten too heavy yet. Then, he paused when he saw two figures covered in white cloaks standing outside the gate, looking at the nameplate next to it that read Ayato. Exorcists Issei realized, and wondered if he should be preparing for a fight. But, he couldn't think of any reason why exorcists would want to hunt him down, other than the fallen angel and stray exorcist massacre he had been responsible for a few weeks ago. But, they should be thanking him, not hunting him. Issei is narrowed when he sensed a strange aura coming from both of them. One coming from the long wrapped package being carried by one of them, and the other coming from the upper arm of the other exorcist. Then, one of them perked up as she noticed their approach. Oh, Issei Kun long time no see your family got yourselves a really nice home while I was gone the exorcist said in an upbeat, slightly bubbly female voice. I'm sorry, do I know you Issei asked, unable to identify who she was. Hey you don't remember me that's so mean of you, not remembering your childhood friend. It's kinda hard to see your face past the rain in that cloak. Oh, right, sorry, I forgot about this. But, since it's raining, I'd rather not take this off. 
Can we come inside? Wait, are you sure we can trust him? I sense a very powerful aura coming from him and the girl next to him. They're definitely not human. The other exorcist said in a female voice as well, though hers was a bit deeper than her partner's. Hey Isekun, don't tell me you became a devil while I was gone. Hell no. If you ever suggest that again, I'll gut you. I'm not fond of devils. I was almost killed by three of them when I was six. Six that would be right after I moved away. Right after you, Arena. The only person Issei could think of that moved away during that time period was his childhood friend, Shidu Arena. But, Arena was supposed to be a... Bingo, you got it right long time no see, Issei-kun. Hey Chim, now that I think about it, you did have an unusually high voice for a boy. So, you were a girl after all. Well, it can't be helped. Back then, I acted really boyish. So, if you're not a devil, where are you? Me, I'm a demigod. Come again, I think the rain's too loud, because I could have sworn you said that you were a demigod. There's nothing wrong with your hearing. I'm a demigod. But the Lord had a child. No, 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 no. Why would that be your first guess? You are aware there are other gods aside from the biblical god, right? I'm the grandson of Suzanu and Amaterasu. Who? Arena, I know you're a Christian, but at least be aware of the head deities of the main religion of your own birth country. Suzanu and Amaterasu are two of the Shinto trinity that leads the Shinto faction. Uh, had Irina laughed sheepishly as she rubbed the back of her head through the cloak covering her. And the girl the other exorcist asked. This one, she's a dragon in human form. Don't mind her, she's harmless as long as you don't piss her off. Issy imagined they were raising an eyebrow, their attention shift to the alleged dragon in human flesh. Well, come in. You're going to catch a cold if you stand out in the rain for too long. There's plenty of bathrooms in my estate. Go take a hot shower. Ah, thank you. Sorry for intruding. Irina said the traditional Japanese greeting when entering someone else's house and took off her shoes to leave in the entryway. Sorry for intruding her partner followed suit awkwardly. Wow Isekun, your house got really big Irina said as she marveled at the size of the estate. One of the perks of being a relative of the leaders of the Shinto faction is a massive spending power. The quartet walked into the main hall and Issei pointed down the hallway to the left. The biggest bathroom is down that hall, it should be big enough for both of you. There are also some yukatas on the shelves, you can change into those. Okay let's go, Zenovia we haven't taken a shower all day. Why yeah the other exorcist, whose name was evidently Zenovia, said as Irina pulled her towards the bathroom. Once they were out of earshot, Issei mumbled to himself. They didn't even leave the package behind to take a shower as I thought, that thing inside is. Issei, Afais interrupted his monologue. HM, growl, I'm hungry, Afais said, ignoring the loud growl that erupted from her stomach. Sorry, I'll get started on dinner. Issei said after a moment of awkward silence and got up, walking to the kitchen to start cooking. Afa is following behind him to wait in the dining room in the meantime. Ah, I should cook for those two too. Issei thought. It was still pretty early in the evening, so those two probably hadn't eaten yet. The modern kitchen looked very out of place in a traditional Japanese mansion, but Issei was hardly a stickler for conventionality. It was certainly much easier to use than traditional kitchens, plus Afais would complain if he took too long to cook. After roughly half an hour, the mouth-watering, ambrosial scent of freshly cooked food wafted through the Japanese-style mansion, causing Afais, who was sitting in the dining room, to tap her fingers on the table impatiently as Issei cooked dinner for six people. In contrast to the modern kitchen, the dining room retained its traditional appearance, a short in height, but long in length wooden table atop tatami mats and a washitsu, along with cushions for people to sit on comfortably. Because it was directly connected to the modern kitchen, the whole thing made for a very strange image. A feeling of irritation spread in Afiz's heart at being forced to wait longer than usual for Issei to finish cooking since he was making a meal for more and more people as they came to live in the house as well. Afiz liked Asia well enough, so she didn't mind having to wait a bit longer for Issei to cook a bigger portion for the three of them. Riaz was someone who irritated her to the extreme. She interrupted her alone time with Issei every opportunity she got. Thanks to her, she couldn't feed Issei and vice versa in peace, she couldn't cuddle with Issei as much as she did in the past, she couldn't enjoy the hot spring water and bask in her lover's presence, and she couldn't get a good night's sleep with him without being interrupted somewhere in the night. It was only because she was so good at cooking western food that Afais had abstained from outright killing her, instead taking to crushing her where she stood with her presence and striking fear into her heart with a terrifying gaze. If she dared to escalate any further, she would die a horrible, painful death, Issei's objections and diplomatic relations be damned. And now, her dinner was being delayed even further because of these two visitors unacceptable. Afais wondered if she could escape his notice long enough to go to the bathroom and quietly dispose of the two in return without arousing suspicion. Probably not. Issei wasn't squeamish about killing people, but he was very strict when it came to maintaining friendly relations with other factions as far as possible. Afais didn't think Issei would be angry with her for very long, but if she could help it, she would rather not cause trouble for her beloved. He would so often go out of his way just for her after all. Stump 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 stump. H.M. Issei and Afais looked up when they heard an odd noise rapidly making its way towards them. Is that food I smell? Issei almost jumped in surprise when a sudden loud voice came from outside and the shoji door shot open, a drooling arena, dressed in a pink yukata, standing in the doorway. 
Her partner, Zenovia, stood behind her, dressed in a dark blue yukata, salivating as well. Now that they were no longer wearing their cloaks, Issei could get a good look at them. Irina had certainly changed a lot in the time Issei hadn't seen her. Who was once a child that could be easily mistaken for a boy was now a rather beautiful woman with long light brown hair held in twin tails with blue scrunchies and violet eyes. With her bust size, it was impossible to mistake her for a male anymore. The aura he had felt from her still came from the same place, her left upper arm. Zenovia was an equally beautiful woman. She was taller than Irina, though not by much, but shorter than Issei. She had dark blue hair with strands of green at her fringe, and dark yellow eyes that looked brown under the right light. Her bust size was bigger than Irina's and looked uncomfortably tight under the slightly too small yukata she was wearing. In her hands, she carried the same package from before. Yes, that is food you smell. I'm cooking dinner, so take a seat. You two certainly took your time in the shower. Did you forgot how to put a yukata on or something? Issei answered his childhood friend's question and added on. No, it's just been so long since I was able to enjoy a hot bath that I didn't want to get out. Your bathtub is really big it's almost like a public bath. Funny how she can remember what a public bath looks like, but not who the main deities of the prevailing religion of her own birth country are. Issei idly thought to himself as he finished seasoning the soup. Not ten minutes later, the four sat in Siza at the dining table, eating the Japanese-style feast Issei had cooked. Delicious this is delicious, Irina. Ah, I miss the taste of the cuisine of my homeland. Irina and Zenovia devoured their portion of food like it was going out of fashion, and then moved on to the extra portions that were typically for Afis, who bristled and picked up her pace as well. Between the three gluttons, Issei was barely quick enough to get enough food for three people before they were eaten. Placing a talisman on the table and putting two portions of food over it, Issei activated a transfer spell. The two portions' food disappeared in a flash of light. Idegun, be we did debut go arena asked with her mouth filled with food. Swallow before you talk. No one wants to see all the half-chewed food in your mouth. Gulp. Irina swallowed the mass of food in her mouth with a great swallow. Sorry, where did the food go? There are two more residents in this house, but they'll be coming home late today, so I sent their dinner to them instead. Oh, you mean your parents? No, my parents are in Kyoto. They decided to return to their duties as Shinto demigods. I myself only came back to this town to complete my education. After that, I'll return to Kyoto to join them. Irina nodded in understanding. So, who are the other two residents in the house? Mao Lucifer's little sister and one of her peerage. Irk Irina choked on her drink as she processed his words. Cough cough there are devils living in this mansion. Unfortunately, I do not mind the latter, but Rhea's grimery annoys me to no end. Then, why would you let her live in this mansion? Is she that powerful that she was able to force you to do as she says if you want? We could kill her for you. Zenovia offered. You wouldn't dare. Killing Mao Lucifer's little sister will likely spark the next great war, and I'm sure the church is trying to avoid that at any cost. Zenovia grimaced, but conceded his point. Anyway, it's not like I couldn't force her out any time I want. I'm much stronger than she is. Then, why are you letting her live here didn't you say you dislike devils? It's true, I do dislike devils. But, I'm not so unprofessional that I would allow my personal feelings to jeopardize diplomatic relations. If Rhea's Gremory had attempted to force her way into my household on her own, I would have thrown her out. But, her brother, Amao, personally requested that she be allowed to stay, so I can't refuse. While we could easily crush the devils, the Shinto faction is not eager to go to war. I see. Anyway, what about you two? Why are there two exorcists in town and carrying such dangerous objects with you two? Issei said as he looked at the package beside Zenovia. Yao can tell what they are. Of course, I have something similar with me as well. So, what's your story? The two of them sat up straight as their expressions became more serious. A few days ago, Excalibur was stolen from the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church and the Orthodox Church. Three different locations Ah, now that I think about it, I heard before that the original Excalibur was shattered into seven fragments during the Great War. The seventh fragment was lost, but the other six. Yes, the church took possession of them. Three fragments were recently stolen. And you suspect the culprit is in this town? Yes, we already know who the culprit is, actually, and he was last seen making his way towards this part of Japan. We suspect he will come here because this is the town Mao Lucifer's little sister lives in. Who is the culprit? Grigori leader Kakabil, as well as some of his followers. The warmongering fallen angel leader the church must be quite confident in your skills if they only sent two people to fight a faction leader. No, with the two of us, the success rate is 30% at best. It's just that our success rate was higher than anyone else's. Since we stand a better chance, the church decided to send us. Along with these, Zenovia held up the package and unwrapped it, revealing a black broadsword with an unusually long handle that continued for about two hands length, followed by an axis haped cross guard, and then continuing for another hand's length, this time in an odd chain shape. The tip of the blade was strange as well, ending in three points rather than the typical one. This one is Excalibur Destruction, Zenovia said. Irina pulled up the left sleeve of her yukata, revealing a lengthy ribbon wound around her left upper arm. She held her right hand up to it, and the ribbon unwound itself and formed a katana in her hand. This is Excalibur Mimic. The aura coming off of them was rather impressive. 
not quite at Fatsuno Matama's level, not even close, but it was certainly far stronger than any of Yuudo's demonic swords. It appeared he was right to say that Yuudo wasn't anywhere near ready to fight an Excalibur, not in his current state. They sent more Excalibur wielders to rectify the theft of other fragments, and your success rate is only 30%. You're practically handing more fragments to Kakabil. Zenovia and Arena frowned, obviously wanting to object to his harsh statement, but they knew he was right. Why not go ask Ria's Grimory for help? I may not like her, but she's quite reasonable for a devil. If you ask her for help, she'll probably listen. No, the higher-ups told us to order Ria's Grimory and Sona Citri to stay out of this incident. If the devils knew that the church had a major security breach like this, they may join forces with Kakabil to attack the church instead. Certainly, from a diplomatic point of view, Issa could see it, but personally, he didn't think Ria's Gremory or Sona Citri would help fallen angels. But, it is true that we have very little hope of success. Would you consider helping us you are not a devil, so the higher-ups wouldn't mind as much if we received help from you? I would like to, but I can't. Were the target anything but a fallen angel, I would help. But currently, the relations between the Shinto faction and the Grigori is in a bit of a risky state. Because I killed a number of fallen angels and stray priests a while back without checking if they were acting independently. We sent an inquiry to the Grigori, but we've yet to hear back from them. And it was unlikely they would. The Shinto faction was incredibly powerful, and even more so now that Afais was unofficially affiliated with them, though only the devils knew that fact at this point. The Grigori would use any means to keep them off their back. Zenovia and Arena grimaced, not at all optimistic about their chances of succeeding. But, the two looked up. If you can bring me proof that Kakabil's actions are independent of the Grigori, I'll be able to help. Proof? Huh. All right, finish your dinner. I'm sure you two have other things to do after this. The rest of dinner was spent in silence, except for the sound of Afai's munching through the feast. Arena and Zenovia had become much more subdued in their eating pace, slowing down to that of a normal, civilized person's. After dinner, the two left, promising to return the yukatas the next time they met. Issa sighed as he washed the many, many dirty dishes left behind after the feast. Excalibur at a time like this timing couldn't be worse. Issa mumbled as he thought of Yuudo. You taught on to something stupid. Yuudo trudged through the rain, taking the long route back to his apartment to clear his head. Issa's words had really gotten to him. What was it that his comrades wanted for him to avenge their deaths? Of course not. As Issei said, they were not so shallow that they only saved him for that. Then why why was it that they saved him rather than try escaping themselves? There were many amongst them who longed to live, prayed to live much more than he did. So why was he the one they chose to save? Just for the sake of saving him just so that at least one of them would survive, they didn't even have the smallest notion of vengeance in them when they saved him. No, Yudo shook his head frantically, denying that with all of his might. He had only gotten this far because of his hatred. His need to avenge his comrades was the sole reason he was still alive. It was the very basis of the existence of the man known as Kiba Yuudo. If he didn't have that, then. Who am I? Yuudo asked himself in a broken voice as the very basis of his being was challenged. Splash. H.M. Yuudo was torn from his thoughts by the sound of something falling into the rainwater pooled on the concrete pavement. H. Help me. A middle-aged man, dressed in priest robes, choked out as he lay on the ground. His life flowed out of his body and mixed with the rainwater. The light faded from his eyes in the next instant, and he fell silent. A priest Yuudo mumbled, unbothered that someone had just died in front of him. It was a priest, an enemy of devils, after all. There was no need to feel bad about his death. But, what on earth had happened to him was there a stray devil in the area. Shiver. Yudo reacted as a chill ran up his spine, and he immediately leapt away from his spot, just in time to avoid a sword stabbing into the spot his chest had been just a moment before. Yudo landed on the ground and created a demonic sword. He looked up to inspect his opponent. He was a young, silver-haired boy his age, wearing the same garb as the dead priest. Another priest or was he a stray priest? Yeah, who I came to hunt down the little lamb that escaped, and look who I find instead if it isn't a shitty little devil come the teenage priest said with crazed eyes and a manic smile. Definitely a stray priest. I have no idea who you are or why you're attacking priests, but would you mind leaving I'm in a really bad mood right now. Yudo said in an angry voice, but the stray priest either didn't get the hint or just didn't care. Ha 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 that's good as for me. I'm so happy to find a devil that I'm shedding tears of joy I'm tired of priest hunting this is way more interesting let's have a good time cutting each other up the stray priest laughed madly as he swung the sword in his hand around. TCH, no way out of this. Yudo made to create another demonic sword, but at that moment, the sword in his opponent's hand started glowing gold, emitting an aura that was all too familiar to him. Excalibur. I ha 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 let's see which is stronger, shall we your demonic sword or I, freed Zelzensama's holy sword Excalibur. Yudo growled as the object of his hatred finally appeared before him. Finally I've found you, Yudo shouted as he recklessly charged at the stray priest, who looked surprised his opponent made the first move and was almost too slow to respond when Yudo swung his demonic sword in an arc, aimed for his neck. Clang. Freed brought up his Excalibur fragment and blocked the attack. Holy Eraser Yudo shouted the name of the variant of demonic sword he had created. A black miasma emerged from the blade and attempted to envelop the Excalibur fragment, but was dispersed by the holy aura in the next instant. 
Hi ha ha, so that demonic sword of yours erases holy power sorry, that may work on those shitty mass-produced swords of light that the normal exorcist uses, but it won't do shit against my Excalibur. Yeah, I know, I just wanted to see if it was the authentic Excalibur. Now that I have confirmed that fact, I will cut it down no matter the cost. Yudo started swinging his demonic sword wildly and quickly. Clang 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 clang. Freed quickly parried each strike with ease. In his rage, Yudo had completely foregone technique and his skill had suffered. Each strike became predictable. Oh my this is only our first time, there's no need to be so aggressive save that energy for another time Freed shouted, making many Yule innuendos. The clash continued for a full minute, until Yudo slipped on a puddle he hadn't noticed beneath his foot and stumbled, giving Freed an opportunity to attack. Slash. Eric Yudo screamed in pain and fell to his knees as the holy sword cut his shoulder open, the holy power damaging his body to a greater extent than an ordinary cut would. Oh, oops, didn't you know this holy sword can kill shitty devils like you with just a few cuts? Capuch, I know there's no way I could possibly forget you Udo said as he lashed out with a sweeping kick and knocked Freed off his feet. Oh that's playing dirty Freed complained as he landed on his ass, soaking his pants with rainwater and mud. Very devilike. Don't you think you Udo responded as he pounced on the fallen Freed with his demonic sword raised? Freed rolled away, barely avoiding the demonic sword as its tip struck the spot he had just vacated. Freed recovered and rose to his feet, and the two separated to assess the situation. Freed clearly had the upper hand at the moment. Even though appearance-wise, he seemed to be losing given his shabby clothes, but holy power was slowly poisoning Yuudo's body, slowing him down and weakening his arm strength and reaction time. The longer the match was dragged out, the more of a disadvantage he would be at. Yuudo had to find a way to end this fast. Yuudo created another demonic sword in his left hand and charged at Freed, who readied his Excalibur fragment, but paused when a small magic circle appeared next to his ear. In the next instant, Freed dropped his stance and dashed past Yuudo, who was caught off guard by his opponent's burst of speed and couldn't react until he was already out of reach. Sorry, but my boss is calling me, so I'll have to cut our little tryst short see you later. Freed cackled and threw something on the ground, releasing a strong flash of light that caused Yuudo to immediately raise his arms to shield his eyes from the light. When it faded, Yuudo found himself alone, except for the corpse of the priest Freed had killed. Slam. Yuudo slammed his fist into a nearby wall, tearing his skin. Trails have flowed from his shaking fist down the wall, but Yudo paid no mind to the pain, too caught up in his frustration. Damn it, just when I finally had a chance, it slipped away. Yudo gritted his teeth in satisfaction. His unseen lifetime chance had come and gone. But, perhaps it was for the best. He was too weak, he couldn't even defeat one fragment. There was no hope of him defeating all seven, not the way he was right now. I have to get stronger Yudo mumbled to himself as he continued trudging back to his apartment, needing to take a shower and heal his wound. Do you honestly believe that your comrades were so shallow that they only helped you escape just so that you would avenge them? Yudo shook his head as Issei's words drifted into his mind again. He didn't want to think about that. He couldn't think about that. Because if he didn't have his hatred, then he had nothing. Issei felt the power surge coming from the direction of the old school building and took the pot off the stove, turned off the gas and held onto a window grill as a tremor lightly rocked the campus. It was the day after Arena and Zenovia had eaten dinner at his place, and Issei was in the middle of club activities. Today, he was experimenting with clam chowder, a western dish that Rias had cooked a few days ago that Office had liked. With his pride as both the man of the house and Office's mate, he refused to be outdone by a devil. Office sat off to the side. She was also a member of the cooking club, though she wasn't really doing anything. Partly because she couldn't use the stove properly without a stool, and partly because she didn't have any interest in cooking, only in eating. If it had been anyone else, the club president probably would have scolded them, but since it was off ice, one of the mascots of the academy, she let it go. Just having her and one of the princes of the academy, Hayato Issei, in the club caused its popularity to skyrocket. More and more members were joining, most of them only to ogle Issei and off ice, but more members meant a bigger club budget allocation, so the club president let it go as long as they could cook basic dishes on their own. He had sent Zenovia and Arena arriving in the school and assumed they were here to get Rias, Sona and their peerages to stay out of the Excalibur incident, and briefly wondered how Yudo would react. Then, he sighed as he felt them moving to the courtyard and Yudo clashed with Zenovia multiple times. He was being unusually aggressive, even compared to how he had been lately and wondered if his words had the opposite impact instead. Then, he had felt Zenovia getting serious and the coming tremor, which had prompted his actions. It was only a small tremor, but even that could be dangerous in the cooking room. Knowing that, the other members of the cooking club descended into panic, until Issei shouted at them to restore order and instructed them to turn off all of the gas and electricity until the teacher in charge returned from his toilet break. Issei and Afai slipped out of the club room and headed for the old school building, intending to see what was going on. Well, Issei was, anyway. Afai was just tagging along to enjoy his company. Issei paused as he stared briefly at the crater that had appeared in the courtyard of the old school building. He was pretty sure that wasn't his doing. He looked up to see Udo sprawled on the ground, vomiting bile with traces of fragments of shattered demonic swords scattered. 
Zenovia, dressed in a black battle suit, stood over him, Excalibur destruction unwrapped and in her hands, releasing a powerful aura as she looked down at the fallen Yudo. Off to the side was the rest of the Gremory peerage, looking worried as they looked at their fallen comrade. Further away from them, Irina, dressed in same suit as Zenovia, stood by herself, looking a bit awkward. Issei rubbed his temples, feeling a migraine coming on. What are you idiots doing? All of them turned to face him, looking surprised at his sudden appearance. Oh, Issei-kun, you're a student in this school too. Irina greeted him with an enthusiastic wave of her hand. This academy is the only school in town with a high school division. Of course, I'm a student here. You two know each other, Ria's asked. We're childhood friends. Irina used to live here until she moved away to Britain when we were six. She came back into town last night, so we had a talk over dinner. By the way Issei trailed off as he looked at Irina. Sorry, the yukatas aren't dry yet. Irina apologized. You invited them over for dinner Ria's asked with a tone of unhappiness. Yes, and before you go off on a tirade, allow me to remind you that I am a member of the Shinto faction, and I have no grudge against the church. You are a guest in my home that I'm only letting stay because your brother personally requested it, so don't try lecturing me about who I invite into my home for dinner. And what would you have done if Asia and I were at home at the time? That simple. If a fight broke out, I would have beaten the aggressor into unconsciousness. Issei said coldly. Even Asia. Of course not. Asia wouldn't start a fight. And more importantly, Issei pointed at the crater in the ground. If you guys are going to have a duel, common sense would tell you to at least put an isolation barrier to prevent damage to the outside. That tremor just now scared the crap out of the cooking club. We do have a lot of gas and electrical equipment in the kitchen, you know what would have happened if the tremor had been just a little bit stronger. Ria's had the decency to look abashed. Sorry, this was meant to be a simple spar, so I only cast a basic barrier. But, the whole thing spiraled out of control so fast that I couldn't put up a stronger barrier in time. HM, I'll let it go this time. But next time, it probably won't be just me who'll come after you. I expect Citruson won't be happy about you damaging school property and endangering the students. Issei's eyes shifted to Yudo. And Yudo, what do you think you're doing? I already said you have no hope of defeating a holy sword of an Excalibur fragments level in your current state. Yudo scowled up at him from his prone position on the ground. Then, what do you want me to do? The object of my hatred has finally appeared in front of me. Not once, but twice in a row you expect me to just sit by idly and do nothing. Twice, what do you mean? Twice, Issei asked with suspicion. Everyone else also looked at Yudo, obviously never hearing about it before. Yudo grimaced at yet another slip of the tongue. He had been doing that a lot lately. Last night, while I was walking home, I was attacked by a stray priest who had an Excalibur fragment with him. He had just killed another priest, and then he came after me. You fought him. Yudo nodded tersely. And the result of the fight, we didn't finish. He was called away by his boss, presumably Cockabeel, and ran away. Would you have won if the fight had gone on? I don't know. But, as short as the fight was, he had the advantage the entire time. Yudo admitted. And who was this stray priest did you get his name Zenovia asked? I think he called himself Fried Zelzen. Everyone looked up at a gasp from Asia. Father Fried, he's alive. Asia, you know him. Why yes, he was one of the stray priests that was with the group I was assigned to when I came to this town. Issei, didn't you kill all of them? Riaz asked him. Issei frowned at her use of his first name without his permission, but answered nonetheless. I'm pretty sure I did all. Issei started as he remembered something. Is this Fried a teenage boy our age with silver hair and crazy eyes? Both Yudo and Asia nodded. Ah, oh, that's the priest I knocked aside instead of killing when I was rushing to get to Asia. Now that I think about, he wasn't there when I came back up from the ritual chamber. He must have escaped to the Grigori. And Cockabeel recruited him with a troublesome guy. I know a freed Zelzin. He was a top-class exorcist who used to be sent by the church to eliminate devils and mythical beasts. But he never had any faith in God from the beginning. He was just looking for an excuse to kill. At first, the church didn't care as long as he did it to enemies. But eventually, he started killing fellow exorcists so the church charged with heresy and tried to get rid of him. So, he went to join the Grigori after that and now, he's involved in this incident too to think we have to deal with this because the disposal unit didn't do their jobs properly Zenovia muttered to herself before looking up. Thank you for this information. In return, I'll tell you something, Ria's Gremory's knight. It seems that you're the rumored sole survivor of the Holy Sword Project. That project was known to be one of the worst incidents in the church's history. The archbishop who was in charge of the project was excommunicated, and we heard he joined the Grigori. Since this incident involves the theft of the Excalibur fragments, there's a good chance he's involved too. A strong murderous intent burst forth from Yudo as he processed the information. Who is this man? Balba Galilei, the man known as the Genocide Archbishop. Balba Galilei, if I keep chasing Excalibur, I'll eventually meet up with him. What you do with this information is up to you. But if you get in the way of our mission, I'll kill you myself. Irina, let's go. If Fried Zelzin is in town, that means Cockabeel and the stolen fragments are here too. Oh wait, before you go Issei stop them. Zenovia, would you mind having a spar with me? Everyone, save off ice, stared at Issei as though he had grown a second head. Excuse me, Yudo's in the middle of a phase right now and far from his peak condition, but defeating him without getting a single wound is quite the feat. I'm interested in the skill of a church swordswoman. 
Well, I don't mind, but in return. Yes, you'll cook meals for us at your place until our mission is over. Breakfast and dinner only. I'm still in school at lunchtime. Hisse negotiated. Deal. Zenovia sealed the deal, finding the terms acceptable. Wonderful. Hisse turned to look at his mate, who nodded and casually waved her hand, creating a powerful cylindrical barrier around the entire courtyard. It extended all the way up past the clouds, the top nowhere in sight. Despite the casualness and hastiness with which it was created, the entire barrier exuded great power that could rival an ultimate class devil's power, as though it was declaring it would not allow any attack through. See this is what I meant when I said barrier. Not that papier mash piece of crap that you call a barrier. Riaz pouted at Issei's words, but he ignored her and prepared for the spar. Kaniko helped Yudo up, bringing him to the sidelines to observe the spar. The two combatants stood across from each other. Zenovia held Excalibur destruction in a sword stance. Descend, divine lightning of Suzanu. Issei held his hand up to the sky. Storm clouds quickly gathered overhead and an immense pressure filled the area within the boundaries of the barrier. A bolt of white lightning struck down and wrapped around his body, forming the rage in no Yoroi level 1. A suit of armor made of lightning interesting, I don't think I've ever fought someone like that. Shall we begin ladies first? Issei allowed his opponent to make the first move. If you insist, Zenovia rushed at him with her sword held in front of her to block any long-ranged attacks. A sound strategy, except that Issei's attacks were lightning-based, and metal, even the blessed metal that the Excalibur fragments were made of, conducted electricity. Issei created a katana of lightning and swung it. Ikazuchi, a bolt of lightning shot out of the katana and raced towards Zenovia, or more specifically, towards the sword she was holding. Issei smirked that both had enough power to paralyze even humans. Even if she was conditioned to resist electrical shocks, she would be stalled long enough for him to close in and seize victory. Then, she did something unexpected. She lightly flung Excalibur destruction at the bolt of lightning as it approached. The lightning bolt struck the holy sword and dissipated quickly, allowing Zenovia to safely take hold of the handle again as she rushed past it and raised it above her head as she approached him. Issei was so surprised by the unexpected maneuver that he almost didn't react in time when Excalibur destruction was swung down at him. He snapped out of his stupor and raised his left hand to catch the blade. At the moment of impact, the earth beneath them trembled and exploded into a crater. Issei's hand stood firm as he held back Excalibur destruction that had been swung with force that couldn't possibly have been produced by the body of a human woman. Not bad. Your reflexes are pretty good. Not the fastest I've ever seen, but certainly faster than any ordinary human. And this arm strength of yours rather unbecoming of a lady, don't you think Issei asked as he slammed the blade down into the ground and elbowed Zenovia in the gut. Zenovia faltered as she was pushed back, reeling from the force of the punch and getting the wind knocked out of her lungs. Heh, I'm fine with being unladylike, if I can have this power. Zenovia recovered and rushed him again, this time thrusting the tip of her sword at him. Issei knocked it aside with a lightning-coated arm, but had to raise the other to catch an incoming punch. Zenovia swung the hilt of Excalibur destruction at his torso. Thanks to the lightning coating, he didn't receive much damage, but the force of the impact amplified by the Holy Sword's destructive power launched him across the courtyard and caused him to slam into the barrier. As he slumped down to the ground, a red haze settled over his vision, and his mouth stretched into a manic grin. H.M., all right then, maybe I should get a bit more serious. Issei stood up and dismissed his lightning gauntlets. Burn, divine flames of the sun goddess. Black flames burst into life, starting at his palms, before spreading and coating his forearms, shaping themselves into blazing black claws, the same technique he had used on the fallen angels and stray priests. I advise you to focus completely on evasion. This may be a spar, but these flames will consume anything they touch. If these flames touch any part of your body, I can assure you the pain will be unlike anything you have ever felt. Issei said as he got into a martial arts stance. Zenovia raised her sword in front of her to defend herself, just in time to stop a black flame-coated fist aimed for her torso. As it were, she was knocked off her feet by the force of the impact on the blade. Zenovia flipped in midair and landed on her feet. She quickly raised her sword and blocked a barrage of quick flaming punches, leaving her with no opportunity to attack. Issei smirked as he continued to pummel the flat side of Excalibur Destruction's blade with his fists. No matter how well forged this sword was, it was still made by human alchemy and was only a fragment of a holy sword. He could easily shatter the frame if he wanted to. Grek. Zenovia froze when she heard the sound of her blade beginning to crack and in that moment of hesitation, Issei kneed her in the gut. Zenovia dropped to her knees, wheezing, and took a look at her blade. A medium's eyes crack had appeared in the center of the blade. She shivered at the thought of what an attack of that level would have done to her if she hadn't blocked it in time. Issei's grin grew wider and more disturbing. What's wrong surely that's not all you can do Yudo couldn't possibly have been defeated by that level of skill. Zenovia was beginning to panic. If she dragged this fight out any longer, there was a good chance Excalibur destruction would be destroyed. That would be really bad, because that meant she would have to bring out her secret weapon to fight if she encountered any enemy, not just Cockabeel. She'd rather not. Secret weapons were secret for a reason. She couldn't risk exposing its existence to the enemy until the right time. 
She had to end this spar with her next attack. Zenovia raised Excalibur destruction over her head. A golden aura appeared around the blade and steadily grew bigger and wilder. Issei's grin now threatened to spill his face, ending this with an ultimate attack very well. Issei held his left hand in front of him. The black flames on his hands flowed towards his open palm and gathered into a ring of three black fireballs shaped vaguely like a figure nine, spinning slowly and ominously as they grew bigger. Zenovia shivered at the sight of them. Just looking at them invoked a deep sense of wrongness in her, as though its very existence challenged her faith. And it would certainly kill her if she couldn't stop it. Excalibur Destruction Zenovia shouted as she swung Excalibur Destruction down. A giant wave of destructive holy energy raced towards Issei, who didn't even so much as flinch. Rengoku Magatama Issei cried as he threw the ring of black flaming Magatamas at the incoming wave of holy energy. The area within the boundaries of Offiza's barrier shook as the two attacks collided with each other, rending the ground beneath the point of impact. Her Xenovia groaned when her attack slowly began to lose ground, pushed back by the Ring of Magatamas. The wave dissipated the next instant, and the Ring of Magatamas rapidly continued their way towards Zenovia, who had no other option but to raise Excalibur destruction to block it. Then, just as the Ring of Magatamas was about to reach her, a great force intercepted it and destroyed the ring, sending sparks of black flames into the air. As everyone else looked around for the source of that power, Issei turned to the only one present that he knew was capable of stopping his attack like that. What are you doing? Issei asked off eyes, who had her hand raised in Zenovia's general direction. You're going too far. This is a spar, off eyes said, sounding just ever so slightly cross that only Issei, who had known her for a long time, could perceive her tone. Hearing that, Issei calmed down, and the red haze over his vision faded away, returning his lucidity, finally allowing him to realize he had gotten too into the fight. Issei turned to Zenovia with an apologetic look on his face. Sorry about that. When I fight a strong or interesting opponent, I tend to get thirsty. It's fine. If it's only a small crack like this, it's not like I can't use Excalibur destruction anymore. I'll just have to be careful not to widen the crack. Zenovia shook her head as she wrapped her sword back in its cloth now that the spar was over. More importantly, who is that girl that attacked just could easily rival the power of an ultimate class devil. But she crushed it like it was nothing Zenovia thought to herself as she watched off eyes wave her hand, causing the barrier to disappear. Shock wouldn't even begin to describe how she would feel if she knew that this girl was actually the strongest being in existence. Anyway, that'll be it for today. Club activities will be over by now, so we're heading home now. You should finish up whatever other business you have with Ria's Gremory and her group. Dinner's at 6.30, so don't be late, or this one will eat your portions too. Issei said as he patted off Isa's head. The duo left, leaving the rest to clean up the mess. Ria's Gremory, just who are those two a demigod of the Shinto faction that happens to live in the same town as the little sisters of two Maus and a humanoid dragon who lives with him, and both possess powers that can rival the top fighters in each faction does the Shinto faction really have no intention of declaring on the three factions Zenovia asked. I'm not sure. However, Issei has taken extra care in the past year to not attack any of the members of the three factions, outside of killing stray devils, retaliation and repaying his debts, so I'm fairly certain the Shinto faction wishes to avoid war. Riaz replied, True did make it clear to us that he did not wish interfere in this incident because it would jeopardize relations between the Shinto faction and the Grigori. That aside, shouldn't you hurry? HM, dinner is in 15 minutes and the dragon girl will polish off all of the food if we don't get there in time. Ria said, taking care not to reveal Offiza's identity. Zenovia froze for a moment and then turned to her partner. Irina, let's go. I'm getting hungry. Zenovia and Irina ran at full speed after the duo. After getting a taste of the food Issei had cooked last night, there was no way they were going to miss out on even a morsel. Issei felt a shiver run up his spine and resisted the urge to groan. He felt a strong premonition that something was wrong. He hated getting these feelings, because they usually turned out to be right. It had been a few days since his spar with Zenovia, and they had been rather quiet. Udo didn't seem to be picking fight with either Excalibur wielders, not that Issei had seen much of him since he had decided to skip school. Zenovia and Arena didn't seem to be having much luck finding Kakabiel and his followers. They had taken to dressing up in their priest robes and walking around town at night in an effort to draw out Freed Zelzen, who seemed to be hunting priests, and have him lead them to Kakabiel's base, but their efforts had been fruitless for the past few days, causing them no end of frustration. That combined with his premonition, Issei wondered if they had actually found their target, and had gotten just a bit in over their heads. He and Afis were walking home, and Issei had paused at a fork in the road. His instincts told him that whatever was going on, it was happening down the other path. Sorry Afis, can you go home first I have to make a detour. Come back quickly, I want Kabayakadon for dinner. Mm, I'll make some sashimi for you as a bonus. Issei gently rubbed her head, eliciting a content purr from her. The two parted ways, Afai's returning to the estate and Issei heading down the other path that led into the heart of town. Surely those two weren't stupid enough to force a confrontation while surrounded by ordinary humans. Issei picked up the pace, hoping to get there before the damage they did became irreparable. 
He sighed in relief as the feeling he got seemed to be coming not from the heart of town, but further away, at the abandoned warehouse where Ria's and her peerage had killed a stray devil before. Issei clapped his hands together and a cylindrical barrier appeared around the area, extending to edge of the forest surrounding the abandoned warehouse, just as powerful as the one-off eyes had used. Of course, Issei actually had to consciously put in a bit of effort to create this barrier, unlike Afais who could easily do it while asleep if she wanted to. It couldn't be helped, that was just how great the difference in their power was. Boom. As Issei finished creating the isolation barrier, the side of the warehouse exploded, sending shrapnel flying towards him. Issei cast a simple wind spell to blow them away. Yahoo, if it isn't the shitty devil that rejected me the first time we met you know, I was really sad when you picked that dumb over me to play with. You know a silver-haired teenage priest with crazy eyes jumped from the hole in the side of the warehouse, landing a short distance away from him. Freed Zelzen held a glowing long sword in his right hand and his clothes were scuffed up. Obviously, he was fighting someone inside. Sorry, but I'm not a devil. And at that time, I was in a rush and you were in the way. In that case, why not play with me right now I have to pay you back for the scar you gave me that day Freed rushed at him with unnatural speed, though Issa easily sidestepped him and lightly kicked him aside as he passed. Not interested, I'm just here to watch the fun and make sure it doesn't get too rowdy. Why don't you keep playing with the ones inside? Hey, don't one of the ones inside are so boring they're not strong at all Freed whined as he stood up and brushed dust off of his tattered clothes. Freed Zelzen. A blur shot out of the hole and slammed into Freed, pushing him a good distance away, kicking up dust as Freed's feet were dragged along the ground. Freed had barely raised his sword in time to block the attack. The blur stopped abruptly as Freed's feet grinded to a halt, revealing it to be Yuyuto, wielding a demonic sword in his hands. Yuyuto senpai, please don't rush off on your own. A legendary holy sword is not something any of us can defeat on our own. Kaneko said as she stepped through the hole, followed by someone Issei didn't expect. Saji Jenshiru Issei said in surprise when he caught sight of the mop of spiky blonde hair as Sona Citri's newest pawn, the latest addition to her peerage and the new secretary of the student council followed Kaneko out of the hole. Both of them froze when they caught sight of him. Hayato Senpai. Hayato why are you here? That's my line. I can understand Yuido because of his grudge, and Kaneko because of her wanting to help her friend, but why the hell are you involved you are aware that your master will beat your ass upside down if she found out what you're doing, right? Ah, don't remind me and anyway, it's not like I got involved of my own volition I happened to be in the same diner where Taujousen was negotiating with the two Excalibur wielders, so she dragged me into this to stop me from telling Kaichu or Raya Senpai Saji complained as he went into fetal position. A look of fear on his face as he imagined what his strict master would do to him if she ever found out he was going against her orders to not interfere with the Excalibur affair. Issei turned a deadpan gaze to Kaneko, who simply shrugged in response. Hi Ado senpai will you be helping us? No, I can't afford to damage relations between the Shinto faction and the Grigori any further. I'll contain the fight and minimize the damage to the town, but that's it unless I have proof that Kakabil is acting on his own, not on the Grigori's orders. Issei said as he shook his head. Neither Kaneko nor Saji looked happy about it, but they said nothing. Both of them could understand that his faction took precedence over this. If they had been in the same position, they probably would do the same. It was already a godsend that he would contain the fight for them, since neither were very food at damage control. And also, H.M. Karniko looked up when Issei went on. This isn't my fight. It's Yudos. There's no point if someone else does the work for him. His hatred for Excalibur isn't so small that it would disappear just from that. Karniko's eyes widened for a second before she nodded, standing aside to give Yudo and Freed room for their fight. You aren't going to join in. This is Yuto Senpai's fight, Kaneko said, repeating Issei's words. Issei nodded and watched as the two continued their fight. Saji looked between the fight between the two swordsmen and the onlookers, and sighed, shuffling his feet to get away from the epicenter of the fight and mumbling about why he was even involved if he wasn't going to do anything except watch. Clang clang. The sound of grinding metal grew louder as the fight grew more intense. Yudo appeared to have calmed down a bit since his one-sided spar with Zenovia, and his movements were better than before, though still inferior to how he was in his peak condition. But try as he might, he couldn't find an opening in Freed's stance. Not so much that Freed's stance was perfect. If anything, he was so full of openings that if Yudo could put a needle in each one, Freed would look like a human pincushion. The problem was that he had exceptional reaction speed. Every time Yudo made to take advantage of one of his openings, his Excalibur fragment would already be waiting to block his attack. And then Yudo would be hard-pressed to avoid the follow-up attack, since his reaction speed couldn't quite keep up with Freed's. In that case, Yudo leapt back from his opponent and placed his hand on the ground. Sword birth Yudo yelled the name of his sacred gear. The ground glowed for a second before hundreds of demonic swords sprouted from the earth, making their way towards Freed from two different directions for a two-pronged attack. Issei whistled in appreciation as he looked at Yudo's attack. The production speed certainly has increased by a lot since I first met him. Not bad, Yudo. Looks like you really did clear your head a bit. But would it be enough that was the question Issei had left unspoken. He didn't think for a second that an Excalibur wielder would be defeated by an attack of this level. 
He was proven right when Free grinned madly, his Excalibur fragment glowing brighter. Smash, 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 smash. The sound of metal shattering rang out rapidly as Freed swing his Excalibur fragment with incredible speed that surprised even Issei, shattering every demonic sword that reached him in an instant. A few seconds later, Freed stood surrounded by hundreds of metal fragments. Yudo's attack had been completely defeated. Impossible Yudo muttered as he stared at the metal fragments on the ground, the remnants of his failed attack that he had been sure would work. Hi ha ha I have to admit, that was pretty good if I was using any other Excalibur fragment, that would have gotten me but sorry. The fragment I'm holding is Excalibur rapidly its greatest prowess is its speed it won't be outmatched by your shitty demonic swords Freed cackled as he mocked you Yudo. HM, this is pretty bad. As an opponent, this guy is probably the worst possible match for you Yudo. Ha, huh, what do you mean Saji asked. Yudo has two weapons his sacred gear, sword birth, and the speed granted to him by the night piece. His entire fighting style revolves around making the most out of both weapons. However, Freed Zelzen possesses one of the strongest holy swords, even if it's only a fragment, while Yudo's demonic swords are really little more than ordinary swords that happen to possess powers. And what's more, its greatest asset is also speed. And Freed Zelzen did not use its full speed yet. The speed he showed just now already exceeds Yudo's maximum moving speed and demonic sword production rate. In other words, Yudo's greatest weapons are completely useless against Freed Zelzen. Oh oh I, then, doesn't that mean he's gonna lose to that shitty priest? If he can't do something about Freed Zelzen's speed, then yeah, pretty much. In other words, we just have to do something about his movement, right? Saji held up his left hand. Stretch, line Saji shouted as a deformed lizard head formed on his left hand and something that looked like a disturbingly long tongue shot towards Freed, who was too engrossed in his fight to notice it until it had already wrapped around his left leg. Yog Freed yelled as he suddenly lost his balance due to the line pulling hard on his leg. Absorption line, oh that's a pretty nice sacred gear you have. Issei commented as he looked at one of the four types of sacred gears that contained a fragment of the power of one of the five dragon kings, prison dragon Vritra. As Vritra had been the strongest among the dragon kings in terms of technique, the ability of one of its sacred gears could not be underestimated. From the name of the sacred gear, Issei guessed that its ability had something to do with absorption. Damn it, this little piece of shit freed roared in rage as he attempted to sever the line with Excalibur rapidly to no avail. Not so much because he wasn't using enough strength than that the blade was passing through the line like it wasn't even there. Damn it, why the hell can't I cut this thing Freed yelled in frustration as he failed again and again to sever the line. Eventually, he gave up and tried to stand up, but lost his balance and fell over. At the same time, a dim light traveled from Freed down the line to the deformed lizard head. This is your stealing my power. Ah, oh, how do you like that this is absorption line's power it allows me to steal your power as long as that line is connected to you until you completely lose consciousness. TCH, so it's a dragon type sacred gear the starting ability itself isn't much of a threat, but as its power grows, it becomes dangerous on a completely level from other sacred gears. Damn it, that's why I hate fighting these things Freed griped as he swayed shakily as he stood up. No, there's no way that a sacred gear containing a fragment of a dragon king's power is only limited to the ability to absorb power. There should a lot more to that ability. He probably just hasn't tapped into its real power yet. Issei thought as he stared at Absorption Line. Kiba, hurry up and finish him off this guy is too dangerous to let him live we can settle the whole Excalibur thing later, so just hurry up and kill him already. I hate to admit it, but he's right. You're too dangerous to leave alive. There are still two more Excalibur fragments left. I can only hope their wielders are strong too. Yudo said as he raised his sword in preparation to finish Freed off. Hi ha ha I'm way stronger than those pieces of shit if you kill me, you'll never get another satisfying fight, you know so, still thinking about killing me Freed said, causing Yudo to falter and hesitate. Just as Issei was about to berate Yudo. Shatter. The isolation barrier Issei had put up shattered into glass-like fragments. Well Issei couldn't contain his shock as he watched the fragments of his barrier fall to the ground and break down into energy, dissipating into the air. Who on earth could possibly possess enough power to? We came here to pick you up, Freed. An unfamiliar male voice echoed through the area. Flutter. Issei's eyes focused on a single black feather descending slowly from the sky before shooting upwards to catch sight of young man with black hair and sharp eyes, wearing black ceremonial robes. But what really caught his attention were the ten black feathered wigs sprouting from his back. A cotter this must be. Boss, an old man bowed but too freed exclaimed as he looked up at the cotter and then to the side. Issei followed his gaze to see a portly old man with a thin mustache dressed in priest clothes walk out from the forest. Freed, what are you doing? Old man, I can't get away because of this stupid tongue. A dragon-type sacred gear, is it HMPH? Looks like you still can't wield that Excalibur fragment perfectly. Use the holy element I gave you properly, will you? I am trying to gather valuable research data from that. Gather the holy element in your body to the blade. That should be able to cut it. Oh yeah, Freed exclaimed as though he had just remembered how to do whatever it was the old man was telling him to do. Excalibur rapidly glowed a brilliant gold as Freed held it above his head and swung it down on the line wrapped around his leg. 
The line was severed at the point of impact and retracted back to the lizard head on Saji's hand, but no one seemed to notice for they were too busy staring at the old man. Freed called him Balba. This is man must be. Balba Galileiudo growled with a voice filled to the brim with hatred after staring blankly at the old man for a moment. Speaking, the old man replied with an amused tone, and Issy's eyes narrowed. So, this was the genocide archbishop, Balba Galilei, the mastermind behind the Holy Sword Project. Then, there was no question, the one above them was. Kakabil Issy whispered as his gaze returned to the fallen angel leader floating overhead. Freed, Balba, returned to base and prepare for the ritual. Kakabil instructed his underlings who nodded and prepared to leave, but were interrupted when someone crashed down on the spot in front of them. None of you are leaving, Zenovia yelled as she brandished Excalibur destruction. Issei noted that the crack he had made was still there. Hi, Issei-kun, fancy meeting you here Arena waved to him as she ran past him to stand next to Zenovia, Excalibur mimic in the form of a katana, held in a sword stance. Freed Zelzin, Balba Galilei, Kakabil in the name of the Lord, we will now pass judgment on to you. Don't say the name of the god I hate, you damn Freed sneered as he prepared to take on the two exorcists, but a small wave of power from Kakabil that caused everyone but Issei, who narrowed his eyes, to free stop him. I said return to base. I'll deal with these trash. Kakabil repeated, now sounding a bit displeased. Yeah, yeah, if the boss says so. Well then, alliance of the church, devils and whatever the hell you are freed said while pointing Excalibur rapidly at Issei before taking something out of his pocket. See you later. Freed threw whatever was in his hand on the ground, causing Issei to cover his eyes with his arm, just in time to avoid being blinded by a bright flash of light. Issei lowered his arm when the flash faded to find that both Freed and Balba had disappeared. Everyone's attention turned to Kakabil, who was folding his arms as he looked down at Zenovia and Arena with disdain in his eyes. So this is all Michael sends to stop me two little whelps who are still wet behind the ears he must really be underestimating me, or he doesn't care much for the Excalibur fragments. Kakabil said, his voice dripping with venom. We're more than enough for the likes of you, fallen angel Arena proclaimed and leapt at Kakabil. Wait, Arena Zenovia tried to stop her partner, but it was too late. Kakabil held a hand out towards Arena and released a massive burst of energy. Kyle. Arena screamed as she was struck by the attack and dropped Excalibur Mimic, unconscious and heavily wounded. Zenovia caught Arena's unconscious body, but was unable to get to Excalibur Mimic in time before Kakabil grabbed it and returned it back to its ribbon form. HMPH, the more Excalibur fragments, the better. I'd like to take destruction too, but then there wouldn't be any fun in that. So, I'll simply depart with this message. Ria's Gremory Sona Citri Kakabil called out. Two magic circles, one red with the symbol of the Gremory clan, the other blue with the symbol of the Citri clan, appeared on the ground, and from them, the two high-class devils and their respective queens appeared. Both looked up at Kakabil with displeased expressions. Kakabil, just what are you intending to do? Ria's asked one of her race's nemeses. I'm glad you asked. Ria's Gremory, Sona Citri and Excalibur wielder of the church, send this message to your leaders. I will start the next great war right here and right now, and by the end of it, it will be proven that the fallen angels are superior to the angels and the devils, and I will begin by rampaging around in your base of operations, Kyo Academy. If the devils and the church wish to stop me, then come to Kyo Academy tonight. I will gladly entertain you, Kakabil declared and then made to leave, but then he stopped and turned his head back. By the way, which one of you was the one who created the barrier surrounding this area, he asked. That would be me, Issei said, and Kakabil's eyes shifted to him. Two flashes of light filled everyone else's vision in the next instant. One a wave of holy energy from Kakabil and the other a bolt of lightning Issei brought down to negate the former. Kakabil grinned as he watched his attack being intercepted so easily. Unimpressed. I actually had to get serious to break that barrier. And your reaction speed is quite fast as well. But, who are you you don't smell like a devil, nor do you seem to be from the church? Kakabil asked. I'm Hayato Issei of the Shinto faction. I just happen to live in this town as well. The Shinto faction interesting you must be the one who killed the weaklings that were dispatched here a few weeks ago. Are you going to fight me as well? Sorry, but I'm not interested in the squabbles between the three factions. I only act in the interest of the Shinto faction. I see. How disappointing. You seem to be the only one here who can give me a decent challenge. Oh well, whether you like it or not, I'm sure we will fight sooner or later. Kakabil vanished in a flash of light. Sona, we need to get to the academy. Yes, Saji. Why yes, ma'am Saji squeaked out. I'll settle your punishment later. Right now, we need to stop Kakabil. Yes, ma'am, Saji repeated, only this time, his tone was less fearful and more serious. Let's go, Rias. Sona and their respective peerage members present disappeared through magic circles, presumably to gather their other peerage members and alert their higher-ups about Kakabil's intentions. Issei walked over to Zenovia, who was supporting Irina's unconscious body. I'll take care of Irina. You should alert the church and prepare for the battle. What about you? Like I said, if all Kakabil wants to do is to start a war between the three factions, that's not our problem. And even if I wanted to help, my hands are tied unless it's proven that Kakabil is acting independently. Zenovia looked downcast. However, ignoring his attempts to start a second great war between the three factions and allowing him to do it with Japan as its epicenter are two completely separate matters. 
Huh. Japan is the Shinto faction's sovereign territory. If Kakabil intends to make this country the battlefield of the Great War, the Shinto faction will not allow him to do as he pleases. You saw how talkative he was. If you play your words right, you could probably get him to shout out loud that he intends to turn Japan into a battlefield or at least show his intentions through his actions. Then, I'll be able to step in. Zenovia's eyes widened before she nodded. Now go, leave Arena to me. Zenovia stood up and ran off in the direction of the academy. Now then, Issei lifted Arena in a fireman's carry and activated a teleportation talisman in his pocket. Great, how do I explain to Afis I won't be able to cook dinner? That was the last thing Issei said before he disappeared in a flash of light. Issei watched as a blue crystalline barrier formed around the entire campus, created and maintained by Sona Citri and her peerage, absent-mindedly rubbing his sore stomach as he did. Afis hadn't taken it well when she heard that Issei wouldn't be able to cook dinner tonight and would have to make do with either fast food or instant food and had responded with a punch to his stomach before stomping off to the kitchen to cook some instant ramen for herself. Issei healed Arena's wounds to the best of his ability, which wasn't saying much because he had a healing magic, but at the very least, she wouldn't die of loss or anything. Then, he made his way here to a hill a short distance away from the academy to find that the Gremory and Citri peerages, along with Zenovia, had already gathered there. With this, as long as nothing too drastic happens inside, we should be able to prevent any damage to the outside, Sona said, but Issei could hear the doubt in her voice. Issei himself doubted the effectiveness of the barrier. At best, it was only as powerful as the isolation barrier he had created that Kakabil had destroyed. If Kakabil got serious, the barrier would crumble in an instant. No choice then. Issei pulled out a thin stack of talismans from his pocket. Stand back. Issei told Sona and her peerage, who obeyed. He threw the talismans into the air. The talismans fluttered in the wind before dispersing and sticking themselves to the barrier at regular intervals. The talismans glowed as surges of energy worked their way into the barrier, giving a red and more solid hue. I've strengthened the barrier and lessened the strain on the Citri peerage. With this, Kakabil should be able to get out for a few hours unless he uses his full power. I don't think I have to tell you this, but if Kakabil uses his full power, if not for this barrier, the whole town, not to mention the surrounding region, will be completely vaporized. And he appears to be performing some kind of ritual. My familiar was able to get close enough to see a giant magic circle carved into the field, and Kakabil releasing his power into it. M.M., looks like he really did steal the Excalibur fragments for something, not just to piss heaven off. Riaz, this plan is too reckless after all. The enemy is a faction leader. We don't stand a chance against him. We still have time, let's call Serzich Sama for reinforcements. Sona said, and Issei agreed. Riaz's plan to fight Kakabil herself had way too many holes and was sure to fail if Kakabil got serious. You didn't call your Wanasama either. Riaz rebuked as she shook her head. My Wanasama is your only Sama loves you, I'm sure he'll do something. There's no need. I've already informed Serzich Sama. Akino interrupted the argument. Akino Riaz started to scold her queen, who cut her off with a harsh glare. Riaz, I can understand that you do not wish to trouble Serzich Sama. This is an incident that occurred in your territory, right in your base, and it happened right after the mess with the Phoenix clan. However, the enemy is one of the fallen angel leaders. This is a problem that's far above our level. Let's borrow the power of Imau. Riaz looked surprised at the vehemence in her queen's tone, but relented and nodded her head reluctantly. Thank you for understanding, Bachu. Sanasama, Serzich Sama's reinforcements will arrive in about an hour. Akino said with a smile, a sharp contrast to her expression from just a second ago. An hour that's way too long. Kakabil doesn't strike me as the patient type. At the beginning, he'll probably let Freed and his other underlings fight you, but I'll give him ten minutes tops before he loses his patience and joins the fight himself. You can probably already tell, but if Kakabil attacks you with his full power, he would wipe the floor with all of you in under five minutes. Issei addressed Rias, her peerage, and Zenovia, who would be the ones fighting Kakabil and his followers inside the barrier. Then, what do you suggest we do, Rias said with a grimace, conceding his point. Zenovia, take this with you, there's a listening spell on it, so I'll be able to listen in. Remember, make him talk. Issei said to the exorcist, passing her a talisman. Zenovia nodded and tucked the talisman into her battle suit. What do you mean, Rias asked? If Kakabil intends to start the next great war in the Shinto faction's territory, we're not letting him go. I'll crush him right here. I thought you wanted to maintain as friendly a relationship with the Gregory as possible. Rias commented with an amused smile. Japan is our territory. Just because we've been lenient about members of the three factions building their bases here doesn't mean we'll allow you to start a war in our homeland. If it means destroying any semblance of a truce we've had with the three factions up until now, so be it. Of course, if I could avoid doing that, it would be nice. Riaz smiled before her expression became serious. So, all you need is confirmation that Kakabil either intends to make Japan the battlefield for a second great war or that he's acting independently for you to act, right? Basically, yeah. All right, I'll try to goad him into spilling the beans. Pray for my success, will you? I would, but considering you have been infuriating me on an almost hourly basis ever since you barged into my home, I'll just settle with wishing you good luck. You wound me. You really do. Riaz said with an amused voice as she placed her hand over her heart and started acting dramatic. 
Whatever, just going already. You don't want to wear down Cockabeel's patience any more than you already have. Rias nodded and turned to her peerage. Now, my cute servants, we'll be going on the offensive we will enter the barrier and draw Cockabeel's attention this is completely different from any battle we've fought before. This is a true matter of life and death. But even so, I will not forgive you if you die we will survive and we will continue to attend this academy. Yes, the Gremory peerage shouted as one. Issei watched as they descended from the hill and made their way into the academy through a whole sona temporarily created in the barrier, his eyes lingering on Asia's and Yuudo's backs just a bit longer than the rest. Issei wasn't so sure about letting Asia get that close to an enemy faction leader, but knew he had no authority over her when it came to Devil's affairs. And as for Yuudo, Yuudo, this is probably your last chance. Settle your grudge with Excalibur right here, right now. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably need to use boosted gear to fight Cockabeel, so you should be prepared too. Him him. The conversation between Issei and Deed Rage ended, and the former began to mentally prepare himself for his first serious fight in a long time. Yudo held the crystal that contained the holy factors that had been extracted from his comrades with great care, afraid it would hit the ground and shatter should it slip out of his grip. The past few minutes had just been one revelation after another. The Gremory Peerage, plus Zenovia, entered the academy and found Cockabeel, Freed and Balba in the field. Well, Freed and Balba were in the field. Cockabeel was seated atop a floating throne in the sky. Freed and Balba were standing within the giant magic circle carved into the field. In the center of the magic circle were the now four stolen Excalibur fragments releasing incredible levels of holy power that slowly converged with each other. Balba revealed that this was a ritual to fuse the four Excalibur fragments together into a single sword. Cockabeel asked whether it would be Serzich Lucifer or Seraphal Leviathan who would come to fight him, and when Rhea said that they would be fighting in their place, Cockabeel responded by casually tossing a spear of light at the gymnasium and erasing it from existence, proclaiming his boredom and then before Rias could get him to talk about his intentions, he proceeded to take a short cat nap after summoning three Cerberuses, the guard dogs of Hades, to fight them instead. With some difficulty, since a Cerberus was still a dangerous opponent even if they were mindless beasts, the Gremory group and Zenovia managed to kill the three guard dogs. Then, Rhea shot a ball of power of destruction at Cockabeel, who lazily opened one eye and flicked it away with a finger. Then, Balba completed the ritual and fused the four Excalibur fragments into a bastardized, incomplete Excalibur that possessed the abilities of Mimic, Rapidly, Nightmare, and Transparency, using the energy produced from the fusion to activate the true spell carved into the Magic Circle, an Earth Shatter spell that would destroy the entire town and all of its residents in twenty minutes unless Cockabeel was defeated. Cockabeel commanded Freed to wield the bastardized Excalibur and fight them, and the stray priest gladly complied. Yudo declared his identity as the sole survivor of the Holy Sword project to Balba, who simply laughed and revealed that the Holy Sword had not failed. In fact, it had succeeded and Balba was able to produce artificial Excalibur wielders. Then, he revealed how, in order to wield Excalibur fragments, a certain level of holy factors was needed. So, the church had collected several children who had holy factors in them. However, none of them possessed enough holy factors to be able to wield the fragments, so Balba researched a way to extract the holy factors from their bodies and accumulate them, and he succeeded. The real reason he and his comrades were due to be killed was not because the project failed. Rather, it was because it had succeeded, and Balba was going to kill them so that he could extract the holy factors from their body. The church expelled them on grounds of heresy, but continued to use the same method to produce more artificial Excalibur wielders, though they spared them. Once they extracted the holy factors from, something that barely made them more humane than Balba. Balba then produced the crystal that Yudo was currently holding, the product of accumulating the holy factors into a single physical form. He revealed he had created four of them from the holy factors in his comrades, and three had already been used on Freed who cackled and mentioned that the other two wielders just a while ago because their bodies couldn't accept the holy factors. Balba then proceeded to carelessly toss the crystal to the ground, saying he didn't need it anymore because he could mass-produce them without having to extract holy factors from someone else. Yudo reached down to pick it up, which was why he was cradling it to his chest. Everyone Yudo whispered in a cracked, anguished voice as a tear slipped from his eyes down his cheek. Then, Yudo frowned when the orb started glowing, and odd white wisps appeared within the dim light, slowly solidifying into white figures. Figures that Yudo recognized and almost cried when he saw them. Every one eye around him stood specters of his late comrades, all staring at him with a mournful expression. I've always always wondered, why was I the only one who survived there were those who wished to live more than me, those who deserved to live more than me, so why was I the only one who was given a second chance Yudo wondered aloud, barely loud enough for the specters of his comrades to hear him. One of the specters, a young boy who looked no older than twelve, smiled sadly and started to speak. Don't worry about us. At least you were able to live. Yudo's eyes widened as he heard the unexpected no, the truth that he had already known deep down, but had refused to acknowledge. But, hearing it straight from them had really driven it home. Then, all of them opened their mouths and began to sing a familiar song. How could Yudo not know it after all? Back when the Holy Sword Project was still active, Yudo and his comrades had sung the sacred hymn daily in the hopes that God would save them. 
But it had been to no avail, and the only thing that Yudo felt for that song was pure contempt. And yet, when he heard that nostalgic song he had grown to hate, he couldn't help but smile and sing along as well as tears flowed down his face. The specters began to glow bright blue and circled Yudo. We were no good alone. We did not have enough factors to wield Excalibur. But, it's fine if we do it together. Yudo's heart was filled with warmth as he listened to his comrade's words. Normally, the sacred hymn would cause damage to devils. But Yudo felt no pain, only the growing warmth of his comrades. You must accept the holy sword. It's not scary, even if God isn't watching over us. Our hearts are always. One, the specters flew up into the sky and descended on Yudo as a beam of light. As it died down, Yudo felt an incredible power well up within his body and calmed his heart. I simply wanted to live. Yudo thought to himself as he remembered the night he had fled with the help of his comrades from the church and was found and saved by Rias. What is it that you desire? The then little girl had asked as she held his dying body in her arms. Help was the only thing he could mumble with the strength he had left in his poisoned body. His life that was slowly fading away, the future. He had lost sight of his friends who had perished to give him a second chance and who he had to avenge. Yudo held all of those regrets as he died. Well, I have a new life as a devil. That was what my master wanted for me. And it was also what I wanted. But I couldn't let go of my hatred for the church in Excalibur. No, I could have let go, but... Yudo had realized it over the past few days. He already had a new life, and close friends who would help him, like Kaniko, who had been... Beyond to convince the church duo to allow them to aid in the destruction of the stolen Excalibur fragments, and Issei who had trained him and tried to help let go of his hatred. Wasn't that enough for him? Though if his old comrades wanted revenge for their deaths, there was no way he could just go off and live his own life. He owed it to them to avenge them in their place. But, he had just been proven wrong. Don't worry about us. At least you were able to live. They didn't wish for vengeance after all they just wanted him to live. Viewed even so, it's not like everything had been settled with that. If he didn't cut down the monster in front of him, even more people would suffer the same fate his old comrades had. Balba Galilei, as long as you're still alive, more people will suffer because of your research. HMPH, research always requires sacrifices. Haven't you realized that? You truly are evil. You do you must do it. Surpass Excalibur you are a servant of Rhea's Gremory my knight will not lose to a mere Excalibur. But you, you Tokun, I believe in you. You Tosenpai, please do your best. Aknosen, Konkachin, Assassin. Hi ha ha, why are you crying? You were singing with your silly ghost and friends. Ah, that was seriously the worst. I really hate that song. You know, just hearing it makes my skin crawl. I can't take it anymore. I need to cut you into itty bitty pieces to comfort myself with this super Excaliburchin made from four fragments. Freed Zelzen, my comrades' powers are inside you. I can't allow you to misuse them any further. Yudo brandished his demonic sword, and as he did, he thought back to the night he had first fought Freed, more specifically, his justification for his need for vengeance, and almost laughed at himself. He had nothing he couldn't be more wrong. He had everything, a new life, a place to call home, new comrades to protect, and now the will of his old comrades inside of him. That's why I will become a sword to protect but you and my new comrades, and to carry on the will of my old comrades so, respond to my feelings, sword birth. Two beams, one of black light that was sword birth's power, the other of white light that was the power of his comrades, shot out of his demonic sword and began to fuse together. Then the combined beam of black and white retracted into the sword, granting it a new, elegant shape. It was complete. The sword that represented the will of his comrades. Balance Breaker, Sword of Betrayal You shall receive the sword that possesses both holy and demonic powers with your body. Yudo activated the power of the night and rushed at Freed with incredible speed. Freed tried to keep track of him, but Yudo easily tricked him with a few feints and closed the distance between them. Yudo swung his new holy demonic sword at Freed. Clanged. But even after all of that, Freed was still able to block it. As Yudo expected, he was a skilled swordsman after all. But, V-H-O-O-M. This holy demonic sword released an ominous sound as its aura began to devour that of the bastardized Excaliburs. Impossible that sword of yours surpasses one of the legendary holy swords. If that was the real Excalibur, I wouldn't be able to defeat it. But, that fake Excalibur cannot through our will. Damn you Freed screeched and backed away. Stretch. The blade of the bastardized Excalibur began to twist and lengthen, splitting into multiple blades, and shooting at Yudo at random speeds and directions. Mimic and rapidly so it can use all of the abilities of the four fragments it was made from Yudo thought furiously as the blades almost reached him. Clang 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 clang. But, even with that speed, Yudo easily parried each attack. Freed's murderous intent was so obvious that even if he couldn't keep track of the blade, he could predict where they would strike simply by getting a feel of his murderous intent. Damn it! Why aren't any of my attacks hitting? Aren't you supposed to be the legendary unrivaled Holy Sword Summon? There are hundreds of legends about your power. Aren't there? Freed screamed, with an expression that was an odd mix of elation and frustration. Then, I'll also add this. The twisted blades of the bastardized Excalibur suddenly disappeared. Excalibur transparency, but as long as he doesn't hide his murderous intent, even if I can't see the blades, I can still block them. Clang, 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 clang. Sparks appeared in the air as Yudo's holy demonic sword clashed with the invisible blades of the bastardized Excalibur. 
Crack. Freed's expression changed to one of pure shock as he retracted the blade and removed its invisibility, revealing a long crack along the blade. Good, just keep him there. Zenovia rushed at Freed from behind with Excalibur destruction in her left hand and her right hand held up next to her as though to grab hold of something. Saint Peter, Saint Basil the Great, Saint Denis, Holy Mother Mary, hear my voice. Zenovia started chanting, and Yuido wondered what she was doing. He got his answer when the space next to her hand distorted. She reached into the distortion and pulled a massive broadsword out, shattering the chains binding it in the process. In the name of the saints who reside within this blade, I shall release it Holy Sword Durandal. Yudo started. Durandal the legendary holy sword on par with even the original Excalibur it was supposedly the most powerful holy sword in terms of raw destructive power. But why did Zenovia have it? Durandal, you weren't just an Excalibur wielder. Both Balba and Kakabil reacted in shock when they saw the legendary holy sword. You've got it backwards. I was originally Durandal's wielder. I was simply chosen to be an Excalibur wielder later on. Zenovia said as she held Durandal and Excalibur destruction in a two-sword stance. Impossible even my research hasn't reached a point where it can produce an artificial Durandal wielder. Of course, even the Vatican's research hasn't advanced far enough to make an artificial Durandal wielder. Then, why can you? I'm not the same as Arena or any of the other Excalibur wielders. I'm a natural-born holy sword wielder. Balb became completely speechless when he heard her. It was something completely unprecedented. Natural holy sword wielders were so rare in this age that the church was willing to allow something as vile as the holy sword project just to have a chance of producing artificial ones. Balba never thought he would actually meet a natural born in his lifetime. Durandal is a sword that ravages everything beyond human imagination. It cuts anything it so much as touches. Most of the time, it refuses to obey me, which is why I have to keep it sealed inside a pocket dimension so that it doesn't endanger me. Now then, Freed Zelzen, thanks to you, we can have a legendary battle between Excalibur and Durandal. I'm so excited I can barely stop myself from shaking try not to die in a single blow at the very least, use that Excalibur to its full potential. Durandal glowed a bright gold as its aura increased to the point where it exceeded even Yuido's new balance breaker. Is that even allowed you damn, I don't need a shitty plot twist like that Freed screamed and switched targets to Zenovia. Yuido couldn't see it, but he guessed that Freed launched the multiple blades at Zenovia instead. Shatter. But, Zenovia simply countered with a simple side slash. In that instant, the sound of metal shattering was heard and metal fragments appeared on the ground. Not only that, the shockwave of the attack leveled the ground between Zenovia and Freed. Freed retracted his blade and made it visible only to find that the top half of the blade was completely destroyed. So, in the end, it's just a heretic sword after all. It can't compare to my Durandal. Zenovia sighed with an expression of boredom on her face. Everyone was shocked. Excalibur Destruction's power had been nothing compared to that. But, Yudo knew that as dangerous as Durandal was, its power still didn't hold a candle to the power of Issei's Futsuno Matama, only a small part of which he had experienced firsthand. Seriously seriously my Super Excalibur chin is broken this is really horrible was it wrong to use something that was broken from the start the shallowness of humans? The church's foolishness and hypocrisy, is it because I grew up with those that I ended up like this? Freed seemed to lose his will to fight, and Yudo took the opportunity to charge at him. Freed turned to Yudo and used Mimic's ability to throw more blades at Yudo, but... Shatter. Yudo tore through the remnants of the bastardized Excalibur, all the way down to the hilt, completely obliterating it and lacerating Freed along his stomach. Did you see our power has finally surpassed Excalibur? Yudo whispered to his holy demonic sword as Freed fell to the ground. It was done. He had finally settled his grudge. Yudo looked skywards, a mix of satisfaction and loss in his heart. Holy demonic sword that's impossible. Two opposing elements cannot be fused together. Yudo turned to the source of the voice to find Balba with a confused and fearful expression on his face. Ah, that's right, this isn't over just yet. As long as Balba Galilei existed, there would only be more victims in the future. Balba Galilei, prepare yourself. Yudo pointed his holy demonic sword at the old man and prepared to rush him, but then a look of understanding spread over Balba's face, causing Yudo to pause. I see holy and demonic, it makes sense that they are able to fuse if the being keeping them in balance no longer exists in other words, it wasn't just the old Maus, God is also. Stab. Balba was cut off when a giant spear of light was rammed through his abdomen. Balba coughed up before falling over, the spear dissipating, leaving a hole in his abdomen. Yudo went up to him to check his pulse, though it was fairly obvious he was already dead. Balba, you truly were remarkable. The fact that you managed to reach that conclusion proves your genius. But, it doesn't really matter to me whether or not you help me. I should have just done this myself from the beginning. Kakabil sneered down at them from his airborne throne. He stood up from his throne and jumped down to the ground. Aha ka ha 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 Kakabil laughed insanely, releasing a terrible aura that sent everyone to their knees in an instant. All of you, come at me at the same time with your full power. Kakabil ordered them confidently, causing Riaz's face to redden in anger. Are you giving us a chance stop messing around? The ones messing around are you trash do you honestly believe you can actually defeat me on your own? Kakabil stared down at them with his cold eyes, causing them to stiffen with fear. 
Yudo's palms were getting sweaty, causing him to almost lose his grip on his holy demonic sword until he had squeezed his hands around the handle, trying to stay calm. This was completely unlike anything he had ever felt, no enemy had ever managed to instill this much fear into him before. Riaz was right. This was a real fight to the death, if he didn't prepare himself, he would be killed. Take all the time you need. But I advise you to hurry up. There's only 15 minutes left until the Earth Shatter spell activates. Takabil taunted them and crossed his arms, apparently intending to wait until they were ready to attack. Wait until my signal to attack. We'll be killed if we charged in recklessly. Riaz said with a shaky voice as she held up her hand and began to focus her power into her palm. A ball of power of destruction formed in her hand, slowly getting bigger. Honestly, she wanted to get him to talk so that Issei could interfere, but at this point, if she tried something, she would probably only succeed in incurring his ire. There wasn't much of a choice but to do as he said. The rest followed suit. Akino charged up a bolt of lightning in her hand. Taniko got into a fighting stance and waited for her master's signal to attack. Yudo and Zenovia gathered their power, Zenovia into Durandal for a powerful attack, and Yudo into his balance breaker in preparation of summoning more holy demonic swords. Asia, being the non-fighter of the group, hung back, but prepared to heal her allies just in case. After a few tense minutes of waiting where they feared Kakabil would lose his patience and attack, Riaz took a deep breath. Now Riaz called out and threw the ball of power of destruction, now the size of her head, at Kakabil. Akino launched the bolt of lightning right after her. Kaniko rushed at Kakabil from the side. Yudo summoned a ring of holy demonic swords around Kakabil. Zenovia swung the charged Durandal, releasing a massive wave of destructive holy power, bigger than even the one she had used on Issei. Checkmate. That was what Yudo had thought, but... HMPH, is that all Kakabil snorted and held up his hand. The three energy attacks slammed into his palm one after another, fusing and amplifying each other's power, but even then, Kakabil didn't look like he was putting much effort into stopping them. Kaniko closed in and reeled her fist back for a punch just as Yudo's ring of holy demonic sword shot at Kakabil. Smash 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 slash 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 slash. The ring of holy demonic swords were shattered by Kakabil's wings that had suddenly become as sharp as blades and at the same time, the wings also sliced deeply into Kaniko, knocking her aside and leaving her heavily wounded and unconscious. Konkach and Yudo shouted out of concern for his fallen comrade, even as Asia moved to her side to begin healing her. Hey, looking away from an enemy in a fight can be fatal, you know. Yudo barely held up the holy demonic sword in his hand in time to block an attack from a sword of light from Kakabil. Crack. Why Yudo cried out in shock when a crack appeared on his holy demonic sword. The strength of his sacred gear produced swords depended on his concentration. This held true for both the basic state and the balance breaker. Because Yudo was distracted by Kaniko's defeat, he lost his concentration and the strength of the holy demonic sword in his hand suffered because of it. Lightning Akino sent down a bolt on Kakabil's unguarded back, but it was deflected with a single wave of one of his wings. Trying to get in the way, daughter of Barakil Kakabil demanded. Don't group with that man Akino's face contorted into an expression of anger and self-loathing as she poured even more power into a second lightning bolt. But even that was effortlessly batted aside with a simple wave of a wing. You aha to think you degraded yourself into becoming a devil you sure have interesting servants. Ria's Gremory the sole survivor of the Holy Sword Project who obtained Balance Breaker, and Barakil's daughter your tastes are just as weird as your brother's. I won't forgive you for insulting my brother, Armau and more importantly, insulting my servants deserves nothing short of death Ria shouted angrily at Kakabil, who simply sneered. In that case, try to destroy me Mao Lucifer's little sister crimson-haired ruined princess one of your race's greatest enemies is standing in front of you if you don't seize this opportunity. Your reputation will plummet Kakabil proclaimed and threw blasts of holy energy at the four remaining combatants. Yudo and Zenovia dodged in time, but Riaz and Akino, having used most of their reserves in their initial attacks, weren't able to react in time and were sent to the ground. Yudo calmed himself and prepared to charge at Kakabil, but paused and turned when he heard someone coming up behind him. We'll attack at the same time. Zenovia said as she stabbed Excalibur Destruction into the ground and placed both hands on Durandal's hilt in preparation for the attack. Both of them charged at Kakabil at the same time and slashed at him with their swords, but both attacks were easily blocked by Kakabil's swords of light. Kakabil ignored Yudo and turned to look at Zenovia, who struggled to break through Kakabil's sword of light, but failed. Neither she nor Yudo could understand it. She had easily shattered the bastardized Excalibur, why couldn't she break a simple sword of light, even if it was created by a fallen angel leader? It's no use. Even if it's the legendary Durandal, if the wielder isn't skilled enough, it's no different from an ordinary sword you lack training. Girl the previous wielder of Durandal possessed unrivaled power. Kakabil pushed both of them back and lifted them into the air with a spell. He converted his swords of light into energy and blasted both of them back with holy power. Zenovia crashed into the side of the main building, while Yudo stood up, ignoring the pain the blast of holy energy was causing him and charged at Kakabil again. Kakabil, I'm not done yet. Yudo refocused his attention on the fight and the crack on his holy demonic sword vanished. 
Ha! Ayuido swung his holy demonic sword with all of his might at Kakabil, but he easily caught the blade between his fingers. TCH Uido clicked his tongue and used one hand to create another holy demonic sword for a vertical slash, but that was stopped by another two fingers of Kakabil's other hand. Not yet Uido created a third holy demonic sword in his mouth and awkwardly turned his head sharply. Kakabil, caught off guard by the unexpected action, sustained a small cut on his cheek before blasting Uido away. Uido fell to his knees, exhausted and despair seeping into his heart, like everybody else present. Despite their advantage in numbers, Kakabil held an even more overwhelming advantage in power, easily countering and overpowering them without visible effort every time they attacked. Was there even any hope? Not bad, I didn't think any of you trash could even scratch me. Looks like even though you've lost the masters you serve, the devils and the exorcists are still able to fight well. Kakabil said with a cruel smile, causing everyone to freeze upon hearing his words. What are you talking about? Riaz asked with a sense of dread. Ha ha if you ha ha ha, Kakabil suddenly started laughing manically, which did not help Riaz's growing dread that she was about to regret asking that question. Ah, that's right, I completely forgot that the truth was never told to you peons fine. In that case, I'll tell you the truth back during the great war between the three factions. It wasn't just the original Yandai Mao, God also perished Kakabil revealed with a wide grin that split his face. What did you just say you would have asked in a soft voice that anyone could barely hear? His expression had stiffened in a mix of shock and incomprehension, which was pretty much the same expression everyone else had. Well, I suppose it's only natural that the truth wasn't revealed to you lowly pawns. After all, who in their right mind would say that God is dead humans are too fragile? Without God to worship, they can't keep themselves level-headed and civilized. Even the fallen angel leaders and Maoists couldn't tell this to their subordinates, since they won't know who would leak out the information. Among the three factions, only the leaders and the higher-ups know the truth of God's demise. God has perished that can't bafe that's really true, then what the hell have we been believing in and praying to while we were trapped in that institute Yudo mentally screamed, unable to believe what Kakabil had just said. After the war, the only ones left were the angels who had lost their god, the devils that lost their malice and the majority of the high-class devils, and the fallen angels who lost most of their kind apart from the leaders. It wasn't a state that could merely be called exhausted. All three factions fell so low that they had to rely on humans to increase their numbers, especially angels and fallen angels who could only increase their numbers by mating with humans. Well, fallen angels can increase if angels fell, but pureate angels can't increase their numbers after losing God. Even pureate devils are rare these days, right? It's a lie it has to be a lie Zenovia whispered from her spot on the ground, close to where Yudo was. She had an expression of terror and despair that none of the Gremory group could bear to look at. It couldn't be helped, if her object of her faith, her sole reason for living no longer existed, it was natural that she would end up in that despondent state. Even Yudo, who had turned his back on God and his followers after the Holy Sword Project, cringed when he thought of what his life before he became a devil meant. In truth, a second great war will never happen unless someone purposely fans the flames of animosity it's because all of three factions suffered massive losses in the previous war everyone decided that continuing the war was pointless now that ones who had instigated the war in the first place, God and the original Yandai Mao, were dead even that damn bastard Azizel declared that there won't be a second war after losing most of our men do you have any idea how hard that was to bear lowering your gun after you've already shot it don't around with me if the war had gone on. The fallen angels would have won and despite that, that damn bastard what point is there to our existence? if the only thing we do is invite sacred gear holding humans to increase our ranks Kakabil spat out with incredible venom, expressing his dissatisfaction with how things were now. The Lord no longer exists, the Lord is dead then, the love he granted us is Asia said with a despondent look on her face, causing Kakabil to burst out laughing. Yeah, that's right. There is no more love or divine protection from God after all, he's long dead well, Michael is certainly doing well. He took God's place and is watching over the angels and the members of the church. Well, even if God is gone, as long as heaven's system is still operating, prayers, blessings and exorcisms will still work to some extent. But if you compare it to the time when God was still around, the effects are obviously much weaker. The holy demonic sword brat was able to obtain a balance breaker like that because God isn't around to maintain the balance between holy and darkness anymore. Normally, there's no way that two opposing elements would ever be able to fuse, but if you take away the ones keeping them in balance, many strange things will occur as a result. Thud. Asia's unconscious body made a dull sound as it struck the ground after the revelation of God's death became too much for Asia and caused her to faint. Asia, get a hold of yourself, Rhea shouted to her bishop in vain. Right here and now, I will start the second great war by taking all of your heads and sending them to Surzech, and Michael, even if it's only me, I will prove that the fallen angels are the strongest. Yudo finally realized the futility of this fight. Their opponent was someone who possessed enough power that he would confidently declare war on the angels and devils by himself. There was no way they had any chance of defeating from the beginning. So, you're saying that you are doing this by yourself without the Grigori's support, and you intend to turn this country into the battlefield of the Second Great War Rhea suddenly asked, seemingly for clarification. 
Yeah, that's why Azizel is too much of a coward to do anything, and everyone else follows him blindly that's why I'll do this myself, and I'll start with this town where the little sisters of two Maus reside. I see. Did you hear all of that Rias called out, confusing Cockabeel? Yeah, I heard it loud and clear. A male voice reverberated throughout the campus and Cockabeel raised an arm to cover his eyes when a gigantic bolt of white lightning crashed down in front of him. Good work getting him to talk. I made sure to record all of that. Well, I wasn't expecting to hear that the biblical god was dead, but with this, the Grigori can no longer complain about the Shinto faction interfering in their affairs. Take a rest and leave this to me, Issei said as he cracked his neck and silently apologized to the deceased biblical god for thinking badly of him. Oh, so it's the Shinto boy this time interesting but, there's only ten minutes left before the Earth Shatter spell activates do you really think you can defeat before then? Who knows why don't we test that right now? Aha, well said it'd be too boring if I killed you instantly, so I'll allow you to make the first move finish whatever preparations you need before you attack Cockabeel declare, so confident in his victory that he was willing to grant Issei the same handicap he had granted the others. Well, I suppose I should thank you for that. Well, just don't come crying to me when I turn out to be stronger than you think. Issei raised his hand. Descend, divine storm of the storm god. Dark clouds appeared overhead at Issei's command as usual, but instead of sending down a single bolt of lightning like the Grimory group was used to seeing, multiple bolts of white lightning struck, creating a white flash that blinded everyone else. The light died down, revealing Issei clad in lightning armor, but it wasn't the same as before. Instead of the usual lightning wrapped around parts of his body as a crude armor, this time, it was an intricate Asian full-body armor crafted from white lightning, releasing sparks of lighting every now and then. Rage in no Yori, level 2 Buyu no Shogun. It's been a while since I used this, Issei said as he held up a lightning armor-clad hand and created a spear of white lightning. Yeah, ha, what incredible mastery over lightning it might exceed even Barakiel's power interesting this is too interesting let's have a good fight to the death. Shinto boy Kakabil cackled and leapt at Issei, who simply swept his spear, creating a wave of lightning that intercepted Kakabil and exploded. Kakabil shot upwards into the air, his clothes covered and burnt, blackened patches, but still maintaining a manic grin and created dozens of spears of light. While they weren't as powerful as the ones he usually used, they made for quality and quantity. With a wave of his hand, Kakabil rained down the dozens of light spears on Issei, who spun his spear like a windmill, using the rotation to shatter the spears. As the last spear shattered into tiny glass-like fragments, Issei caught sight of a gigantic double-ended spear of light forming above Kakabil. He couldn't take that one head-on. In that case, Issei held up his spear and pumped energy into it. His spear crackled with sparks of white lightning as it glowed brighter and the blade grew sharper. Kakabil tossed the gigantic spear of light at Issei who responded by tossing his own charged spear of lightning. The tips of both spears met and in the next instant destroyed each other, creating an explosion. Though not as big as the ones that would have been formed if either attack were allowed to fully detonate, that generated a huge column of smoke that reached all the way to the top of the barrier. Without wasting time, Issei leapt through the smoke column towards where he had last seen Kakabil floating. Caught off guard when Issei suddenly burst through the smoke column, Kakabil wasn't able to react in time when Issei cut him with his lightning-coated hands, creating an X-shaped gash on his chest. TCH Kakabil clicked his tongue as poured from the gash and punched at the still airborne Issei, who barely brought up his lightning-armored arms in time to block the brunt of the attack. Even then, the force of the attack sent him crashing into the ground, creating a sizable crater upon impact. Issei picked himself up and rubbed his slightly sore forearms. Even with the lightning armor active, Kakabil's punch still stung. Then again, since Kakabil's fist had come into contact with the armor, he should have been injured as well, no matter how light it was. He was proven right when Kakabil landed on the ground, rubbing his burnt fist. HM, using a direct physical attack on someone using lightning armor was a bit stupid of me. But, whatever. It's been a long time since I had a fun fight. I think I'm entitled to being reckless every now and then. Shall we continue then? Come at me anytime you wish but, just remember, you're on a time limit. Keep in mind what will happen if you go over it. Issei grimaced as he was reminded of the Earth Shatter spell. Shit, it's been a while since I had a real fight too, so I was planning on taking my time and enjoying it, but too bad, I guess. Come, boosted gear. Issei said as he shed the armor on his left forearm. A deep, male voice echoed throughout the campus as a metallic red spiked and clawed gauntlet with two green jewels, one at the back of the hand, and the other at the elbow, appeared and replaced the lighting gauntlet on his left forearm. Cockabeel, as well as everyone else, recoiled in shock when they saw the red gauntlet that was one of the legendary Longinus gears. A Longinus and boosted gear of all things Cockabeel muttered as he stared at the sacred gear that contained the soul of Deed Rage, one of the two heavenly dragons whose power rivaled or even exceeded gods. What's wrong lost your nerve already as they taunted his opponent. Aha, just the opposite I've never been more excited boy, you said your name is Hayato Issei, correct? That's right, I am Hayato Issei, grandson of Suzanu and Amaterasu, a Shinto demigod. 
Issei answered as the second boost activated. Ahahaha, demigod even better very well. Hayato Issei, I acknowledge you as a worthy opponent. Let's have a good fight that both of us can enjoy. Kakabil grinned maniacally as a powerful golden aura burst forth from his body, crushing everyone except Issei down to their knees, unable to move. Issei lowered his head and scratched the back of his head. Ah oh, jeez, if you say that kind of thing to me. Issei suddenly raised his head back up, revealing an equally manic grin as a familiar red haze settled over his vision, and a red and black aura emerged from his body, increasing the pressure that the Gremory group and Zenovia already felt, causing to drop to all fours in an effort to stay up. I won't be able to stop myself from getting carried away. Issei launched himself at Kakabil with incredible speed far exceeding even Yuyuto's maximum. Kakabil grinned in response and held a hand up. A massive wave of holy energy shot from it and raced towards Issei who simply laughed and swung his right hand, releasing a series of claw-like crescent energy waves that slashed through his opponent's attack. As Issei reached Kakabil, he reeled his hand, balled into a lightning-armored fist, back and punched at Kakabil's head. Kakabil snorted and moved his head to the side to avoid the punch, only to bend over sharply when Issei's knee rammed into his gut, knocking the air out of his lungs. But instead of being sent flying, Kakabil held firm and grabbed Issei's face, the only part of his body that was not covered in lighting armor. Got you. Issei barely had time to make a sound of shock before he realized Kakabil's intention to hit point blank with another holy blast. Ikazuchi Issei called out in a muffled voice and a bolt of white lightning descended from the sky and struck them both. Issei was mostly immune to electric shocks, even ones enhanced by divine power, due to his divine. Nyo -o -o. But the same could not be said for Kakabil who took the full brunt of the attack and was forced to let go of Issei and retreat lest he take any more damage. But, Issei had no intention of letting him escape. He started chasing Kakabil almost immediately. But, as he caught up, he hesitated when he saw a triumphant smirk on his opponent's face. Issei's advance was abruptly halted when Kakabil's wings sharpened and started slashing at him. Thanks to his armor, he wasn't actually being wounded, but the endless assault was enough to keep him in place long enough for Kakabil to create another massive spear of light and toss it at him. Issei was unable to react as the massive spear struck his armored chest and exploded, searing his body even through the armor. As the explosion died down, the fourth boost activated, though Issei paid little attention to it as his lust began to skyrocket partly due to anger and partly due to his enjoyment of his first real fight in a while. Burn, divine flames of the sun goddess. Black flames burst to life in Issei's hands, but did not turn into claws like they did in the spar with Zenovia. Instead, Issei focused his energy to mold them into the familiar ring of black flaming Magatamas. But this time, instead of a single ring of three Magatamas, they had turned into two rings of six Magatamas. Rengoku Magatama. Issei tossed the two rings of Magatamas that spun in the air like a shuriken on an erratic path towards Kakabil who immediately attempted to shoot them down before they reached him, but was unable to even get close before they both slammed into him and ignited into a giant column of black flames. <laughs> G.H. Cockabill screamed so loudly in pain that it caused the Gremory group and Zenovia to flinch and shiver. Issei, on the other hand, was completely undeterred and held his hands up together such that the shape of the space between them became spherical. The moment he made the hand gesture, the giant column of black flames distorted and remolded itself into a giant black flaming sphere with Cockabill trapped in the center. Crush him, Issei muttered as he clasped his hands together, closing the space between them. The black flaming sphere immediately began to shrink rapidly, intending to forcefully compress Kakabil's body along with it. But, once the sphere shrunk to a certain size, it began to vibrate violently and then exploded in the next instant, sending countless sparks of black flames flying. He extinguished my flame snow, he used a burst of energy to blow them away. Kakabil floated unsteadily in midair, a good part of his clothes burnt to a crisp and the rest blackened and burnt. Under his ruined clothes, the exposed parts of his body, including his hair were in a similar state, burnt and blackened. And yet, despite all of that damage, Kakabil was still grinning manically, his cracked, charred lips making it look even more disturbing. Kakabil ignored the fifth boost when it activated and simply held his hand up, causing Issei to grow weary and focus his attention on Kakabil. But it was because of that that he didn't notice where the attack was coming from until it was already too late. Five columns of holy energy suddenly shot up from magic circles on the ground, surrounding him and slamming into the barrier, causing it to creak and groan, but still hold firm. The columns of holy energy were so close to each other and to him that he had no way of escaping as they began to close in on him. HMPH, is this all? Racing himself, Issei slammed at full speed into the ground, shattering it and disrupting the magic circles producing the columns of holy energy. That was the weakness of the magic used by the three factions. If the magic circle producing the spell was destroyed, the spell itself was interrupted. Well, the same could be said about Anmyu Jutsu, since it could also be interrupted by destroying the talismans. The five columns dissipated and Issei dropped his guard, only to look up and find Kakabil already in front of him with a warhammer of light in hand. Issei had the wind knocked out of him as the warhammer slammed into his gut, not injuring him, but managing to actually put a crack in his lightning armor. Issei careened through the air, crashing into the main building. 
Issei recovered and landed on the ground, stopping to look at the small crack in his armor. Now he was a bit impressed. While lightning was an element that bolstered offensive power and speed and therefore didn't boast much defensive capabilities, the Raijin no Yorai was still an incredibly powerful set of armor. The fact that Yudo at his best before obtaining Balance Breaker and Zenovia with Excalibur Destruction were unable to put a dent in level 1 proved just how powerful it was. But, it also showed just how powerful Kakabil was to be able to put a crack, no matter how small, in level 2. No, it wasn't only because Kakabil had much more power than Yudo or Zenovia. Issei himself was also part of the problem. Had he grown so out of practice that he couldn't manifest level 2's full power. Issei grinned. That didn't really matter. This was just too damn fun. Fatsuno Matama. In a flash of light, the sheet divine sword appeared in his hand. Again who's the opponent this time Fatsuno Matama sighed, expecting that Issei had brought her out against an unworthy opponent again just to whip them. Don't worry. This time, the opponent is a fallen angel leader. He's not as lacking as previous opponents Issei said with a face-splitting grin. Hey, it's nice that you're having fun and all, but isn't the town in imminent danger or something do you have the luxury of taking your time with this fight? Fatsuno Matama's voice snapped him out of his haze, finally allowing him to calm himself and think properly. Issei stared down at boosted gear as the sixth boost activated. That meant one minute or more had passed, which also meant he had less than nine minutes to defeat Kakabil and stop the Earth Shatter spell. Fatsuno Matama was right, he couldn't afford to waste time. Issei tied the sheath of Fatsuno Matama to his waist and clenched his left hand. Deed rage, that should be enough. Let's go, Issei said as he dashed out of the hole in the wall. Issei's aura exploded to many times its original size, shocking Kakabil with its sheer intensity. Ha 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 you damn monster. This aura like this, it really reminds me of being in God's presence. I'll take that as a compliment. Do you still want to continue if you beg for mercy and cancel the earth shatter spell? I don't mind letting you go. Hey, are you mocking me? I already said it. Even if it's just me, I will start the second great war and crush Michael and Serzich. No one, not even the current Sekiruite, will stop my ambitions, Kakabil shouted angrily, his aura becoming wilder. Issei shrugged. Your funeral. Kakabil lost sight of Issei in an instant and then had his field of vision filled up when Issei suddenly appeared in front of him in the next instant. Then, he was sent flying by a fist to his face, though it felt more like he was being hit by a boulder. Kakabil felt some of the bones in his face shattering. Kakabil forced himself to stop as he went spinning through the air like a discus, breathing erratically as leaked from his mouth. Rip. Oh, uh, 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 uh. Kakabil screamed when he felt his topmost wings being torn off, spurted out of the stumps as he reeled from the shock of two wings. Kakabil turned to see Issei holding his torn wings in his hands before they burst into black flames and turned to ashes. Won't you just give up already now that I'm using boosted gear? You no longer have any hope of winning. I'm not into bullying my opponents unless they really piss me off. Issei sighed and shook his head, looking at Kakabil with an expression reminiscent of the condescendingly contemplative look a human would have when they're in the midst of deciding whether or not to squish an ant on the ground. I am a proud fallen angel leader I will prove that fallen angels are the superior race Kakabil shouted, the veins in his temples now becoming visible and pulsing. Kakabil flew up into the air and held both hands up. Immediately, a giant spear of light formed in the air above, rapidly expanding as Kakabil poured all of his power into it. Eventually, it grew so big that it cast a shadow over a good part of the campus. There was no doubt in anyone's minds that if a spear that big detonated, the barrier the Citri group was maintaining would be shattered, even with Issei's talismans reinforcing them. Most likely, the entire town would be vaporized even before the Earth Shatter spell activated. While the Grimmery group started panicking, Issei remained completely calm. If anything, he looked bored as he stared at the giant spear of light towering over him. Hags, I just have to crush that. Issei held a hand over Fatsuno Matama's handle and got into a drawing stance, pumping energy into the divine sword. The sword started glowing gold, even the sheath. Dai, Sekiryute vanished along with the Maoist little sisters Kakabil yelled and heaved the spear. Issei Isse unsheathed Fatsuno Matama and swung the glowing blade in a swift horizontal arc, releasing a massive crescent energy wave that could rival even Kakabil's spear in size and was clearly superior in power. As Kakabil's spear started to move towards Issei, it was quickly consumed and destroyed by Issei's attack that had also diminished from the effort of negating Kakabil's attack. It slammed into the barrier, causing the entire campus to tremble from the impact but did little more than that. Shocked at how even his strongest attack had been crushed in an instant, Kakabil couldn't react when Issei appeared in front of him and slashed him once with Fatsuno Matama. Just that one slash was enough. Divine power seeped into Kakabil's wound and began to interfere with his body, finally causing him to pass out and fall to the ground. HMPH, well that was a bit anticlimactic. Issei said as his first real fight in a while ended in an unsatisfying manner. His lightning armor vanished with a crackle and he dismissed Fatsuno Matama after sheathing her. Deed Rage's voice called out and Issei felt the power boost leaving his body, causing him momentary immense fatigue before he recovered. The giant magic circle carved into the field flashed and vanished, confirming the cancellation of the Earth Shatter spell. Now then, what should I do with this guy Issei said as he landed and looked down at Kakabil's unconscious body. 
I guess either your faction or we devils take him as a prisoner of war he did throw the first punch, so it is kinda within our rights. Rhea said as she, the rest of the Gremory group and Zenovia walked up to Issa. Now that the battle was over, the oppressive aura the two combatants had been giving off vanished, allowing them to get to their feet. Well, I guess I'm fine with that. You guys take him. I'm not really interested in this. Sorry, but I can't let you do that. A new voice interrupted them. This voice HMPH, I should have known Azizel would send you. Issei said as he looked up at the barrier. An echoing voice like Deedrage's voice announced and the power of the barrier rapidly diminished, and right after that, shatter. It shattered into countless glass-like fragments, and a flash of light descended down to the ground in front of them, creating yet another crater. And in the center of the crater, a white-armored figure rose and turned to face them. Everyone, save Issei, turned pale as they realized who it was. Hakuryu Kuriya's whispered as she looked at the counterpart and nemesis of the Sekuryute, the owner of the mid-tier Longinus divine dividing that contained the soul of the other heavenly dragon, Albion. The armor he wore must have fabled scale mail that was the balance breaker for both boosted gear and divine dividing, though the two obviously possessed slightly different appearances and completely opposite powers. Yo, my eternal rival. It's been about three years since we last met, hasn't it? Isai greeted his nemesis casually. Around there, yes. A young male voice echoed from the armor. So, did you come here to fight? Sorry, as much I would like to since our last fight was interrupted, as Azel ordered me to retrieve this idiot and to not engage you. The Hakuryuku said as he lightly kicked Kakabil's unconscious body. I see. Take him then. But give this to Azazel too. Issei said as he flicked a talisman to the Hakuryuku who caught it between two fingers. What's this? A recording of everything Kakabil said, including his claim of independence from the Grigori. I don't want you guys jumping down our throats because of something one of you idiots did. Yeah, I'll be sure to give this to him. Too bad though, as unlikely as it is, if the Grigori declared war on the Shinto faction, we could settle our fight. Don't worry, even without a war between our factions, we will fight one day. It is our fate to clash over and over until one of us falls after all. Issei declared. True. Well then, we'll be parting ways here. I'll see you some other time, my eternal rival. Hefting Kakabil over his shoulder, the Hakuryuku took to the skies and vanished soon after. Issei, you fought him before Ria's asked after a moment of silence. Yeah, three years ago, we happened upon each other and started fighting. We destroyed a good part of the surrounding area, and then my grandfather and Azizel interrupted and stopped the fight. I haven't seen him again up until now. Issei turned around. More importantly, bam, Oyudo cried out in pain when Issei struck him over the head. That was for acting out on your own. What were you thinking your opponent was Excalibur? What if something had happened to you? Well, whatever, it ended well anyway. You've settled your grudge, and you've obtained Balance Breaker. From now on, our training is going to be a lot harder. Ayuda let out a sound of confusion. Tibesan, we can go back to doing clubroom activities together, right? Assassin. Hiudo. Hiudo turned to face Reyes, who looked at him with a relieved and gentle expression. I'm glad you've returned. And obtaining Balance Breaker as well I'm so proud of you. But you everyone I betrayed the one who saved my life words cannot describe how sorry I am. You have returned. That's enough. You mustn't let your comrades down. But you, I will swear to you once more. I, Kiba Yudo, swear to protect you and everyone else for the rest of my life as your knight. Yufifufufu. I'm happy to hear that, however. The OOM. Power of destruction coated her hand as she raised it up. Yudo, as punishment for acting on your own, 1,000 spankings. I, Issei chuckled to himself at the sight of Yudo getting spanked by Ria's like a disobedient child. Then, he looked at the destroyed school grounds inside. Well then, I'd better get started. This mess isn't gonna clean itself up. Did you hear me the three factions are having a peace conference soon, and since you were also involved in the Kakabil incident, we would like the Shinto faction to participate too. Well, the time and place haven't been decided yet. Ria's repeated, unsure if Issei heard her. I heard you. What I'm wondering is why Zenovia is back in town, turned into a devil and wearing our school uniform. I found out God had perished, so I became a devil as a form of self-abandonment. I received a night piece from Ria's Grimorino, I suppose it's master or but you now. It seems that while Durandal is powerful, my own power isn't that great, so I only needed that one evil piece to reincarnate. I've also transferred into this academy as a second year and a member of the occult research club. Let's get along, Issei-kun. Stop that. That tone doesn't match up with your expression at all. It makes for a disturbing image. HM. I was trying to act more like Arena, but it appears to be more difficult than I thought. By the way, whereas Arena did she return to the church? Yeah, she went back with the five Excalibur fragments well one fragment and the remnants of four, as well Balba Galilei's corpse. Well, as long as the cores of the fragments are intact, the swords themselves can be reconstructed through alchemy. You gave your Excalibur fragment back to them so easily no, the better question is, they let you leave with Durandal. Well, unlike Durandal, there are other wielders for Excalibur destruction, so I had to return it once I got back to headquarters. As for Durandal, since I'm the only wielder, they let me keep it. Well, the higher-ups have been ostracizing me because I found out about God's death, so I decided to take Durandal with me when I left the church as a bit of payback. Basically, I'm in the situation as Asia Argento now. 
Zenovia said with a wry look. Irina was lucky. Since she couldn't participate in the battle because of her wounds, she didn't hear the truth about God. Her faith is stronger than mine. If she learned the truth, who knows what she would do. Though, because of that, we had a very awkward farewell when I left the church. There's a good chance we'll be enemies when we next meet. Zenovia finished with a sad look on her face. A full report of this incident was sent to heaven and to the devils by Azizel. Cockabeel's actions were completely independent of the Grigori. Because he attempted to start another great war, he was sentenced to eternity frozen in the Cossidus. So Cockabeel wouldn't be re-emerging again. Too bad, Issei liked fighting him. Well, it looks like they sent the Hakuryuku to stop Cockabeel, but you ended defeating him before he arrived. It certainly would have put the Grigori in a slightly better light if Cockabeel was stopped by one of their own. Anyway, the peace conference was suggested by Azazel. Apparently, he wishes to apologize for Cockabeel's actions. But, if he's inviting the leaders of the Shinto faction as well, it's unlikely that's all he wants. It's suspicious that Azazel would apologize to begin with. Essay agreed. Though he had only met Azazel once, he got the feeling that Azazel had a very strong ego. Not the kind of person who would apologize for the actions his wayward subordinate took without his knowledge. Ah, that's right. I have to apologize to Asia Argento as well. Since God is dead, there wouldn't be any love or protection from him. I'm sorry, Asia Argento. Please hit me to your heart's content. Zenovia said with a bow towards Asia, who shook her head. No, I don't intend to do that. Zenovesan, I'm happy with my current life. Even though I became a devil, I've met very precious people to me. I couldn't be more blessed than I am right now. Asia said with a smile. It's a smile in relief. Her mental state had been precarious after she had learned of God's death, but it looked like she had recovered. So you and I are the only followers other than the higher-ups who know about God's death. I guess I can't say something like divine punishment to you anymore. A heretic. How to think that I, who was once admired for being a natural holy sword wielder, am now being branded a heretic. I can't forget how their looks and attitude towards me suddenly changed. Zenovia muttered with a dark look before her expression cleared and she turned around. Well then, I'll be leaving. I still have a lot of things to learn before my official transfer here. Zenovia made to leave, but Asia piped up. You um, HM. Next weekend, I'm going out with my classmates to play. Would you like to join us? Zenovia's eyes widened at Asia's invitation and smiled bitterly. Another time. I'm not interested this time. But, but, next time, could you show me around the school? Asia brightened up when she heard Zenovia. Yes, I'll swear on my holy sword Durandal. I also would like to have a rematch with Hayato Issei and Kiba Yudo. I don't mind. I could use the practice. Sure, I won't lose next time. Yudo replied with a strong voice. Issei glanced at him. Yudo certainly changed, and he wasn't just talking about his balance breaker. His posture was straighter, as though a great weight had been lifted off his shoulders. That was true in a sense, since he had finally been freed from his grudge. Issei could tell that Yudo would now make a better opponent. He was looking forward to their next training session already. Yudo glanced at Issei and mouthed thank you. Issei responded by shaking his head. I didn't do much. Issei mouthed back, though Yudo clearly didn't think so. Well then, I should get going. I need to contact my faction and tell them about the conference. Plus, I need to make up for not cooking dinner for Afai's last night. All right, I'll see you at home. Ria's nodded and Issei took his leave. So that's the gist of it. Issei spoke into his cell phone. HMPH, beating down a fallen angel leader. You certainly don't do things by half, do you? Grandson is grandfather. The Shinto god of storms, Suzanu, replied. Shut up. Will you be attending or not? Yeah, since we were invited, it'd be bad form to not come. I see. I'll inform you of the time and venue once it's been decided. Oh, and we'll be coming for classroom visits too. Well, how did you? Be well, ha, it's no use no matter how hard you try to hide it. Gathering information like that is nothing to history compilation committee. Yeah, it was the committee for an inane purpose like that. Be well, ha, anyway, your parents are busy with work, so we'll be coming in their place. We'll be seeing you soon. Look forward to our visit, grandson of mine. Click. Issei silently cursed as his grandfather hung up. He had been doing his best to hide the day for classroom visits from his grandfather, but it looked like it didn't work this year like it did last year. Great Issei groaned as he thought of the impending chaos sure to follow. Issei, Afais called to him. H.M. Dinner. Ah, that's right. He still had to cook dinner. Sorry, I'll get started on it. Issei stood up and made to go to the kitchen, but he stopped when he felt Afais' arms wrapping around his waist. Afais, Issei, I'm lonely. Afais said as she pressed her face into his back gently. Issei smiled and gently removed her hands from his waist. He then turned around and leaned down to her deeply, placing his hands against her back to support her. The two pulled away, and Issei pressed his forehead against hers. Don't worry. The one I love most always has been, is, and always will be you and you alone. MMM Afais hummed as she basked in her lover's warmth. Afais, will you be attending the conference too? I guess. At the very least, I should make my affiliation with the Shinto faction known. I see. Issei's thoughts drifted to the upcoming peace conference, and its significance to the current state of the world. 
Looks like the world status quo is about to be shattered. So, are the preparations complete? Of course it's been a while since I've seen Serzech, Uncle Michael or Uncle Azazel, so I made sure to put in a lot of effort for this little surprise. HMPH, a peace conference. How foolish, there is no such thing as true peace. Conflict will always exist, endless repeating itself. My very existence is the proof of that. Ah uh, yeah 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 come on, don't be such a sourpuss it's a stupid idea, but it seems like fun, doesn't it? It hardly matters to me. The outcome of this conference does not affect our goal. It simply provides an opportunity for us. I see I see well then, let's give the world a nasty little surprise, shall we? Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.